Section sixteen of four and twenty fairy tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Fairer than a fairy by Mademoiselle de la Force. Translated by James Blanche. Part one there was once upon a time in europe a king who having already several children by a princess whom he had married took it into his head to travel from one end of his kingdom to the other he passed his time in visiting one province after another very pleasantly but while he was staying in a beautiful castle at the extremity of his dominions the queen his wife was brought to bed there of a daughter who appeared so exceedingly lovely at the moment of her birth that the courtiers either on account of the child's beauty or to ingratiate themselves with the parents named her fairer than a fairy and it will be seen how well she merited so illustrious a title the queen had scarcely recovered when she was obliged to follow the king her husband who had departed in haste to defend a distant province which his enemies had invaded little fairer than a fairy was left behind with her governess and the ladies who attended on her they brought her up with the utmost care and as her father was involved in a long and cruel war she had plenty of time during his absence to increase in stature and beauty that beauty rendered her famous in all the surrounding countries nothing else was spoken of and at twelve years old she might more easily be taken for a divinity than for a mortal one of her brothers came to see her during a truce and conceived the most perfect affection for her meanwhile however the fame of her beauty and the name she bore so irritated the fairies against her that there was nothing they did not think of to revenge themselves on her for the presumption implied by such a title and to destroy a beauty of which they were so jealous the queen of the fairies was not one of those good fairies who are the protectors of virtue and who have no pleasure but in doing good many centuries have elapsed since she had attained royalty by her profound learning and art her great age had caused her to dwindle in stature and she was now only called by the nickname of nabat nabat accordingly summoned a council and made known to them her resolution to avenge not only the beauties of her own court but those of the entire world that she had determined to go and see for herself and carry off this paragon whose reputation was so injurious to their charms it was no sooner said than done she set out and clothed in a very plain garb transported herself to the castle which contained this marvellous creature she soon made herself at home in it and induced by her cunning the ladies of the princess to receive her amongst them but nabat was struck with astonishment when after having carefully examined the castle she discovered by means of her art that it had been constructed by a great magician and that he had endowed it with a virtue by the power of which no one could leave its walls or the surrounding pleasure grounds but of their own free will and that it was not possible to use any sort of enchantment against those persons who inhabited it this secret was not unknown to the governess of fairer than a fairy who well aware of the invaluable treasure committed to her charge still felt no alarm on her account knowing that no one in the world could take from her this young princess so long as she should not go outside the castle or the gardens she had expressly forbidden her to do so and fairer who had already a large share of discretion had never failed in taking this precaution a thousand lovers had made fruitless efforts to carry her off but knowing herself secure within those limits she did not fear their violence the boat did not require much time to insinuate herself into her good graces she taught her to do beautiful kinds of work and rendered her lessons agreeable by recounting pleasant stories she neglected nothing which could divert her and naturally pleased her so much that at length one was never seen without the other amidst all her attentions however nabat was not less occupied with her schemes of revenge she sought for an opportunity of inducing fairer than a fairy by some cunning pretense only to put her foot over the threshold of one of the castle gates she was always prepared to pounce on and fly away with her one day that she had led her into the garden and the young maidens of her court having gathered some flowers had crowned with them the beautiful head of fairer than a fairy nabat opened a little door which led into the fields and passing out at it played an hundred antics 
which caused the princess and the young folks who surrounded her to laugh heartily all at once the wicked nabot pretended to be taken ill and the next minute she fell down as if swooning away some of the young maidens ran to assist her and fairer flew also to her side but hardly had the unhappy child passed the fatal gate than nabot sprang up seized her with a powerful arm and making a circle with her wand a thick black fog arose which dispersing again almost immediately the ground was seen to open and two moles emerged with wings formed of rose leaves drawing an ebony car and nabot placing herself in it with fairer than a fairy it ascended into the air and cleaving it with incredible velocity disappeared entirely from the sight of the young maidens who by their cries and tears soon announced to all the castle the loss they had sustained fairer than a fairy only recovered from her first astonishment to fall into another still more fearful the rapidity with which the car passed through the air had so bewildered her that she almost lost consciousness at length reviving a little she cast down her eyes what was her alarm to find nothing beneath her but the vast extent of the shoreless ocean she uttered a piercing cry turned round and seeing near her her dear nabot she embraced her tenderly and held her close in her arms as one naturally would to reassure oneself but the fairy repulsed her rudely off audacious child said she behold in me your mortal foe i am the queen of the fairies and you are about to pay to me the penalty of your insolence in assuming the proud name which you bear fair trembling at these words more than if a thunderbolt had fallen at her feet felt greater alarm at them than at the dreadful road she was travelling at length however the car alighted in the midst of the magnificent courtyard of the most superb palace that ever was seen the sight of so beautiful a palace somewhat reassured the timid princess especially when she descended from the car and she saw an hundred young beauties who came with much deference to pay their respects to the fairy so charming a residence did not appear to announce misfortune to her she had also one consolation which does not fail to flatter one in similar situations she remarked that all those beautiful persons were struck with admiration on beholding her and she heard a confused murmur of praise and envy which gratified her marvellously but how speedily was this little feeling of vanity extinguished nabot imperiously commanded them to strip fairer of her beautiful clothes thinking thereby to take from her a portion of her charms they pulled them off accordingly but only to increase the fury of nabot for what beauties were then disclosed to view and to what shame did they put all the fairies in the world they reclothed her in old shabby garments but in this state one would have said her natural and simple loveliness was determined to show how independent it was of the assistance of the most costly ornaments never did she appear more charming nabot then ordered them to conduct her to the place which she had prepared for her and to set her her task two fairies took her and made her pass through the most beautiful and sumptuous apartments that could possibly be seen fairer noticed them in spite of her misery and said to herself whatever torments they may prepare for me my heart tells me i shall not always be miserable in this beautiful palace they made her descend a large staircase of black marble which had more than a thousand steps she thought she was going into the bowels of the earth or rather that they were conducting her into the infernal regions at length they entered a small cabinet wainscoted with ebony where they told her she would have to sleep on a little straw and that there was an ounce of bread with a cup of water for her supper from thence they made her pass into a great gallery the walls of which were entirely composed of black marble and which had no light but that afforded by five lamps of jet which threw a sombre glare over the place more alarming than cheering these gloomy walls were hung with cobwebs from top to bottom and such was their peculiarity that the more they were swept away the more they multiplied the two fairies told the princess that this gallery must be swept clean by break of day or that she would be made to suffer the most frightful torments and after placing a ladder and giving her a broom of rushes they bade her set to work and left her fairer than a fairy sighed and not knowing the peculiarity of those cobwebs courageously resolved notwithstanding the great length of the gallery to execute the task imposed on her she took her broom and mounted the ladder nimbly but oh heavens what was her surprise when 
as she endeavored to sweep the marble and clear off the cobwebs she found they increased in proportion to her exertions she fatigued herself by persevering for some time but perceiving sorrowfully at length that it was all in vain she threw down her broom descended the ladder and seating herself on the last step of it began to weep bitterly and to foresee the extent of her misfortune her sobs came at length so fast that she could no longer support herself when raising her head a little her eyes were dazzled by a brilliant light the gallery was in an instant illuminated from end to end and she saw kneeling before her a youth so beautiful and charming that at the first glance she took him for cupid but she remembered that love is always painted naked and this handsome youth was dressed in a suit of clothes covered with jewels she was not sure also that all the light she perceived did not proceed from his eyes so beautiful and brilliant did they appear to her this young man continued to gaze upon her she felt inclined to kneel too who art thou she exclaimed in amazement art thou a god art thou love i am not a god he replied but i have more love in me than is to be found in heaven or earth beside i am Ferris, son of the queen of the fairies who loves you and will aid you then taking up the broom which she had thrown down he touched all the cobwebs which immediately turned to cloth of gold of marvellous workmanship the lamps becoming bright and shining Ferris then giving a golden key to the princess said in the principal panel of your cell you will find a lock open it gently adieu i must retire for fear of being suspected go to rest you will find all that is necessary for your repose then placing one knee on the ground he respectfully kissed her hand and disappeared fairer more surprised at this adventure than at anything else which had happened to her during the day re-entered her little apartment and looked about for the lock of which he had spoken when on approaching the wainscot she heard the most gentle voice in the world apparently deploring some misfortune and she imagined it must proceed from some wretched being persecuted as she was she listened attentively alas what shall i do said the voice they bid me change this bushel of acorns into oriental pearls fairer than a fairy less astonished than she would have been two hours before struck two or three times on the panel and said pretty loudly if they impose hard tasks in this place miracles are at the same time performed here therefore hope but tell me i pray who you are and i will tell you who i am it is more agreeable to me to satisfy your curiosity than to continue my employment replied the other person i am the daughter of a king they say i was born charming but the fairies did not assist at my birth and you know they are cruel to those whom they have not taken under their protection directly they come into the world ah i know it too well replied fair i am handsome like yourself the daughter of a king and unfortunate because i am agreeable without the assistance of their gifts we are then companions in misfortune returned the other but are you in love not far from it said fairer in a low voice but continue your story said she aloud and do not question me more i was considered continued the other the most charming creature that had ever existed and everybody loved me and wished to possess me they called me de Sirs. my will was law and i was treasured in all hearts a young prince the most enthusiastic of my adorers abandoned everything for me my encouragement of his hopes transported him with delight we were about to be united for ever when the fairies jealous at beholding me the object of universal admiration and detesting the sight of attractions which they had not bestowed carried me off one day in the midst of my triumphs and consigned me to this horrid place they have threatened that they will strangle me to-morrow morning if i have not performed a preposterous task which they have imposed upon me now tell me quickly who are you i have told you all replied fairer but my name they call me fairer than a fairy you must then be very beautiful replied the princess the sirs i should like excessively to see you i am quite as anxious to see you replied fairer is there a door hereabouts for i have a little key which perhaps may be of use to you 
looking narrowly round she discovered one which she was able to open and pushing it the two princesses met face to face and were equally surprised at the marvellous beauty of each other after embracing affectionately and saying many civil things to one another fairer began to laugh at seeing the princess the sirs continually rubbing her acorns with a little white stone as she had been ordered to do she told her of the task which they had imposed upon her and how miraculously she had been assisted by a charming unknown being but who can it be said the princess the sirs i think it is a man replied fairer a man cried the sirs you blush you love him no not yet replied fair but he has told me he loves me and if he loves me as he says he shall assist you hardly had she uttered these words when the bushel measure began to shake and agitating the acorns as the oak on which they had grown might have done they were instantly changed into the most beautiful pear-shaped pearls of the first water it was one of these which cleopatra dissolved in wine at the costly banquet she made for mark antony the two princesses were delighted at the exchange and fairer than a fairy who began to be accustomed to wonders leading de Sirs by the hand returned into her own chamber and finding the panel containing the lock of which the stranger had spoken she opened it with her golden key and entered an apartment the magnificence of which both surprised and affected her as she saw in everything it contained the attention of her lover it was strewn with the most beautiful flowers and exhaled a divine perfume at one end of this charming room there was a table covered with all that could gratify the most refined taste and two fountains of liqueurs which flowed into basins of porphyry the young princesses seated themselves in two ivory chairs enriched with emeralds they ate with a good appetite and when they had supped the table disappeared and in its place arose a delicious bath into which they stepped together at a few paces from them they observed a superb toilet table and large baskets of gold wire full of linen of such exquisite purity that it made them long to make use of it a bed of singular form and extraordinary richness occupied the further end of this marvellous chamber which was lined with orange trees and golden boxes studded with rubies while rows of cornelian columns sustained the sumptuous roof divided only by immense crystal mirrors which reached from the ground to the ceiling several consoles of rare materials supported vases of precious stones filled with all sorts of flowers the princess de Sirs, admired the good fortune of her companion and turning to her observed your lover is indeed gallant he can do much and he will do everything for you your happiness is extraordinary a clock striking midnight repeated at each stroke the name of ferris fairer than a fairy colored and threw herself on the couch she trusted to repose but her sleep was troubled by the image of ferris the next morning there was great astonishment in the court of the fairies at seeing the gallery so richly decorated and the bushel measure full of beautiful pearls they had hoped to punish the young princesses their cruelty was disappointed they found each alone in her little chamber after consulting together again in order to devise some tasks which could not possibly be accomplished they told the sirs to go to the seashore and write on the sand with express orders to take care that what she wrote there could never be effaced and they commanded fairer to go to the foot of mount adventurous to fly to the top and bring them a vase full of the water of immortality for this purpose they gave her a quantity of feathers and wax in hopes that by making wings for herself she might perish like another icarus de Sirs and fairer looked at each other on hearing these dreadful commands and embracing tenderly they separated as if taking an eternal farewell the fairies conducted one to the seashore and the other to the foot of mount adventurous when fairer was left by herself she took the feathers and wax and made some vain attempts to form wings with them after having worked for some time most ineffectually her thoughts reverted to ferris if you loved me said she you would come to my assistance hardly had she finished the last word when she saw him stand before her looking a thousand times more beautiful than on the preceding night the full light of day was an advantage to him do you doubt my affection said he is anything difficult to him who loves you 
he then requested her to take off some portion of her dress and having kissed her hand as a recompense he transformed himself suddenly to an eagle she was rather sorry to see so charming a person thus metamorphosed but placing himself at her feet he extended his wings and made her easily comprehend his design reclining upon him she encircled his proud neck with her beautiful arms and he rose with her gently into the air it would be difficult to say which was the most gratified she at escaping death in the execution of the order given her or he at being permitted to bear such a precious burden he carried her gently to the summit of the mountain where she heard an harmonious concert warbled by a thousand birds that came to render homage to the divine bird which bore her the top of this mountain was a flowery plain surrounded by fine cedars in the midst of which was a little stream whose silvery waves rolled over golden sand strewn with brilliant diamonds fairer than a fairy knelt down and first of all took some of this precious water in her hand and drank it after this she filled her vase and turning towards her eagle said ah how i wish that the sirs had some of this water scarcely had she spoken these words than the eagle flew down took one of the slippers of fairer and returning with it filled it with water and carried it to the seashore where the princess de Sirs was occupied in fruitless attempts to write indelibly on the sand the eagle returned to fairer and resumed his beautiful burden alas said she what is de Sirs doing take me to her he obeyed they found her still writing and as fast as she wrote a wave came and effaced what she had written what cruelty said the princess to fairer to command what it is impossible to accomplish i imagine from the strange mode of your conveyance that you have succeeded fairer alighted and moved by the misfortune of her companion she turned towards her lover and thus addressed him give me proof of your omnipotence or rather of my love interrupted the prince resuming his proper form de Sirs, observing the beauty and grace of his person cast on him a look of surprise and delight fair coloured and by a movement over which she had no control placed herself before him so as to hide him from her companion do as you are told continued she with a charming air of uneasiness ferris knew his happiness and wishing to terminate as speedily as possible her trouble read said he and disappeared swifter than a flash of lightning End of section 16section seventeen of four and twenty fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen fairer than a fairy by mademoiselle de la force translated by james blanche part two at the same instant a wave broke at the feet of fairer and in retiring left behind a brazen tablet as firmly fixed in the sand as if it had been there from all eternity and would remain immovable to the end of the world as she looked at it she perceived letters forming on it deeply engraved which composed these lines the vows of common love in sand are traced and even graved in brass may be effaced but those which are inspired by your bright eyes in starry words are written in the skies naught can destroy those characters divine eternal as the heavens in which they shine i understand cried de Sirs. he who loves you must always love how well your charming swain expresses his feelings she then embraced fairer than a fairy who soon in her arms recovered from the confusion occasioned by the little feeling of jealousy she had experienced and confessed it to her friend who accused her of it and both confirmed in their friendship abandoned themselves to the pleasure of an agreeable and affectionate conversation queen nabot sent messengers to the foot of the mountain to find what was become of fairer than a fairy they found the scattered feathers and a part of her clothes and consequently believed she had been dashed to pieces as they desired full of this idea the fairies ran to the seashore they exclaimed at the sight of the brazen tablet and were overwhelmed at perceiving the two princesses calmly seated in conversation on a jutting piece of rock they called to them fair presented her vase full of the water of immortality and laughed in secret with de Sirs at the fury of the fairies 
the queen was not to be jested with she knew that a power as great as her own must have assisted them and her rage increased to such a pitch that without hesitating an instant she determined on effecting their ruin by a final and most cruel trial de Sures was condemned to go on the morrow to the fair of time to fetch the rouge of youth and fairer than a fairy to proceed to the wood of wonders and capture the hind with silver feet the princess de Sures was conducted to a vast plain at the end of which was an immense building divided into galleries full of shops so superb that no comparison could be found for them but in the recollections of the magnificent entertainments at marley these shops were kept by young and agreeable fairies assisted by their favoured lovers as soon as de Sures appeared her charms fascinated everybody she took possession of all hearts in the first shop she entered she excited much commiseration by asking for the rouge of youth none would tell her where to find it because when it was not a fairy who came in search of it it was a sure sign of torment to the person who was charged with this dangerous commission the good fairies told de Sures to return and to inquire no further for what she sought she was so beautiful that they ran before her wherever she went in order to gaze at her her ill luck however led her to the shop of a wicked fairy hardly had she asked for the rouge of youth on the part of the queen of the fairies then darting a terrible glance at her she told her that she had it and that she would give it her the next morning and ordered her to enter a room and wait till it was prepared for her they led her into a dark and pestilential place where she could not see her hand before her she was overcome with terror ah she exclaimed charming lover of fairer than a fairy haste to my rescue or i am lost but he was deaf to her appeal or unable to act as he had done in other places de Sures tormented herself half the night and slept the remainder when she was awakened by a good-looking girl who brought her a little food telling her that it was sent her by the favourite of the fairy her mistress who was resolved to assist her and that it would be fortunate for her if such were the case because the fairy had sent for an evil spirit who by breathing on her face would make her hideous and in that frightful state she would be ignominiously sent back to the queen of the fairies who with all her court would triumph in her misfortunes the princess de Sures felt frightened to death at this threat of losing in a moment all her beauty and wished rather to die outright her agony was horrible she groped about her dark prison in vain hope of discovering some mode of escape when some one took her by the arm and she felt in her heart a sensation of pleasure she was gently led towards a spot where she began to perceive a little light and when her eyes became accustomed to it she was struck by the appearance of what was to her the most charming object in the world for she recognized that dear prince who loved her so truly and from whom they had separated her on the eve of her wedding her transport her delight was extreme is it you she exclaimed a hundred times at length when fully persuaded of the fact and forgetting all her own troubles but are you the favorite of this wretched fairy she continued is it with this fine title that i again behold you undoubtedly replied he and we shall owe it to the end of our troubles and the certainty of our happiness he then recounted to her how in despair at her being carried off he had gone to seek a wise old man who had informed him where she was and assured him that he would never recover her but in the kingdom of the fairies that he had furnished him with the means of finding it but that he had been arrested in his pursuit of her by this cruel fairy who had fallen in love with him that following the advice of the sage he had dissembled and by his docility had obtained such an influence over her that he had the care of all her treasure and was the minister of all her power that she had just departed on a journey of six thousand leagues that she would not return for twelve days and that therefore they should lose no time in escaping that he was going into his cabinet to fetch a part of the gem of the ring of gyges that she should put it on and thereby becoming invisible she could pass anywhere as for himself he could show himself as he pleased 
do not forget said she the rouge of youth i wish to put some on and to give some to one of my companions the prince smiled whither shall we go continued she to the queen of the fairies he replied no that will never do she exclaimed we shall perish there the sage who counselled me pursued he told me to lead you back to the place from whence you came last if i wish to be assured of happiness he has never yet deceived me in anything whatever well then so be it said de Sirs. we will go there the prince brought her a valuable box in which was the rouge of youth and with the hope of making herself appear more beautiful still in the eyes of her lover she rubbed some hastily all over her face forgetting that she was invisible by means of the gem which he had given her she took him by the arm they traversed in this manner the whole of the fair and were soon close to the palace of the queen there the prince resumed the gem of gyges the beautiful de Sirs became visible and he became invisible to the great regret of the princess whom he took by the arm in his turn and presented her before nabat and her court all the fairies looked at each other in excessive astonishment at seeing de Sirs return with the rouge of youth and the queen frowning awfully desired them to guard her strictly our arts are vain said she we must put her to death without trying any more experiments the sentence was pronounced de Sirs trembled with fear her lover reassured her as much as he could but we must return to fairer than a fairy they had conducted her to the wood of wonders and here is the reason why they had condemned her to chase the silver-footed hind once upon a time there had been a queen of the fairies who had succeeded in due course to that grand title she was beautiful good and wise she had had several lovers whose affections and attentions had however been lost upon her entirely occupied in protecting virtue she found no amusement in listening to the sighs of her adorers there was one whom her coldness rendered the most unhappy because he loved her better than any of the others one day seeing that he could not move her to pity him he protested in his despair that he would kill himself she was not affected even at this threat considering it merely as one of those extravagances in which lovers sometimes indulge but which never have any serious result however some time after he really did throw himself into the sea a sage who had brought up this young man complained to the supreme authorities and the insensible fairy was condemned to do penance for her severity in the form of a hind for the term of one hundred years unless an accomplished beauty could be found who by venturing to hunt her for ten days in the wood of wonders could take her and restore her to her original shape forty years had already elapsed since she had been first transformed at the commencement of her penance several beauties had risked the trial of this fine adventure from which so much honour was to be derived each hoped to be the fortunate huntress but as they lost themselves in the pursuit and at the end of ten days were no more heard of this ardour began to cool and for some time past no beauty had voluntarily offered herself those who had recently undertaken the task being condemned to it by the fairies in order to ensure their destruction it was thus to get rid of fairer that they led her to the wood of wonders they gave her a small portion of food for form's sake and placed in her hand a silken cord with a running noose to catch the deer that was all her outfit for the chase she deposited what they gave her at the foot of a tree and when she found herself alone she cast a look round this vast forest in the profound silence and solitude of which she saw nothing but despair she was anxious to remain at the skirt of the forest and not to enter it too far so in order to know the spot again she placed a mark at the point from which she started but alas how did she deceive herself every one lost themselves in this forest without being able to issue from it in one of the paths she caught sight of the silver-footed hind walking slowly she approached it with her silken cord in her hand thinking to take it but the deer feeling itself pursued started off at full speed stopping from time to time and turning its head towards fairer they were in sight of each other all day without being any nearer at last night separated them the poor huntress was very tired and very hungry 
but she no longer knew where to find the little provision she had had given her and there was nothing but the hard ground for her to repose upon she lay down therefore very sadly under a tree she could not sleep for a long time she was frightened the least thing alarmed her a leaf shaken by the wind made her tremble in this miserable state she turned her thoughts on her lover and called him several times but finding him fail her in her great distress she exclaimed with tears in her eyes ferris ferris you have abandoned me she was just dropping asleep when she felt a movement beneath her and it seemed to her as though she was in the best bed in the world she slept soundly for a considerable time without any interruption she was awoke in the morning by the song of a thousand nightingales and turning her beautiful eyes around she found she was raised two feet from the earth the turf having sprung up under her lovely form and thus made a delicious couch a large orange tree threw its branches over her like a tent and she was covered with flowers by her side were two turtle doves who announced to her by their love for each other what she might hope for with ferris the ground was entirely covered with strawberries and all sorts of excellent fruits she ate of them and found herself as well satisfied and as much strengthened by them as though they had been the richest and best kind of meats a stream which flowed close by served to allay her thirst oh ye tender cares of my lover cried she when she had refreshed herself how much i needed you i murmur no longer give me less dearest and let me see you she would have continued in this strain had she not perceived stretched close to her the silver-footed hind quietly gazing at her she thought this time she must catch it with one hand she held out to it a bunch of grass and with the other grasped the cord but the deer bounded lightly away and when it had gone a short distance it stopped and looked back at her it kept up this game all day another night came and passed like the one before it she awoke under similar circumstances and four days and nights elapsed in the like manner at length on the fifth morning fairer than a fairy on opening her eyes thought she saw a light more brilliant than that of day when she perceived in those of her lover seated near her all the affection with which she had inspired him he fervently kissed one of her feet his presence and this respectful action gratified her greatly you are there then said she if i have not beheld you all these days i have at all events received the proofs of your goodness say of my love fairer than a fairy replied he my mother suspects that it is i who assist you she has placed me in confinement i have escaped a moment by means of a fairy of my acquaintance adieu i came only to encourage you you shall see me this evening and if fortune smiles to-morrow we shall be happy he departed and she hunted again all day when night came she perceived near her a little light which sufficed to show her her lover here is my illuminated wand said he place it before you and go without fear wherever it will lead you where it stops you will perceive a great heap of dry leaves set fire to it enter the place you will see and you will find the skin of a beast burn it the stars our friends will do the rest adieu fairer than a fairy would have desired far more ample instructions but seeing there was no remedy she placed the wand before her which showed her the way she followed it nearly two hours very much vexed at doing nothing else it stopped at last and there truly enough she perceived a large heap of dried leaves to which she did not fail to set fire the light was soon so great that she could see a very high mountain in which she observed an opening half hid by brambles she separated them with her wand and entered a dark hole but soon after she found herself in a vast saloon of admirable architecture and lighted with numberless lamps but what struck her with the greatest astonishment was the sight of the skins of several wild and terrible beasts hung on golden hooks which at first she mistook for the beasts themselves she turned away her eyes with horror and they were arrested in the centre of the saloon by the sight of a beautiful palm-tree upon one of the branches of which was suspended the skin of the hind with the silver feet fairer than a fairy was enchanted at seeing it and taking it down with the aid of her wand she carried it quickly to the fire which she had lighted at the entrance of the cavern 
it was consumed in a moment and re-entering joyfully the saloon she penetrated into several magnificent apartments she stopped in one where she saw several couches placed upon persian carpets and one more beautiful than the rest under a canopy of cloth of gold but she had not much time to contemplate arrangements which appeared to her singular for she heard hearty peals of laughter and several persons in loud conversation fairer than a fairy turned her steps in the direction from which the sounds proceeded and entered a wonderful place where she found fifteen young ladies of celestial beauty she did not surprise them lest she was surprised herself the extreme loveliness of her appearance took away their breath and a deep silence succeeded to cries of admiration but one of these beautiful persons more beautiful than all the rest advanced with a smiling air towards our charming princess you are my deliverer said she addressing her i cannot doubt it no one can enter here who is not clothed in the skin of one of the beasts which you saw at the entrance of the cavern that has been the fate of all these beautiful persons whom you see with me after ten days of useless pursuit of me they were changed into so many animals during the day but at night we resume our human forms and you charming princess if you had not delivered me would have been changed into a white rabbit a white rabbit exclaimed fairer ah madam it is indeed better that i should preserve my ordinary form and that so wonderful a person as you should be no longer a deer you have restored us all to liberty replied the fairy let us now pass the rest of the night as joyously as may be and to-morrow we will go to the palace and fill all the court with astonishment it is impossible to express the joy which resounded in this charming spot and the delight which all these young persons felt at the sweet sensation of finding themselves once more in the land of the living so to speak they were all still of the same age as when they commenced their unfortunate chase in the wood of wonders and the eldest was not yet twenty the fairy desired to take three or four hours repose she made fairer lie down beside her and relate her adventures she did so with so touching a voice her discourse was so unaffected and so full of truth that she engaged the fairy without reserve to assist her love and render her happy she did not forget to speak to her of de Sirs, and the fairy was immediately interested in her favor they went to sleep after a long conversation which they had agreeably interrupted from time to time by the interchange of affectionate caresses the next day they all set out for the palace wishing pleasantly to surprise the fairies they quitted without regret the wood of wonders and quickly arrived at the palace as they approached the inner court they heard a thousand melodious sounds which composed an excellent concert here is a fete going on said the fairy we have arrived apropos and advancing they found the court filled with an incredible number of people the fairy caused the gate to be opened and entered with her train the first persons who recognized her uttered the loudest exclamations of delight and the cause of this great joy was quickly made known to the multitude but on advancing the fairy was struck by a strange spectacle she saw a young girl more lovely than the graces and with the form of venus bound to a stake near a pile of wood where apparently she was about to be burnt to death fairer than a fairy uttered a loud cry as she recognized de Sirs, but she was much astonished when at the same moment she lost sight of her and a young man appeared in her place so handsome and so well made that one might never be tired of looking at him at this sight fairer uttered a still louder cry and running towards him without any regard to appearances she flung herself on his neck exclaiming a thousand times it is my brother it is my brother it was her brother who was also the fortunate lover of princess de Sirs, and who fearing they would put her to death had given her the gem of gyges to rescue her from the cruelty of queen nabot and by doing so became himself visible the brother and sister lavished a hundred caresses on each other the invisible de Sirs added hers and her voice was heard although she was not to be seen whilst the fairies in unparalleled astonishment expressed in every variety of manner their rapture at again beholding their virtuous queen 
the good fairies came and threw themselves at her feet kissing her hand and her garments some wept some were unable to speak each testified her joy according to her peculiar character the bad fairies the partisans of nabot also pretended to be delighted and policy gave an air of sincerity to their hypocritical demonstrations nabot herself in despair at this return controlled herself with an art of which she alone was capable she offered at once to resign her power to the rightful sovereign who with a grave and majestic air demanded of her why the young girl whom she had seen bound to the stake merited such a punishment and since when they had been accustomed to celebrate a cruel execution by fates and sports nabot excused herself very lamely and the queen listened impatiently when the lover of Dessers spoke thus they punish this princess said he because she is too amiable they torment for the same reason the princess my sister they were both born as handsome as you now behold them he then begged his lady love to cover up the gem of gyges and she immediately appeared again the sirs charmed all who saw her they are beautiful pursued he they possess a thousand virtues which they do not derive from the fairies that is why they are rousted up to persecute them what injustice to tyrannize over all those whose charms do not emanate from yourselves the prince paused the queen turned towards the assembly with an agreeable air i demand said she that these three persons shall be given up to me they shall enjoy the most happy fate that can fall to the lot of mortals i owe much to the fairer than a fairy and she shall be rewarded for the service she has done me by uninterrupted felicity you shall continue to reign madam added she turning to nabot this empire is sufficiently large for you and me go to the beautiful islands which belong to you leave me your son i will share my power with him and i will marry him to fairer than a fairy this union will reconcile us to one another nabot was enraged at all these decisions of the queen but it was of no use to complain she was not the strongest she had but to obey she was about to do so with a bad grace when the beautiful ferris arrived followed by a gallant train of youths who composed his court he came to pay his homage to the queen and manifest his joy at her return but in passing he cast a look at fairer than a fairy and made her comprehend by his passionate glances that she was the first object of his devotion the queen embraced him and presented him to fairer begging him to accept her at her hands there is no need to say he obeyed joyfully exclaiming with transport o oh, love for all my tender care and aid by this rich guerdon i am overpaid the two marriages were celebrated on the same day both couples were so happy that tis said they are the only pairs who have ever really gained the golden vine and that those who have been since named as having done so are purely fabulous personages thus innocence triumphs over the misfortunes with which it is assailed envy and jealousy only serve to increase its lustre and often the justice of heaven renders its possessors happier for the trials they have undergone there is a providence which watches over the conduct of mortals and delights in rewarding the worthy even in this world end of section seventeen section eighteen of four and twenty fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by veronica cerny the good woman by mademoiselle de la force translated by james planchet there was once upon a time a good woman who was kind candid and courageous she had experienced all the vicissitudes which can agitate human existence she had resided at court and had endured all the storms to which it is so subject treasons perfidies infidelities loss of wealth loss of friends so that disgusted with dwelling in a place in which dissimulation and hypocrisy have established their empire and weary of an intercourse wherein hearts never appear as they really are she resolved to quit her own country and go to a distance where she could forget the world 
and where the world would hear no more of her. When she believed herself far enough off, she built a small house in an extremely agreeable situation. All she could then do was to buy a little flock of sheep, which furnished her with food and clothing. She had hardly made trial of this mode of life before she found herself perfectly happy. There is, then, some state of existence in which one may enjoy content, said she, and the choice I have made leaves me nothing to desire. She passed each day in plying her distaff and tending her flock. She would sometimes have liked a little society, but she feared the danger of it. She was insensibly becoming accustomed to the life she led when one day, as she was endeavouring to collect her little flock, it began to scatter itself over the country and fly from her. In fact, it fled so fast that in a very short time she could scarcely see one of her sheep. "'Am I a devouring wolf?' cried she. "'What means this wonder?' She called to a favourite ewe, but it appeared not to know her voice. She ran after it, exclaiming, "'I will not care for losing all the rest of the flock if thou dost but remain to me.' But the ungrateful creature continued its flight and disappeared with the rest. The good woman was deeply distressed at the loss she had sustained. "'I have now nothing left,' cried she. "'Maybe I shall not find even my garden, or my little cottage will no longer be in its place.' She returned slowly, for she was very tired with the race she had had. She lived upon fruit and vegetables for some time, after exhausting a small stock of cheese. She began to see the end of all this. "'Fortune,' said she, "'thou hast in vain sought to persecute me even in this remote spot. Thou canst not prevent me from being ready to behold the gates of death without alarm, and after so much trouble I shall descend with tranquillity into those peaceful shades.' She had nothing more to spin, she had nothing more to eat. Leaning on her distaff, she bent her steps towards a little wood, and looking round for a place to rest in, she was astonished at seeing run towards her three little children, more beautiful than the fairest day. She was delighted to see such charming company. They loaded her with a hundred caresses, and as she seated herself on the ground, in order to receive them more conveniently, one threw its little arms round her neck, the other encircled her waist from behind and the third called her mother. She waited a long time to see if someone would not come to fetch them, believing that those who had led them thither would not fail to return for them. All the day passed without her seeing any one. She resolved to take them to her own home, and thought heaven had sent her this little flock instead of the one she had lost. It was composed of two girls, who were only two or three years old, and a little boy of five. Each had a little ribbon round its neck, to which was attached a small jewel. One was a golden cherry enameled with crimson, and engraved with the name of Lirette. She thought that this must be the name of the little girl who wore it, and she resolved to call her by it. The other was a medlar, on which was written Myrtis, and the little boy had an almond of green enamel, around which was written Finfin. The good woman felt perfectly satisfied that these were their names. The little girls had some jewels in their head-dresses, and more than enough to put the good woman in easy circumstances. She had very soon bought another flock, and surrounded herself with everything necessary for the maintenance of her interesting family. She made their winter clothing of the bark of trees, and in the summer they had white cotton dresses of the finest bleaching. Young as they were, they tended their flock, and this time the flock was faithful and was more docile and obedient to them than towards the large dogs which guarded them, and these dogs were also gentle and attached to the children. They grew visibly and passed their days most innocently. They loved the good woman, and were all three excessively fond of each other. They occupied themselves in tending their sheep, fishing with a line, spreading nets to catch birds, working in a little garden of their own, and employed their delicate hands in cultivating flowers. There was one rose-tree, which the young Lirette was especially fond of. She watered it often, and took the greatest care of it. She thought nothing so beautiful as a rose, and loved it above all other flowers. She had a fancy one day to open a bud, and try to find its heart, when in doing so she pricked her finger with a thorn. The pain was sharp, and she began to cry. The beautiful Finfin, who very seldom left her, approached, and began to cry too, at seeing her suffer. He took her little finger, pressed it, and squeezed the blood gently from it. 
the good woman who saw their alarm at this accident approached and learning the cause of it why so inquisitive said she why destroy the flower you love so much i wanted its heart replied lirette such desires are always fatal replied the good woman but mother pursued lirette why has this flower which is so beautiful and which pleases me so much thorns to show you said the good woman that we must distrust the greatest part of those things which please our eyes and that the most agreeable objects hide snares which may be to us most deadly how replied lirette must one not then love everything which is pleasant no certainly said the good woman and you must take good care not to do so but i love my brother with all my heart replied she he is so handsome and so charming you may love your brother replied her mother but if he were not your brother you ought not to love him lirette shook her head and thought this rule very hard finfin meanwhile was still occupied with her finger he squeezed on the wound the juice of the rose leaves and wrapped it in them the good woman asked him why he did that because i think said he that the remedy may be found in the same thing which has caused the evil the good woman smiled at this reason my dear t child replied she not in this case i thought it was in all cases said he for sometimes when lirette looks at me she troubles me greatly i feel quite agitated and the moment after those same looks cause me a pleasure which i cannot express to you when she scolds me sometimes i am very wretched but let her speak at length one gentle word to me i am all joy again the good woman wondered what these children would think of next she did not know their relations to each other, and she dreaded their loving each other too much. She would have given anything to learn if they were brother and sister. Her ignorance on this point caused her great anxiety, but their extreme youth reassured her. Finfin was already full of attention to the little Lirette. He loved her much better than Myrtis. He had at one time given her some young partridges, the prettiest in the world, which he had caught she reared one which became a fine bird with very beautiful plumage lirette loved it excessively and gave it to finfin it followed him everywhere and he taught it a thousand diverting tricks he had one day taken it with him when going to tend his flock on returning home he could not find his partridge he sought for it everywhere and distressed himself greatly at its loss Murdis tried to console him but without success sister he replied i am in despair Lirette will be angry. All you say to me does not diminish my grief. Well, brother, said she, we will get up very early to-morrow and go in search of another. I cannot bear to see you so miserable. Lirette arrived as she said this, and having learnt the cause of Finfin's sorrow, she began to smile. My dear brother, said she to him, we will find another partridge. It is nothing but the state in which I see you that gives me pain. These words suffice to restore serenity and calm to the heart and countenance of Finfin. Why, said he to himself, could Myrtis not restore my spirits with all her kindness, while Lirette has done it with a single little word? Two is one too many. Lirette is enough for me. On the other hand, Myrtis saw plainly that her brother made a difference between her and Lirette. Oh, we are not enough here being three, said she. I ought to have another brother who would love me as much as Finfin does my sister. Lirette was now twelve years old, Myrtis thirteen, and Finfin fifteen. When one evening after supper they were all seated in front of the cottage with the good woman who instructed them in a hundred agreeable things. The youthful Finfin, seeing Lirette playing with a jewel on her neck, asked his dear mamma what it was for. She replied that she had found one on each of them when they fell into her hands. Lirette then said, If mine would but do as I tell it, I should be glad. And what would you have it do? asked Finfin. You shall see, said she, and then taking the end of the ribbon. Little Cherry, she continued, I should like to have a beautiful house of roses. At the same moment they heard a slight noise behind them. Murdis turned round first, and uttered a loud cry. She had cause, for instead of the cottage of the good woman, there appeared one of the most charming that could possibly be seen. It was not lofty, but the roof was formed of roses that would bloom in winter as well as in summer. 
they entered it and found the most agreeable apartments furnished magnificently. In the midst of each room was a rose tree in full flower in a precious vase, and in the first which they entered they found the partridge Finfin had lost, which flew onto his shoulder and gave him a hundred caresses. Is it only to wish? said Mirtis, and taking the ribbon of her jewel in her hand, Little Medlar, she continued, give us a garden more beautiful than our own. Hardly had she finished speaking when a garden was presented to their view of extraordinary beauty, and in which everything that could be imagined to delight the senses appeared in the highest perfection. The young folks began immediately to run through the beautiful alleys, amongst the flower-beds, and round about the fountains. "'Do you wish something, brother?' said Lirette. "'But I have nothing to wish for,' said he, "'except to be loved by you as much as you are loved by me.' "'Oh!' replied she, my heart can satisfy you on that point. That does not depend on your almond. Well, then, said Finfin, almond, little almond, I wish that a great forest should rise near by, in which the king's sh son shall come to hunt, and that he shall fall in love with Mirtis. What have I done to you? replied the beautiful girl. I do not wish to leave the innocent life which we lead. "'You are right, my child,' said the good woman, "'and I admire the wisdom of your sentiments. "'Besides which, they say that this king is a cruel usurper "'who has put to death the rightful sovereign and all his family. "'Perhaps the son may be no better than his father.' "'The good woman, however, was quite astonished "'at the strange wishes of these wonderful children "'and knew not what to think of them. "'When night was come, she retired into the house of roses, "'and in the morning she found that there was a large forest close to the house.' It formed a fine hunting ground for our young shepherds. Finfin often hunted down it, deer, hearts, and roebucks. He gave a fawn whiter than snow to the lovely Lirette. It followed her as a partridge followed Finfin, and when they were separated for a short period, they wrote to each other and sent their notes by these messengers. It was the prettiest thing in the world. The little family lived thus tranquilly, occupied with different employments according to the seasons. They always attended to their flocks, but in the summer their occupations were most pleasant. They hunted much in the winter. They had bows and arrows, and sometimes went such long distances that they returned, with slow steps and almost frozen, to the house of roses. The good woman would receive them by a large fire. She did not know which to begin to warm first. Lirette, my daughter Lirette, she would say, place your little feet here. And taking Mirtis in her arms, Mirtis, my child, continued she, Give me your beautiful hands to warm, and you, my son, Finfin, come nearer. Then, placing them all three on a sofa, she would pay them every attention in the most charming and gentle manner. Thus they passed their days in peace and happiness. The good woman wondered at the sympathy between Finfin and Lirette, for Mirtis was as beautiful and had no less amiable qualities. But certainly Finfin did not love her as fervently as the other. "'If they are brother and sister, as I believe,' said the good woman, "'by their matchless beauty, what shall I do? "'They are so similar in everything that they must assuredly be of the same blood. "'If it be so, this affection is very dangerous. "'If not, I might render it legitimate by letting them marry, "'and they both love me so much that their union would ensure joy and peace to my declining days.' In her uncertainty, she had forbidden Lirette, who was fast advancing to womanhood, to be ever alone with Finfin, and for better security she had ordered Mirtis to be always with them. Lirette obeyed her with perfect submission, and Mirtis did also as she had commanded her. The good woman had heard speak of a clever fairy, and resolved to go in search of her, and endeavor to enlighten herself respecting the fate of these children. One day, when Lirette was slightly indisposed, and Mirtis and Finfin were out hunting, the good woman thought it a convenient opportunity to go in search of Madame Tutu, for such was the name of the fairy. She left Lirette, therefore, at the House of Roses, but she had not got far on her way before she met Lirette's fawn, which was going towards the forest, and at the same time she saw Finfin's partridge coming from it. They joined each other close to her. It was not without astonishment that she saw round the neck of each a little ribbon with a paper attached. She called the partridge, which flew to her, and taking the paper from it, she read these lines. To Lirette, dear bird, repair. Absent from her sight, I languish. 
all my love to her declare secret joy and silent anguish much too cold her heart i fear such a passion e'er to know were i to her but half as dear no greater bliss i'd crave below <gasps> what words cried the good woman what phrases simple friendship does not express itself with so much warmth then stopping the fawn which came to lick her hand she unfastened the paper from its neck opened it and found in it these words the sun is setting you are absent yet although you left me by its earliest light return dear finfin surely you forget without you day to me is endless night just as they did when i was in the world continued the good woman who could have taught lirette so much in this desert what can i do to cut betimes the root of so pernicious an evil eh madam where what are you so anxious about said the partridge let them alone those who conduct them know better than you the good woman remained speechless she knew well that the partridge spoke by means of supernatural art the note fell from her hands in her fright the fawn and the partridge picked them up the one ran and the other flew and the partridge called so often too too that the good woman thought it must be that powerful fairy who had caused it to speak she recovered herself a little after this reflection but not feeling equal to the journey she had undertaken she retraced her steps to the house of roses meanwhile finfin and myrtis had hunted the livelong day and being tired they had placed their game on the ground and sat down to rest under a tree where they fell asleep the king's son also hunted that day in the forest he missed his suite and came to the place where our young shepherd and shepherdess were reposing he contemplated them for some time with wonder finfin had made a pillow of his game bag and the head of myrtis reclined on the breast of finfin the prince thought myrtis so beautiful that he precipitately dismounted from his horse to examine her features with more attention he judged by their scripts and the simplicity of their apparel that they were only some shepherd's children he sighed from grief having already sighed from love and this love even was followed in an instant by jealousy the position in which he found these young people made him believe that such familiarity could only result from the affection which united them in this uneasy state of mind not being able to tolerate their prolonged repose he touched the handsome finfin with his spear he started up and seeing a man before him he passed his hand over the face of myrtis and awoke her calling her sister a name which dissipated in a moment the alarm of the young prince myrtis rose up quite astonished she had never seen any one but finfin the young prince was the same age as herself he was superbly attired and had a face full of charming expression he began saying many sweet things to her she listened to him with a pleasure which she had never before experienced and she responded to them in a simple manner full of grace finfin saw that it was getting late and the fawn having arrived with, with lorette's letter he told his sister it was time to go home come brother said she to the young prince giving her her hand come with us into the house of roses for as she believed finfin to be her brother she thought that every one who was handsome like him must be her brother also the young prince did not require much pressing to follow her finfin threw on the back of his fawn the game he had shot and the handsome prince carried the bow and the game bag of myrtis in this order they arrived at the house of roses lirette came out to meet them she gave the prince a smiling reception and turned towards myrtis i am delighted said she that you have had such good sport they went all together to seek the good woman to whom the prince made known his high birth she paid due attention to so illustrious a guest and gave him a handsome apartment he remained two or three days with her and this was long enough to complete his conquest by myrtis according to finfin's request to his little almond meanwhile the suite of the prince had been much surprised at his absence they had found his horse and they believed that some frightful accident had befallen him they sought him everywhere and the wicked king who was his father was in a great fury at their not being able to find him the queen his mother who was very amiable and the sister of the king whom her husband had cruelly murdered was in an inconceivable state of grief at the loss of her son 
In her extreme distress, she sent secretly in search of Madame Tutu, who was an old friend of hers, but whom she had not seen for some time, because the king hated her, and had done her much injury with a person she dearly loved. Madame Tutu arrived, without being perceived, in the cabinet of the queen. After they had embraced each other affectionately, for there is not much difference between a queen and a fairy, they having almost equal power, the fairy Tutu told her that she would very soon see her son. She begged her not to make herself uneasy, and not to be at all distressed at anything that might happen, that either she was very much deceived, or she could promise her a delight which was quite unexpected by her, and that she would be one day the happiest of creatures. The king's people made so many inquiries for the prince, and sought him with so much care, that at length they found him at the House of Roses. They led him back to the king, who scolded him brutally, as though he were not the most beautiful youth in the world. He remained very sad at the court of his father, and thinking of his beautiful Murdis. At length his grief was so visible on his countenance, that he was obliged to take his mother into his confidence, who consoled him extremely. "'If you will mount your beautiful palfrey,' said he, "'and come to the House of Roses, you will be charmed with what you will see.' The queen consented willingly and took her son with her, who was enchanted at seeing his dear mistress again. The queen was astonished at the great beauty of Myrtis, and also at that of Lirette and Finfin. She embraced them with as much tenderness as if they had been her own children, and conceived an immense friendship from that moment for the good woman. She admired the house, the garden, and all the curiosities she saw there. When she returned, the king desired her to give an account of her journey. She did so naturally, and he took a great fancy to go also, and see the wonders which she had described. His son asked permission to accompany him. He consented with a sullen air, for he never did anything with a good grace. As soon as he saw the House of Roses, he coveted it. He paid not the least attention to the charming inhabitants of his beautiful place, and by way of commencing to take possession of their property, he said that he would sleep there that evening. The good woman was very much vexed at such a resolution. She heard an uproar and saw a disorder in her household, which frightened her. "'What has become,' cried she, "'of the happy tranquillity which I once enjoyed here? The least breath of fortune destroys all the calm of life.' She gave the king an excellent bed, and withdrew into a corner of the dwelling with her little family. The wicked king went to bed, but found it impossible to go to sleep, and opening his eyes he saw at the foot of his couch a little old woman, who was not half a yard high and about as broad. She had great spectacles which covered all her face, and she made frightful grimaces at him. The base are generally cowards. He was in a terrible fr fright and felt at the same time a thousand points of needles pricking him all over. In this tormenting state of body and mind he was kept awake the entire night, and made a great noise about it. The king stormed and swore in language which was not at all consistent with his dignity. "'Sleep, sleep, sire,' said the partridge, "'or let us sleep. If the condition of royalty is so full of anxiety, I prefer being a partridge to being a king.' The king was more than ever alarmed at these words. He commanded them to seize the partridge, which roosted in a porcelain vase, but she flew away at this order, beating his face with her wings. He still saw the same vision, and felt the same prickings. He was dreadfully frightened, and his anger became more furious. "'Ah!' said he, "'it is a spell of this sorceress, whom they call the good woman. I will rid myself of her and all her race by putting them to death.' He got up, not being able to rest in bed, and as soon as day broke he commanded his guards to seize all the innocent little family and fling them into dungeons. He had them dragged before him that he might witness their despair. Those charming faces bedewed with tears touched him not. On the contrary, he felt a malignant joy at the sight. His son, whose tender heart was rent by so sad a spectacle, could not turn his eyes upon Murdis without an agony which nothing could exceed. A true lover on such occasions suffers more than the person beloved. They seized these poor innocents, and were leading them away when the young Finfin, who had no arms with which to oppose these barbarians, took the ribbon on a sudden from his neck. "'Little Almond,' cried he, "'I wish that we were out of the power of the king!' 
and with his great enemies, my dear Cherry, continued Lirette, and that we might take away with us the handsome prince, my medlar, admitted Murdis. They had hardly uttered these words when they found themselves with the prince, the partridge, and the fawn all together in a car, which rising with them in the air, they soon lost sight of the king and the house of roses. Murdis had no sooner expressed her wish than she repented of it. She knew well that she had inconsiderately allowed herself to be carried away by an impulse of which she was not the mistress. Therefore, during all the journey, she kept her eyes cast down and felt much abashed. The good woman gave her a severe glance. "'My daughter,' said she, "'you have not done well to separate the prince from his father. However unjust he may be, he ought not to leave him.' "'Ah, oh, madam,' replied the prince, "'do not complain that I have the happiness of following you. "'I respect the king my father, "'but I should have left him a hundred times "'had it not been for the virtue, the kindness, "'and tenderness of the queen my mother, "'which have always detained me.' "'As he finished these words, "'they found themselves in front of a beautiful palace "'where they alighted and were received by Madam Tutu. "'She was the most lovely person in the world, "'young, lively, and gay.' She paid them a hundred compliments, and confessed to them that it was she who had given them all the pleasures which they had enjoyed in their lives, and had also bestowed on them the cherry, the almond, and the medlar, the virtues of which were at an end, as they had now arrived in her dominions. Then, addressing the prince in private, she told him that she had heard speak a thousand times of the annoyance he had met with from his father, but, in order that he could not attribute to her any evil that might hereafter befall the king, she frankly admitted she had played him some tricks, but that was the full extent of her vengeance. After that, she assured them that they would all be very happy with her, that they should have flocks to keep, crooks, bows, arrows, and fishing rods, in order that they might amuse themselves in a hundred different ways. She gave them shepherd's dresses of the most elegant description, including the prince with the others, their names and devices being on their crooks, and that very evening, the young prince exchanged crooks with the charming Murdis. The next day, Madame Tutu led them to the most delightful promenade in the world, and showed them the best pasturage for their sheep, and a fine country for the chase. "'You can go,' said she, "'on this side, as far as that beautiful river, but never to the opposite shore. And you may hunt in this wood, but beware,' said she, "'of passing a great oak which is in the midst of the forest.' It is very remarkable, for it has roots and trunk of iron. If you go beyond it, misfortunes may happen to you, from which I cannot protect you. And besides that, I should not perhaps be in a position to assist you promptly, for a fairy has plenty of occupation. The young shepherds assured her that they would do exactly as she prescribed, and all four, leading their flocks into the meadows, left Madame Tutu alone with the good woman. She remarked some anxiety in her manner. "'What is the matter, madam?' said the fairy. "'What cloud has come over your mind?' "'Oh, I will not deny,' said the good woman, "'that I am uneasy at leaving them all thus together. "'I have for some time perceived with sorrow "'that Finfin and Lirette love each other more than is desirable, "'and here, to add to my trouble, another attachment springs up. "'The prince and Murdis do not dislike each other, "'and I fear to leave their youth exposed to the wandering of their hearts.' "'You have brought up these two young girls so well,' replied Madame Tutu, "'that you need fear nothing. "'I will answer for their discretion. "'I will enlighten you as to their destiny.' "'She then informed her that Finfin was the son of the wicked king "'and brother of the young prince, "'that Murdis and Lirette were sisters, "'and daughters of the deceased king, "'who had been murdered and who was the brother of the queen, "'whom the cruel usurper had married.' so that these four young persons were near relations. That the wicked king had ascended the throne after having committed a hundred atrocities, which he wished to crown by the murder of the two princes. That the queen did all she could to prevent him, and not being able to succeed, she had called her, the fairy, to her assistance. That she then told the queen she would save them, but that she could only do so by taking with them her eldest son. That she undertook to promise she should see them again some day in happiness that on those conditions the queen had consented to a separation which appeared at first very hard, that she had carried them all three off, and that she had confided them to the care of the good woman as the person most worthy of such an office. 
after this the fairy begged her to be at ease assuring her that the union of these young princes would restore peace to the kingdom wherein finfin would reign with lirette the good woman listened to this discourse with great interest but not without letting fall some tears madame tutu was surprised at this emotion and asked the cause oh alas said she i fear they will lose their innocence by this grandeur to which they will be elevated and that so brilliant a fortune will corrupt their virtue no replied the fairy do not fear so great a misfortune the principles you have instilled into them are too excellent it is possible to be a king and yet an honest man you know that there is one in the universe who is the model of perfect monarchs therefore set your mind at rest i shall be with you as much as possible and i hope you will not be melancholy here the good woman believed her and after a short time felt perfectly satisfied the young shepherds were so happy also that they desired nothing but the continuance of their agreeable mode of life their pleasures although tranquil were not without interest they saw each other every day and the days only appeared to them too short the bad king learned that they were with madame tutu but all his power could not take them away from her he knew by what magic spell she protected them he saw clearly that he could only get the better of them by stratagem he had not been able to inhabit the house of roses in consequence of the continual tricks played on him by madame tutu he hated her more than ever as well as the good woman and his hatred now extended also to his son he employed all kinds of artifice in order to get into his power some one of the four young shepherds but his art did not extend to the dominions of madame tutu one unlucky day there are some which we cannot avoid these amiable shepherds had bent their steps in the direction of the fatal oak when the beautiful lirette preserved upon a tree about twenty paces distant a bird of such rare plumage that she let fly an arrow at it on the impulse of the moment and seeing the bird fall dead ran to pick it up all this was done instantaneously and without reflection but the poor lirette found to her cost that she was caught herself it was impossible for her to return she desired but had no power to do so she discovered her error and all she could do was to extend her arms for pity to her brothers and sisters murdis began to cry and finfin without hesitation ran to her i will perish with you he cried and in a moment had joined her murdis wished to follow them but the young prince detained her let us go and apprise madame tutu of this said he that is the best assistance we can render them at the same moment they saw the people of the wicked king seize them and all they could do was to cry adieu to each other the king had caused this beautiful bird to be placed there by his hunters to serve as a snare for the shepherds he fully expected what had come to pass they led lirette and finfin before the cruel monarch who abused them terribly and had them confined in a dark and strong prison it was then they began to lament that their little cherry and almond had lost their virtue the fawn and the partridge sought for them but the fawn not being able to see them shed some tears of grief and finding the king had given orders that she should be taken and burnt alive she saved herself by running fast to murdis the partridge was more fortunate for she saw them every day through the grating of their prison happily for them the king had not thought of separating them when one loves it is a pleasure to suffer together the partridge flew back every day and came to tell the news to madame tutu the good woman and murdis murdis was very unhappy and without the handsome prince she would have been inconsolable she resolved to write to these poor captives by the faithful partridge and hung a little bottle of ink to her neck with some paper and put a pen in her beak the good partridge thus loaded presented herself at the bars of the prison and it was a great delight to our young shepherds to see her again finfin put out his hand and took from her all she brought him after which they began to read as follows murdis and the prince to lirette and finfin know you how we languish during this cruel separation that we sigh incessantly and that perhaps it may kill us we should already have died had we not been sustained by hope that hope has supported us ever since madame tutu has assured us that you still lived believe us dear lorette and finfin we shall meet again despite of malice and be happy 
this letter had a powerful effect on the minds of lirette and finfin they were filled with joy and wrote immediately this reply lirette and finfin to murdis and the prince we have you received your letter with extreme pleasure it has rejoiced us more than we could have anticipated in these regions of horror our torments would be insupportable but for the sweet consolation we derive from each other's presence near the object of our affections we are insensible to pain and love renders everything delightful adieu dear prince adieu murdis encourage your mutual passion be always inspired by a tender fidelity you hold out a hope to us in which we participate the greatest blessing which can occur to us will be accompanied by your presence finfin having attached this note to the neck of the partridge she flew away with it very quickly the young shepherds received such great consolation from it but the good woman could not be comforted from the moment she had been separated from those so dear to her and whom she knew to be in so much peril how quickly my happiness has vanished said she to madame tutu i seem to have been born only to be continually agitated i thought i had taken the only means for ensuring my repose ah oh, how purblind are mortals and do you not know replied the fairy that there is no state of existence in this world in which one can live always happily i do replied the good woman mournfully and if one cannot find happiness in oneself it is seldom found elsewhere but madam consider the fate of my children i beg you they have not remembered the orders i gave them replied madame tutu but let us think of a remedy madame tutu entered her library with the good woman she read nearly all the night and having at length taken down and opened a large book which she had frequently passed over although its sides were covered with plates of gold she appeared plunged on a sudden into a state of excessive sadness after some time and just as day was breaking the good woman observing a few tears fall on the leaves of the book took the liberty to ask the cause of the fairy's sorrow i grieve said she at the irrevocable decree of fate which i have learned from these pages and which i shudder and tremble to acquaint you with are they dead cried the good woman no pursued madame tutu but nothing can save them unless you or i go and present ourselves to the king and satisfy his vengeance i confess the truth to you madam continued the fairy that i do not feel sufficient affection for them nor enough courage to go thus and expose myself to his fury and i question also if any one could be found capable of such a sacrifice pardon me madam replied the good woman with great firmness i will go seek this king no sacrifice is too great for me that will save my children i will pour out for them with all my heart every drop of blood which i have in my veins madame tutu could not sufficiently admire so grand a resolution she promised to assist her in every way in her power but that she found herself limited in this instance in consequence of the fault which they had committed the good woman took leave of her and would not acquaint murdis or the prince with her design for fear of affecting them and weakening her own determination she set out with the partridge flying by her side and as they passed the iron oak the partridge snatched with her beak a little moss from its trunk and placed it in the hands of the good woman when you are in the greatest peril which can befall you said she to her throw this moss at the feet of the king the good woman treasured up these words and hardly had she advanced some steps when she was seized by some of the wicked king's soldiers whom he always kept in readiness on the outskirts of the domain of madame tutu they led her before him i have thee at last wicked creature said he i will put thee to death by the most cruel torture i came but for that purpose replied she and thou mayest exercise thy cruelty as thou wilt on me only spare my children who are so young and incapable of having offended thee i offer thee my life for theirs all who heard these words were filled with pity at her magnanimity the king alone was unmoved the queen who was present shed a torrent of tears the king was so indignant with her that he would have killed her if her attendants had not placed themselves between them she fled uttering piercing cries the barbarous king caused the good woman to be shut up ordering them to feed her well in order to render approaching death more frightful to her he commanded them to fill a pit with snakes 
vipers, and serpents, promising himself the pleasure of precipitating the good woman into it. What a horrible mode of execution! It makes one shudder to think of it. The officers of this unjust prince obeyed him with regret, and when they had fulfilled this frightful order, the king came to the spot. They were about to bind the good woman when she begged them not to do so, assuring them that she had sufficient courage to meet death with her hands free. And feeling she had no time to lose, she approached the king and threw the moss at his feet. He was at that moment close to the frightful gulf, and stepping forward to inspect it again with pleasure, his feet slipped on the moss, and he fell in. Hardly had he reached the bottom of the pit, when the sanguinary reptiles darted upon him and stung him to death, and the good woman at the same instant found herself in company with her dear partridge in the house of roses. Whilst these things were happening, Finfin and Lorette were almost dead with misery in their fearful prison. Their innocent affection alone kept them alive. They were saying very sad and very affecting things to each other, when they perceived on a sudden the doors of their dungeon open, and admit Murtis, the handsome prince, and Madame Tutu, who threw themselves on her necks, and who, though speaking all at once, failed not, in the midst of this joyful confusion, to announce the death of the king. "'He was your father, Finfin, as well as that of the prince,' said Madame Tutu. "'But he was unnatural and tyrannical, and would a hundred times have put the queen, your dear mother, to death. "'Let us go to seek her,' they, they did so. Her amiable nature made her feel some regret at the death of the king, her husband. Finfin and the prince also paid all decent respect to his memory. Finfin was acknowledged king, and Murtis and Lirette princesses. They went all together to the House of Roses to see the generous good woman, who thought she should die of joy in embracing them. They all acknowledged that they owed their lives to her, and more than their lives, as they were indebted to her for their happiness also. From that moment they considered themselves perfectly happy. The marriages were celebrated with great pomp. King Finfin espoused the Princess Lirette and Murtis the Prince. When these splendid nuptials were over, the good woman asked permission to retire to the House of Roses. They were very unwilling to consent to this, but yielded to her sincere wish. The widowed queen also desired to pass the rest of her life with the good woman, and the partridge and the fawn did likewise. They were quite disgusted with the world, and found tranquillity in that charming retreat. Madame Tutu often went to visit them, as did the king and queen, the prince and the princess. Happy those who can imitate the actions of the good woman. Such grandeur of soul must ever meet due reward. Little do they fear, being wrecked on the shoals of fortune, who can give up all with so much courage. Discretion, sense, virtue. What may not mortals owe to you, their truest friends in need? End of section 18 Recording by Veronica Cerny Section 19 of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Beauty and the Beast by Madame de Villeneuve, translated by James Blanche. Part 1 In a country very far from this is to be seen a great city, wherein trade flourishes abundantly. It numbered amongst its citizens a merchant who succeeded in all his speculations, and upon whom fortune, responding to his wishes, had always showered her fairest favors. But if he had immense wealth, he had also a great many children, his family consisting of six boys and six girls. None of them were settled in life. The boys were too young to think of it the girls too proud of their fortunes, upon which they had every reason to count, could not easily determine upon the choice they should make. Their vanity was flattered by the attentions of the handsomest young gentlemen, but a reverse of fortune, which they did not at all expect, came to trouble their felicity. Their house took fire, the splendid furniture with which it was filled, the account books, the notes, 
gold, silver, and all the valuable stores which form the merchant's principal wealth were enveloped in this fatal conflagration, which was so violent that very few of the things could be saved. This first misfortune was but the forerunner of others. The father, with whom hitherto everything had prospered, lost at the same time, either by shipwreck or by pirates, all the ships he had at sea. His correspondence made him a bankrupt, his foreign agents were treacherous. In short, from the greatest opulence, he suddenly fell into the most abject poverty. He had nothing left but a small country house, situated in a lonely place, more than a hundred leagues from the city in which he usually resided. Impelled to seek a place of refuge from noise and tumult, he took his family to this retired spot. Who were in despair at such a revolution, the daughters of this unfortunate merchant were especially horrified at the prospect of the life they should have to lead in this dull solitude. For some time they flattered themselves that, when their father's intention became known, their lovers, who had hitherto sued in vain, would be only too happy to find they were inclined to listen to them. They imagined that the many admirers of each would be all striving to obtain the preference. They thought if they wished only for a husband, they would obtain one. But they did not remain very long in such a delightful illusion. They had lost their greatest attractions when, like a flash of lightning, their father's splendid fortune had disappeared, and their time for choosing had departed with it. Their crowd of admirers vanished at the moment of their downfall. Their beauty was not sufficiently powerful to retain one of them. Their friends were not more generous than their lovers. From the hour they became poor, everyone, without exception, ceased to know them. Some were even cruel enough to impute their misfortunes to their own acts. Those whom the father had most obliged were his most vehement calumniators. They reported that all his calamities were brought on by his own bad conduct, his prodigality and the foolish extravagance of himself and his children. This wretched family, therefore, could not do better than depart from a city wherein everybody took a pleasure in insulting them in their misfortunes. Having no resource whatever, they shut themselves up in their country house, situated in the middle of an almost impenetrable forest and which might well be considered the saddest abode in the world. What misery they had to endure in this frightful solitude! They were forced to do the hardest work, not being able to have anyone to wait upon them. This unfortunate merchant's sons were compelled to divide the servants' duties amongst them, as well as to exert themselves in every way that people must do who have to earn their livelihood in the country. The daughters, on their part, had sufficient employment. Like the poor peasant girls, they found themselves obliged to employ their delicate hands in all the labors of a rural life, wearing nothing but woolen dresses, having nothing to gratify their vanity, existing upon what the land could give them, limited to common necessaries, but still retaining a refined and dainty taste. These girls incessantly regretted the city and its attractions. Their recollection even of their younger days passed so rapidly in a round of mirth and pleasure was their greatest tournament. The youngest girl, however, displayed greater perseverance and firmness in their common misfortune. She bore her lot cheerfully and with a strength of mind much beyond her years not but what at first she was truly melancholy. Alas, who would not have felt such misfortunes? But after deploring her father's ruin, could she do better than resume her former gaiety, make up her mind to the position she was placed in, and forget a world which she and her family had found so ungrateful, and the friendship of which she was so fully persuaded was not to be relied upon in the time of adversity? Anxious to console herself and her brothers, 
by her amiable disposition and sprightliness, there was nothing she did not do to amuse them. The merchant had spared no cost in her education, nor in that of her sisters. At this sad period she derived all the advantage from it she desired, as she could play exceedingly well upon various instruments and sing to them charmingly. She asked her sisters to follow her example, but her cheerfulness and patience only made them more miserable. These girls, who were so inconsolable in their ill fortune, thought their youngest sister showed a poor and mean spirit, and even silliness, to be so merry in the state it had pleased Providence to reduce them to. How happy she is, said the eldest. She was intended for such coarse occupations, with such low notions. What would she have done in the world? Such remarks were unjust. This young person was much more fitted to shine in society than either of them. She was a perfectly beautiful young creature. Her good temper rendered her adorable. A generous and tender heart was visible in all her words and actions. Quite as much alive to the reverses that had just overwhelmed her family as either of her sisters. By strength of mind, which is not common in her sex, she concealed it, her sorrow, and rose superior to her misfortunes. So much firmness was considered to be insensibility, but one can easily appeal from a judgment pronounced by jealousy. Every intelligent person who saw her in her true light was eager to give her the preference over her sisters. In the midst of her greatest splendor, although distinguished by her merit, she was so handsome that she was called the beauty, known by this name only. What more was required to increase the jealousy and hatred of her sisters? Her charms and the general esteem in which she was held might have induced her to hope for a much more advantageous establishment than her sisters. But feeling only for her father's misfortunes, far from retarding his departure from a city in which she had enjoyed so much pleasure, she did all she could to expedite it. This young girl was as contented in their solitude as she had been in the midst of the world. To amuse herself in her hours of relaxation, she would dress her hair with flowers, and like the shepherdesses of former times, forgetting in a rural life all that had most gratified her in the height of opulence. Every day brought to her some new innocent pleasure. Two years had already passed, and the family began to be accustomed to a country life, when a hope of returning prosperity arrived to discompose their tranquillity. The father received news that one of his vessels, that he thought was lost, had safely arrived in port, richly laden. His informants added, they feared the factors would take advantage of his absence and sell the cargo at a low price, and by this fraud, make a great profit at his expense. He imparted these tidings to his children, who did not doubt for an instant, but that they should soon be enabled to return from exile. The girls, much more impatient than the boys, thinking it was unnecessary to wait for more certain proof, were anxious to set out instantly, and to leave everything behind them. But the father, who was more prudent, begged them to moderate their delight. However important he was to his family, at a time when the labors of the field could not be interrupted without great loss, he determined to leave his sons to get in the harvest, and that he would set out upon this long journey. His daughters, with the exception of the youngest, expected they would soon be restored to their former opulence. They fancied that, even if their father's property would not be considerable enough, to settle them in their great metropolis, their native place, he would at least have sufficient for them to live in a less expensive city. They trusted they should find good society there, attract admirers, and profit by the first offer that might be made to them. Scarcely remembering the troubles they had undergone for the last two years, believing themselves to be already, as by a miracle, removed from poverty into the lap of plenty.
they ventured, for retirement had not cured them of the taste for luxury and display. To overwhelm their father with foolish commissions, they requested him to make purchases of jewelry, attire, and headdresses. Each endeavored to outvie the other in her demands, so that the sum total of their father's supposed fortune would not have been sufficient to satisfy them. Beauty, who was not the slave of ambition, and who always acted with prudence, saw directly that if he executed her sister's commissions, it would be useless for her to ask for anything. But the father, astonished at her silence, said, interrupting his insatiable daughters, Well, Beauty, dost thou not desire anything? What shall I bring thee? What dost thou wish for? Speak freely. My dear papa, replied the amiable girl, embracing him affectionately, I wish for one thing more precious than all the ornaments my sister have asked you for. I have limited my desires to it, and shall be only too happy if they can be fulfilled. It is the gratification of seeing you return in perfect health. This answer was so unmistakably disinterested that it covered the others with shame and confusion. They were so angry that one of them, answering for the rest, said with bitterness, This child gives herself great airs, and fancies that she will distinguish herself by these affected heroics. Surely nothing can be more ridiculous. But the father, touched by her expressions, could not help showing his delight at them, appreciating, too, the feeling which induced her to ask nothing for herself. He begged she would choose something, and to allay the ill will that his other daughters had towards her. He observed to her that such indifference to dress was not natural at her age, that there was a time for everything. Very well, my dear father, said she, since you desire me to make some request, I beg you will bring me a rose. I love that flower passionately, and since I have lived in this desert, I have not had the pleasure of seeing one. This was to obey her father, and at the same time to avoid putting him to any expense for her. At length the day arrived that this good old man was compelled to leave his family. He travelled as fast as he could to the great city to which the prospect of a new fortune recalled him, but he did not meet with the benefits he had hoped for. His vessel had certainly arrived, but his partners, believing him to be dead, had taken possession of it, and all the cargo had been disposed of. Thus, instead of entering into the full and peaceable possession of that which belonged to him, he was compelled to encounter all sorts of chicanery in the pursuit of his rights. He overcame them, but after more than six months of trouble and expense, he was not any richer than he was before. His debtors had become insolvent, and he could hardly defray his own costs. Thus terminated this dream of riches. To add to his disagreeables, he was obliged on the score of economy to start on his homeward journey at the most inconvenient time and in the most frightful weather. Exposed on the road to the piercing blast, he thought he should die with fatigue, but when he found himself within a few miles of his house, which he did not reckon upon leaving for such false hopes, and which beauty had shown her sense in mistrusting, his strength returned to him. It would be some hours before he could cross the forest. It was late, but he wished to continue his journey. He was benighted, suffering from intense cold, buried, one might say, in the snow with his horse, not knowing which way to bend his steps. He thought his last hour had come, no hut in his road, although the forest was filled with them. A tree, hollowed by age, was the best shelter he could find, and only too happy was he to hide himself in it. This tree, protecting him from the cold, was the means of saving his life and the horse a little distance from his master, perceiving another hollow tree, was led by instinct to take shelter in that. The night in such a situation appeared to him to be never-ending, 
Furthermore, he was famished, frightened at the roaring of the wild beasts that were constantly passing by him. Could he be at peace for an instant? His trouble and anxiety did not end with the night. He had no sooner the pleasure of seeing daylight than his distress was greater. The ground appeared so extraordinarily covered with snow. No road could he find. No track was to be seen. It was only after great fatigue and frequent falls that he succeeded in discovering something like a path upon which he could keep his footing. Proceeding without knowing in which direction, chance led him into the avenue of a beautiful castle, which the snow seemed to have respected. It consisted of four rows of orange trees, laden with flowers and fruit. Statues were seen here and there, regardless of order or symmetry, somewhere in the middle of the road, others among the trees, all after the strangest fashion. They were of the size of life, and had the color of human beings in different attitudes and in various dresses, the greatest number representing warriors, Arriving at the first courtyard, he perceived a great many more statues. He was suffering so much from cold that he could not stop to examine them. An agate staircase with balusters of chased gold first presented itself to his sight. He passed through several magnificently furnished rooms. A gentle warmth which he breathed in them renovated him. He needed food, but to whom could he apply? This large and magnificent edifice appeared to be inhabited only by statues. A profound silence reigned throughout it. Nevertheless, it had not the air of an old palace that had been deserted. The halls, the rooms, the galleries were all open. No living thing appeared to be in this charming place. Weary of wandering over this vast dwelling, he stopped in a saloon, wherein was a large fire presuming that it was prepared for someone who would not be long in appearing. He drew near the fireplace to warm himself, but no one came. Seated on a sofa near the fire, a sweet sleep closed his eyelids and left him no longer in a condition to observe the entrance of anyone. Fatigue induced him to sleep. Hunger awoke him. He had been suffering from it for the last twenty-four hours. The exercise that he had taken ever since he had been in this palace increased his appetite. When he awoke and opened his eyes, he was astonished to see a table elegantly laid. A light repast would not have satisfied him, but the viands, magnificently dressed, invited him to eat of everything. His first care was to utter in a loud voice, his thanks to those from whom he had received so much kindness, and he then resolved to wait quietly till it pleased his host to make himself known to him. As fatigue caused him to sleep before his repast, so did the food produce the same effect, and his repose was longer and more powerful. In fact, this second time he slept for at least four hours, Upon awaking in the place of the first table, he saw another porphyry, upon which some kind hand had set out a collation consisting of cakes, preserved fruits, and liqueurs. This was likewise for his use, profiting therefore by the kindness shown him. He partook of everything that suited his appetite, his taste, and his fancy. Finding at length, no one to speak to or to inform him whether this palace was inhabited by a man or by a god. Fear began to take possession of him, for he was naturally timid. He resolved, therefore, to repass through all the apartments and overwhelm them with thanks to the genius to whom he was in debt for so much kindness, and in the most respectful manner solicit him to appear. All his attentions were useless. No appearance of servants, no result by which he could ascertain that the palace was inhabited. Thinking seriously of what he should do, he began to fancy for what reason he could not imagine 
that some good spirit had made this mansion a present to him, with all the riches that it contained. This idea seemed like an inspiration, and without further delay, making a new inspection of it, he took possession of all the treasures he could find. More than this, he settled in his own mind what share of it he should allow to each of his children, and selected the apartments which would particularly suit them, enjoying the delight beforehand which his journey would afford them. He entered the garden where, in spite of the severity of the winter, the rarest flowers were exhaling the most delicious perfume in the mildest and purest air, birds of all kinds blending their songs with the confused noise of the waters, made an agreeable harmony. The old man, in ecstasies at such wonders, said to himself, My daughters will not, I think, find it very difficult to accustom themselves to this delicious abode. I cannot believe that they will regret, or that they will prefer the city to this mansion. Let me set out directly, cried he in a transport of joy rather uncommon for him. I shall increase my happiness in witnessing theirs. I will take possession at once. Upon entering this charming castle, he had taken care, notwithstanding he was nearly perished, to unbridle his horse and let him wind his way to a stable, which he had observed in the forecourt. An alley, ornamented by palisades, formed by rose bushes in full bloom, led to it. He had never seen such lovely roses. Their perfume reminded him that he had made promise to give beauty a rose. He picked one, and was about to gather enough to make a half a dozen bouquets, when a most frightful noise made him turn round. He was terribly alarmed upon perceiving, at his side, a horrible beast, which, with an air of fury, laid upon his neck a kind of truck resembling an elephant's, and said with a terrific voice, Who gave thee permission to gather my roses? It is not enough that I kindly allow thee to remain in my palace, and instead of feeling grateful, rash man, I find thee stealing my flowers. Thy insolence shall not remain unpunished. The good man, already too much overpowered by the unexpected appearance of this monster, thought he should die of fright at these words, and quickly throwing away the fatal rose. Oh, my lord! said he, protesting himself before him. Have mercy on me. I am not ungrateful, penetrated by all your kindness. I did not imagine that so slight a liberty could possibly have offended you. The monster, very angrily, replied, Hold thy tongue, thou foolish joker. I care not for thy flattery, nor for the titles thou bestowest on me. I am not my lord, I am the beast and thou shalt not escape the death thou deservest. The merchant, dismayed at so cruel a sentence, and thinking that submission was the only means to preserve his life, said in a truly affecting manner that the rose he had dared to take was for one of his daughters called Beauty. Then, whether he hoped to escape from death or to induce his enemy to feel for him, he related to him all his misfortunes, he told him the object of his journey, and did not omit to dwell on the little present he was bound to give beauty, adding that was the only thing she had asked for, while the riches of a king would hardly have sufficed to satisfy the wishes of his other daughters, and so came to the opportunity which had offered itself to satisfy the modest desire of beauty, and his belief that he could have done so without any unpleasant consequences, asking pardon moreover for his involuntary fault the beast considered for a moment then speaking in a milder tone he said to him i will pardon thee but upon condition that thou wilt give me one of thy daughters i require someone to repair this fault just heaven replied the merchant how can i keep my word could i be so inhuman as to save my own life at the expense of one of my children's 
Under what pretext could I bring her here? There must be no pretext, interrupted the beast. I expect that whichever daughter you bring here, she will come willingly or I will not have either of them. Go, see if there be not one amongst them sufficiently courageous and loving thee enough to sacrifice herself to save thy life. Thou appears to be an honest man. Give me thy word of honour to return in a month if thou canst decide to bring one of them back with thee. She will remain here and thou wilt return home. If thou canst not do so, promise me to return hither alone after bidding them farewell forever, for thou wilt belong to me. Do not fancy, continued the monster, winting his teeth, that by merely agreeing to my proposition, thou wilt be saved. I warn thee, if thou thinkest so to escape me, I will speak for thee, destroy thee and thy race, although a hundred thousand men appear to defend thee. The good man, although quite convinced that he should not vainly put to the proof the devotion of his daughters, accepted nevertheless the monster's proposition. He promised to return to him at the time named and give himself up to his sad fate, without rendering it necessary for the beast to seek for him. After this assurance, he thought himself at liberty to retire and take leave of the beast, whose presence was most distressing to him. The respite was but brief, yet he feared he might revoke it. He expressed his anxiety to depart, but the beast told him he should not do so, till the following day. Thou wilt find, said he, a horse ready at break of day. He will carry thee home quickly. Adieu, go to supper and await my orders. The poor man, more dead than alive, returned to the saloon in which he had feasted so heartily. Before a large fire, his supper already laid, invited him to sit and enjoy it. The delicacy and richness of the dishes had no longer, however, any temptation for him. Overwhelmed by his grief, he would not have seated himself at the table, but he feared that the beast was concealed it somewhere and observing him, and that he would excite his anger by any slight of his bounty. To avoid further disaster, he made a momentary truce with his grief and as well as his afflicted heart would permit, he tasted in turn the various dishes. At the end of the repast, a great noise was heard in the adjoining apartment, and he did not doubt that it was his formidable host, as he could not manage to avoid his presence. He tried to recover from the alarm which this sudden noise had caused him. At the same moment, the beast who appeared asked him abruptly if he had made a good supper. The good man replied in a modest and timid tone that he had, thanks to his attention, eaten heartily. Promise me, replied the monster, to remember your word to me and to keep it as a man of honour in bringing me one of your daughters. The old man, who was not much entertained with this conversation, swore to him that he would fulfil what he had promised, and return in a month alone or with one of his daughters, if he should find one who loved him sufficiently to follow him on the conditions he must propose to her. I warn thee again, said the beast, to take care not to deceive her, as to the sacrifice which thou must exact from her, or the danger she will incur, Paint to her my face such as it is. Let her know what she is about to do. Above all, let her be firm in her resolution. There will be no time for reflection when thou shalt have brought her hither. There must be no drawing back. Thou wilt be equally lost without obtaining for her the liberty to return. The merchant, who was overcome at this discourse, reiterated his promise to confirm to all that was prescribed to him. The monster, satisfied with his answer, ordered him to retire to rest, and not to rise till he should see the sun, 
and hear a golden bell. Thou wilt breakfast before setting out, said he again, and thou mayst take a rose with thee for beauty. The horse which shall bear thee will be ready in the courtyard. I reckon on seeing thee again in a month, if thou art an honest man. If thou failest in thy word, I shall pay thee a visit. The good man, for fear of prolonging a conversation already too painful to him, made a profound reverence to the beast, who told him again not to be anxious respecting the road by which he should return, as at the time appointed the same horse which he would mount the next morning would be found at his gate, and would suffice for his daughter and himself. However little disposition the old man felt for sleep, he dared not disobey the orders he had received. Obliged to lie down, he did not rise till the sun began to illumine the chamber. His breakfast was soon dispatched, and he then descended into the garden to gather the rose, which the beast had ordered him to take to beauty. How many tears this flower caused him to shed! But the fear of drawing on himself new disasters made him constrain his feelings, and he went without further delay in search of the horse which he had been promised him. He found on the saddle a light but warm cloak. As soon as the horse felt him on his back, he set off with incredible speed. The merchant, who in a moment lost sight of this fatal palace, experienced as great a sensation of joy as he had on the previous evening, felt in perceiving it, with this difference that the delight of leaving it was embittered by the cruel necessity of returning to it. To what have I pledged myself? said he, whilst his courser carried him with a velocity and lightness which is only known in fairy land. Would it not be better that I should become at once the victim of this monster who thirsts for the blood of my family? By a promise I have made, as unnatural as it is indiscreet, I have prolonged my life. Is it possible that I could think of extending my days at the expense of those of my daughters? Can I have the barbarity to lead one to him? To see him, no doubt, devour her before my eyes? But all at once, interrupting himself, he cried, Miserable wretch that I am! What have I to fear, if I could find it in my heart, to silence the voice of nature? Would it depend on me to commit this cowardly act? She must know her fate and consent to it. I see no chance that she will be inclined to sacrifice herself for an inhuman father, and I ought not to make such a proposition to her. It is unjust, but even the affection which they all entertain for me should induce one to devote herself. Would not a single glance at the beast destroy her constancy? And I could not complain. Ah, too imperious beast, exclaimed he. Thou hast done this expressly by putting an impossible condition to the means thou offerest me to escape thy fury and obtain the pardon of a trifling fault. Thou hast added insult to injury. But, continued he, I cannot bear to think of it. I hesitate no longer, and I would rather expose myself without turning away from thy rage than attempt a useless mode of escape which my parental love trembles to employ. Let me retrace, said he, the road to this frightful palace and without deigning to purchase so dearly the remnant of a life which can never be but miserable, without waiting for the month which accorded me to expire, return and terminate this day my miserable existence. At these words he endeavoured to retrace his steps, but he found it impossible to return the bridle of his horse, allowing himself therefore against his will to be carried forward. He resolved at least to propose nothing to his daughters. Already he saw his house in the distance, and strengthening himself more and more in his resolution. I will not speak to them, he said, 
of the danger which threatens me. I shall have the pleasure of embracing them once more. I shall give them my last advice. I will beg them to live on good terms with their brothers, whom I shall also implore not to abandon them. In the midst of this reverie, he reached his door. His own horse, which had found its way home the previous evening, had alarmed his family. His sons dispersed in the forest, had thought him in every direction, and his daughters, in their impatience to hear some tidings of him, were at the door in order to obtain the earliest intelligence. As he was mounted on a magnificent steed and wrapped in a rich cloak, they could not recognize him, but took him at first for a messenger sent by him, and the rose which they perceived attached to the pommel of the saddle made them perfectly easy on his account. When this afflicted father, however, approached nearer, they recognized him, and thought only of evincing their satisfaction at seeing him return in good health. But the sadness depicted in his face, and his eyes filled with tears, which he vainly endeavored to restrain, changed their joy into anxiety. All hastened to inquire the cause of his trouble. He made no reply, but by saying to Beauty, as he presented her with the rose, There is what thou hast demanded of me, but thou wilt pay dearly for it, as well as the others. I was certain, exclaimed the eldest, and I was saying this very moment that she would be the only one whose commission you would execute at this time of the year. A rose must have cost more than you would have had to pay for us all five together. And judging from appearances, the rose will be faded before the day is ended. Never mind, however, you were determined to gratify the fortunate beauty at any price. It is true, replied the father mournfully that this rose has cost me dear and more dear than all the ornaments which you wish for would have done it is not in money however and would to heaven that i might have purchased it with all i am yet worth in the world these words excited the curiosity of his children and dispelled the resolution which he had taken not to reveal his adventure he informed them of the ill success of his journey, the trouble which he had undergone in running after a chimerical fortune, and all that had taken place in the palace of the monster. After this explanation, despair took the place of hope and of joy. The daughters, seeing all their projects annihilated by this thunderbolt, uttered fearful cries. The brothers, more courageous, said resolutely, that they would not suffer their father to return to this frightful castle, that they were bold enough to deliver the earth from this horrible beast, even supposing he should have the temerity to come in search of him. The good man, although moved at their affliction, forbade them to commit violence, telling them that as he had given his word, he would kill himself rather than fail to keep it. Notwithstanding this, they thought for expedience to save his life. The young men, full of courage and filial affection, proposed that one of them should go and offer himself as a victim to the wrath of the beast. But the monster had said positively and explicitly that he would have one of the daughters and not one of the sons. The brave brothers grieved that their good intention could not be acted upon then did what they could to inspire their sisters with the same sentiments. But their jealousy of beauty was sufficient to raise an invincible obstacle to such heroic action. It is not just, said they, that we should perish in so frightful a manner for a fault of which we are not guilty. It would be to render us victims to beauty, to whom they would be very glad to sacrifice us. But duty does not require such a sacrifice. Here is the fruit of the moderation and perpetual preaching of this unhappy girl. Why did she not ask, like us, for a good stock of clothes and jewels? If we had not had them, it has at all events cost nothing for asking. 
and we have no cause to reproach ourselves for having exposed the life of our father by indiscreet demands. If, by an affected disinterestedness, she had not thought to distinguish herself, as she is in all things more favoured than we, he would have no doubt found enough money to content her, but she must needs by her singular caprice bring on us all this misfortune. It is she who has caused it, and they wish us to pay the penalty? We will not be her dupe. She has brought it on herself, and she must find the remedy. Beauty, whose grief had almost deprived her of her consciousness, suppressing her sobs and sighs, said to her sisters, I am the cause of this misfortune. It is I alone who must repair it. I confess it would be unjust to allow you to suffer for my fault. Alas, it was, notwithstanding an innocent wish, could I foresee the desire to have a rose when we were in the middle of summer would be punished so cruelly? The fault is committed, however, whether I am innocent or guilty. It is just that I should expiate it. It cannot be imputed to any one else. I will risk my life, pursued she in a firm tone. To release my father from his fatal engagement, I will go to find the beast, too happy in being able to die in order to preserve the life of him from whom I received mine, and to silence your murmurs, do not fear that anything can turn me from my purpose. But I pray you during this month to do me the favour to spare me your reproaches. So much firmness in a girl of her age surprised them all much, and the brothers, who loved her tenderly, were moved at her resolution. They paid her infinite attention and felt the loss they were about to sustain. But it was requisite to save the life of a father. This spice motive closed their mouths and well persuaded that it was a thing decided on, far from thinking of combating so generous a purpose, they contented themselves by shedding tears and giving their sister all the praise which her noble resolution merited, all the more from her being only sixteen years of age and having the right to regret a life which she was about to sacrifice in so cruel a manner. The father alone would not consent to the design of his youngest daughter, but the others reproach him insolently with the charge that beauty alone was cared for by him, in spite of the misfortune which she had caused, and that he was sorry that it was not one of the elders who should pay for her imprudence. This unjust language forced him to desist. Besides, beauty assured him that if he would not accept the exchange, she would make it in spite of him, for she would go alone to seek the beast, and so perish without saving him. How do we know, said she, forcing herself to assume more tranquillity than she really felt, perhaps the dreadful fate which appears to await me conceals another as happy as this seems terrible. Her sisters, hearing her speak thus, smiled maliciously at the wild idea. They were enchanted at the delusion in which they believed her to be indulging. But the old man, conquered by all her reasons, and remembering an ancient prediction by which he had learned that this daughter should save his life, and that she should be a source of happiness to all her family, ceased to oppose the will of beauty. Incessantly they began to speak of their departure as a thing almost indifferent. It was she who gave the tone to the conversation, and in their presence she appeared to consider it as a happy event. It was only, however, to console her father and brothers, and not to alarm them more than necessary. Although discontented with the conduct of her sisters towards her, who appeared even impatient to see her depart, and thought the month passed too slowly. She had the generosity to divide all her little property and the jewels, which she had at her own disposal amongst them. They received this with pleasure, 
this new proof of her generosity, but without abating their hatred of her, an extreme joy took possession of their hearts when they heard the horse neigh which was sent to carry away a sister whose amiability their jealous natures would not allow them to perceive. The father and the sons alone were so afflicted that they could not contain themselves at this fatal moment. They proposed to strangle the horse. Beauty, however, preserving all her tranquillity, showed them again on this occasion the absurdity of such a design and the impossibility of executing it. After having taken leave of her brothers, she embraced her hard-hearted sisters, taking such a tender farewell of them that she drew from them some tears, and they believed for the space of a few minutes that they were almost as much afflicted as their brothers. End of section 19section twenty of four and twenty fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the story of the beauty and the beast by madame de verneuve translated by james blanchy Part two. During these brief yet lingering leave takings, the good man, hurried by his daughter, had mounted his horse. She placed herself behind him with as much alacrity as though she were going to make an agreeable journey. The animal rather flew than walked, but this extreme speed did not inconvenience her in the least. The paces of this singular horse were so gentle that Beauty felt no more shaken by him than she would have been by the breath of a zephyr. In vain, during the journey, did her father offer a hundred times to allow her to dismount, and to go himself alone to find the beast. Consider, my dear child, said he, there is still time. This monster is more terrible than thou canst imagine. However firm thy resolution may be, I cannot but fear it will fail on beholding him. Then it will be too late. Thou wilt be lost, and we shall both perish together. If I went, replied Beauty, to seek this terrible beast with the hope of being happy, it is not impossible that that hope would fail me at the sight of him. But as I reckon on a speedy death, and believe it to be unavoidable, what does it signify whether he who shall destroy me be agreeable or hideous? Conversing thus, night closed around them, but the horse went quite as fast in the darkness. It was, however, suddenly dissipated by a most unexpected spectacle. This was caused by the discharge of all kinds of beautiful fireworks, flower pots, catherine wheels, suns, bouquets, which dazzled the eyes of our travellers. This agreeable and unlooked-for illumination lighted up the entire forest and diffused a gentle heat through the air, which has become desirable, for the cold in this country was more keenly felt in the night than by day. By this charming light, the father and daughter found themselves in an avenue of orange trees. At the moment that they entered it, the fireworks ceased. The illumination was, however, continued by all the statues, having in their hands lighted torches. Besides these, lamps without number covered the front of the palace, symmetrically arranged in forms of true lovers' knots and crowded ciphers consisting of double L's and double B's. On entering the court, they were received by a salute of artillery, which added to the sound of a thousand instruments of various kinds. Some soft, some warlike, had a fine effect. The beast, 
must be very hungry indeed, said Beauty, half jestingly, to make such a grand rejoicing at the arrival of his prey. However, in spite of her agitation at the approach of an event which, according to all appearance, was about to be fatal to her, she could not avoid paying attention to the magnificent objects which succeeded each other and presented her to her view the most beautiful spectacle she had ever seen, nor help saying to her father that the preparations for her death were more brilliant than the bridal pomp of the greatest king in the world. The horse stopped at the foot of the flight of steps. She alighted quickly, and her father, as soon as he had put foot to the ground, conducted her by vestibule to the saloon in which he had been so well entertained. They found there a large fire, lighted candles which emitted an exquisite perfume, and, above all, a table splendidly served. The good man, accustomed to the manner in which the beast regaled his guests, told his daughter that this repast was intended for them, and that they were at liberty to avail themselves of it. Beauty made no difficulty, well persuaded that it would not hasten her death. On the contrary, she imagined that it would make known to the beast the little repugnance she had felt in coming to see him. She hoped that her frankness might be capable of softening him, and even that her adventure might be less sad than she had first apprehended. The formidable monster with which she had been menaced did not show himself, and the whole palace spoke of joy and magnificence. It appeared that her arrival had caused these demonstrations, and it did not seem probable that they could have been designed for a funeral ceremony. Her hope did not last long, however. The monster made himself heard, a frightful noise, caused by the innumerous weight of his body, by the terrible clank of his scales, and an awful roaring, announced his arrival. Terror took possession of beauty. The old man, embracing his daughter, uttered piercing cries, but recovering herself in a moment, she suppressed her agitation. Seeing the beast approach, whom she could not behold without a shudder, she advanced with a firm step, and with a modest air saluted him very respectfully. This behavior pleased the monster. After having contemplated her, he said to the old man, in a tone which, without being one of anger, might, however, fill with terror the boldest heart, Good evening, my good friend. And turning to Beauty, he said also to her, Good evening, Beauty. The old man, fearing every instant that something awful would happen to his daughter, had not the strength to reply, but Beauty, without agitation, and in a sweet and firm voice, said, Good evening, Beast. Do you come here voluntarily? inquired the Beast, and... Will you consent to let your father depart without following him? Beauty replied that she had no other intention. Ah, and what do you think will become of you after his departure? What it may please you, said she. My life is at your disposal, and I submit blindly to the fate which you may do me to. I am satisfied with your submission, replied the beast and as it appears that they have not brought you here by force you shall remain with me as for thee good man said he to the merchant thou shalt depart to-morrow at daybreak the bell will warn you delay not after thy breakfast the same horse will reconduct thee but added he when thou shalt be in the midst of thy family, dream not of revisiting my palace, and remember it is forbidden thee forever. You, beauty, continued the monster, addressing her, conduct your father into the adjoining wardrobe, and choose anything which both of you think will give pleasure to your brothers and sisters. 
you will find two trunks. Fill them. It is right that you should send them something of sufficient value to oblige them to remember you. In spite of the liberality of the monster, the approaching departure of her father sensibly affected Beauty and caused her extreme grief. However, she determined to obey the beast who quitted them after having said, as he had done on entering, Good night, Beauty. Good night, good man. When they were alone, the good man, embracing his daughter, wept without ceasing. The idea of leaving her with the monster was a most cruel trial to him. He repented having brought her into that place. The gates were open. He wished to lead her away again. But Beauty impressed upon him the danger and the consequences of such a proceeding. They entered the wardrobe, which had been indicated to them. They were surprised at the treasures it contained. It was filled with apparel so superb that a queen could not wish for anything more beautiful or in better taste. Never was a warehouse better filled. When Beauty had chosen the dresses she thought the most suitable, not to the present situation of the family, but proportioned to the riches and liberality of the beast, who was the donor, she opened a press, the door of which was of rock crystal, mounted in gold, Although such a magnificent exterior prepared her to find it contain some rare and precious treasures, she saw such a mass of jewels of all kinds that her eyes could hardly support the brilliancy of them. Beauty, from a feeling of obedience, took without hesitation a prodigious quantity, which she divided as well as she could amongst the lots she had already made. On opening the last cabinet, which was no less than a cabinet filled with pieces of gold, she changed her mind. I think, said she to her father, that it would be better to empty these trucks and to fill them with coin, which you can give to your children according to your pleasure. By these means you will not be obliged to confine your secret to anyone, and your riches will be possessed by you without danger. The advantage that you would drive from the possession of these jewels, although their value might be more considerable, would be attended by inconvenience. In order to profit by them, you would be forced to sell them and to trust them to persons who would only look on you with envious eyes. Your confidence in them might even prove fatal to you, whilst gold pieces of current coin will place you, continued she beyond the reach of any misfortune by giving you the means of acquiring land and houses and purchasing rich furniture ornaments and precious stones the father approved her forethought but wishing to take for his daughters some dresses and ornaments in order to make room for them as well as the gold he took out of the trunks what he had selected for his own use the great quantity of gold which he put in did not fill them, however. They were composed of foes which stretched at pleasure. He found room for the jewels which he had displaced, and in fact these trunks contained more than he could even wish for. So much money, said he to his daughter, will place me in a position to sell my jewels at my own convenience. Following thy counsel, I will hide my wealth from the world and even from my children. If they knew me to be as rich as I shall be, they would torment me to abandon my country life, which, however, is the sole one wherein I have found happiness, and not experience the perfidy of false friends, with whom the world is filled. But the trunks were so immensely heavy that an elephant would have sunk under their weight, and the hope which he had begun to cherish appeared to him a dream, and nothing more. The beast mocks us, said he, and feigns to give me wealth, which he makes it impossible for me to carry away. Suspend your judgment, replied Beauty. You have not provoked his liberality by any indiscreet request, nor by any greedy or interest looks. Raillery would be without point. I think, as the monster has bestowed it on you, that he will certainly find the means of allowing you to enjoy it. We have only to close the trunks and leave them here. No doubt he knows by what coach to send them. 
Nothing could be more prudent than this advice. The good man, conformably to it, re entered the saloon with his daughter, seated together on the sofa. They saw the breakfast instantly served. The father ate with more appetite than he had done the preceding night. That which had come to pass had diminished his despair and revived his confidence. He would have departed without concern if the beast had not had the cruelty to make him understand that he must not dream of seeing his palace again, and that he must wish his daughter an eternal farewell. There is no evil but death without remedy. The good man was not completely stunned by disorder. He flattered himself that it would not be irrevocable, and this hope prepared him to quit his host with tolerable satisfaction. Beauty was not so well satisfied, little persuaded that a happy future was prepared for her. She feared that the rich presence with which the monster loaded her family was but the price of her life, and that he would devour her immediately, that he should be alone with her, or at least that a perpetual prison would be her fate, and that her only companion would be this frightful monster. This reflection plunged her into profound reverie, but a second stroke of the bell warned them that it was time to separate. They descended into the court, where the father found two horses, the one loaded with the two trunks and the other destined for himself, the latter covered with a good cloak, and the saddle having two bags attached to it, full of refreshments, was the same which he had ridden before. So much attention on the part of the beast again supplied them with subject of conversation, but the horses, neighing and stamping with their hoofs, made known to them that it was time to part. The merchant, afraid of irritating the beast by his delay, bade his daughter an eternal farewell. The two horses set off faster than the wind, and Beauty instantly lost sight of them. She mounted in tears to the chamber which was appropriated to her where for some time she was lost in sad reflections. At length, being overcome with sleep, she felt a wish to seek repose, which during a month past she had not enjoyed. Having nothing better to do, she was about to go to bed, when she perceived on the table a service of chocolate prepared. She took it, half asleep, and her eyes almost immediately closed. She fell into a quiet slumber, which, since the moment she had received the fatal rose, had been unknown to her. During her sleep, she dreamt that she was on the bank of a canal, a long way off, the two sides of which were ornamented with two rows of orange trees, and flowering myrtles of immense size, were engrossed with her sad situation. She lamented the misfortune which condemned her to pass her days in this place, without hope of ever leaving it. A young man, beautiful as Cupid is painted, in a voice which touched her heart, then said, Do not, beauty, believe thou wilt be as unhappy as it now appears to thee. It is in this place that thou wilt receive the recompense which they had elsewhere unjustly denied thee. Let thy penetration assist thee to extricate me from the appearance which disguises me. Judge in seeing me if my company is compatible, and ought not to be preferred to a family unworthy of thee. Wish, and all thy desires shall be fulfilled. I love thee tenderly. Thou alone canst bestow happiness on me by being happy thyself. Never deny me this excelling all other women as far in the qualities of thy mind as thou excellence them in beauty we shall be perfectly happy together this charming apparition then kneeling at her feet made her the most flattering promises in the most tender language he pressed her in the warmest terms to consent to his happiness and assured her that she should be entirely her own mistress what can i do said she to him with eagerness follow the first impulse of gratitude said he judge not by thine eyes and above all abandon me not but release me from the terrible tournament which i endure after this first dream she fancied she was in a magnificent cabinet with a lady 
whose majestic mien and surprising beauty created in her heart a feeling of profound respect, this lady said to her in an affectionate tone, Charming beauty, regret not that thou hast left. A more illustrious fate awaits thee, and if thou wouldst deserve it, beware of allowing thyself be prejudiced by appearances. Her sleep lasted more than five hours, during which time she saw the young man in a hundred different places and under a hundred different circumstances. Sometimes he offered her a fine entertainment, sometimes he made the most tender protestations to her. How pleasant her sleep was! She would have wished to prolong it, but her eyes, open to the light, could not be induced to close again and beauty believed she had only had an agreeable dream. A clock struck twelve, repeating twelve times her own name, which obliged her to rise. She then saw a toilet table covered with everything necessary for a lady. After having dressed herself with a feeling of pleasure, of which she did not imagine the cause, she passed into the saloon where her dinner was served. When one eats alone, a repast is very soon over. On returning to her chamber, she threw herself on the sofa. The young man of whom she had dreamt again presented himself to her thoughts. I can make thy happiness. Where are his words? Probably this horrible beast, who appears to command all here, keeps him in prison. How can he be extricated? They repeated to me that I was not to be deceived by appearances. I understand nothing. <laughs> How foolish I am. I amuse myself by seeking for reasons to explain an illusion formed by sleep and which my awaking has destroyed. I ought not to pay attention to it. I must only occupy myself with my present fate and seek such amusements as will prevent my being overcome by melancholy. Shortly afterwards, she began to wander through the numerous apartments of the palace. She was enchanted with them, having never seen anything so beautiful. The first that she entered was a large cabinet of mirrors. She saw herself reflected in all sides. At length, a bracelet suspended to a girandole caught her sight. She found on it the portrait of the handsome cavalier, just as she had seen him in her sleep. How was it she recognized him immediately? His features were already too deeply impressed on her mind, and perhaps in her heart. With joyful haste, she placed the bracelet on her arm, without reflecting whether this action was correct. From this cabinet, having passed into a gallery full of pictures, she there found the same portrait, the size of life which appeared to regard her with such tender attention that she coloured as if this picture had been the person himself or that she had had witnesses of her thoughts continuing her walk she found herself in a saloon filled with different kinds of instruments knowing how to play on almost all she tried several preferring the harpsichord to the others because it was a better accompaniment for the voice from this saloon she entered another gallery corresponding to that in which were the paintings. It contained an immense library. She liked reading, and since her surgeon to the country she had been deprived of this pleasure. Her father, by the confusion of his affairs, had found himself obliged to sell his books. Her great taste for study could be easily satisfied in this place and would guarantee her against the dullness consequent on solitude the day passed before she could see everything at the approach of night all the apartments were illuminated by perfumed wax lights placed in lustrous either transparent or of different colors and not of crystal but made of diamonds and rubies at the usual hour beauty found her supper served with the same delicacy and neatness as before no human figure presented itself to her view. Her father had told her she would be alone. This solitude began no longer to trouble her when the beast made himself heard. Never having yet found herself alone with him, 
ignorant how this interview would pass off, fearing even that he only came to devour her, is it any wonder that she trembled? But on the arrival of the beast, whose approach was by no means furious, her fears were dissipated. This monster giant said roughly, Good evening, beauty. She returned his salutation in the same terms, with a calm air, but a little tremulously. Amongst the different questions which the monster put to her, he asked how she amused herself. Beauty replied, I have passed the day in expecting your palace, but it is so vast that I have not had time to see all the apartments and the beauties which it contains. The beast asked her, Do you think you can get accustomed to living here? The girl replied politely that she could live without trouble in so beautiful an abode. After an hour's conversation, Beauty discovered that the terrible tone of his voice was attributable only to the nature of the organ, and that the beast was more inclined to stupidity than to ferocity. At length, he asked her bluntly if she would marry him. At this unexpected demand, her fears were renewed, and uttering a terrible shriek, she could not help exclaiming, Oh, heavens, I'm lost. Not at all replied the beast quietly. But without frightening yourself, reply properly. Say precisely, yes or no. Beauty replied trembling. No, beast. Well, as you object, I will leave you, replied the docile monster. Good evening, beauty. Good evening, beast, said the frightened girl, with much satisfaction, extremely relieved, by finding that she had no violence to fear, she lay quietly down and went to sleep. Immediately, her dear unknown returned to her mind. He appeared to say to her tenderly, How overjoyed I am to see you once more, dear beauty. But what pain has your severity caused me? I know that I must expect to be unhappy for a long time. Her ideas again changed. The young man appeared to offer her a crown, and sleep presented him to her in a hundred different manners. Sometimes he seemed to be at her feet, sometimes abandoning himself to the most excessive delight, at others shedding a torrent of tears, which touched the depths of her soul. This mixture of joy and sadness lasted all the night, on waking Having her imagination full of this dear object, she thought for his portrait, to compare it once more with her recollections, and to see if she were not deceived. She ran to the picture gallery, where she recognized him still more perfectly. How long she was admiring him, but feeling ashamed of her weakness, she contented herself at length by looking at the miniature on her arm. At length, to put an end to these tender reflections, she descended into the garden, the fine weather seeming to invite her to a stroll. Her eyes were enchanted. They had never seen anything in nature so beautiful. The groves were ornamented with admirable statues and numberless fountains, which cooled the air and shot up to such a height that the eye could scarcely follow them. What surprised her the most was that she recognized the places wherein she had dreamt she had seen the unknown, especially at the sight of the Grand Canal, bordered with orange and myrtle trees. She could not but think of her vision, which appeared no longer a fiction. She thought to explain the mystery by imagining that the beast kept someone shut up in his palace. She resolved to be enlightened on the subject that same evening, and to question the monster, from whom she expected a visit at the usual hour. She walked for the rest of the day, as long as her strength permitted, without being able to see all. The apartments, which she had not been able to inspect the evening before, were no less worthy of her admiration than the others. Besides the instruments and the curiosities with which she was surrounded, 
she found in another cabinet plenty to occupy her. It was filled with purses and shuttles for knotting, scissors for cutting out, and fitted up for all sorts of ladies' work. In fact, everything was to be found there. In this gallery, care had been taken to place a cage filled with rare birds, all of which, on the arrival of Beauty, formed an admirable concert. They came also and preached on her shoulders, and these loving little creatures vied with each other as to which should nestle closest to her. Amiable prisoners, said she, I think you charming, and am vexed that you should be so far from my apartment. I should often like the pleasure of hearing you sing. What was her surprise, when, as she said these words, she opened a door and found herself in her own chamber, which she believed was very distant from this gallery, having only arrived in it after turning and threading a labyrinth of apartments which composed this pavilion. A panel, which had concealed from her the neighbourhood of the birds, opened into the gallery and was very convenient, as it completely shut out the noise of them when quiet was desirable. Beauty, continuing her route, perceived another feathered group. These were parrots of all kinds and of all colours. All at her approach began to chatter, and one said, Good day, to her. The other asked her for some breakfast. One more gallant begged a kiss. Several sang opera airs. Others exclaimed verses composed by the best authors, and all exerted themselves to entertain her. They were as gentle and as affectionate as the inhabitants of this aviary. Their presence was a real pleasure to her. She was delighted to find something she could talk with, for silence was not agreeable to her. She put several questions to some of them, who answered her like very intelligent creatures. She selected one from amongst them as the most amusing. The others, jealous of this preference, complained sadly. She consoled them by some caresses and the permission to pay her a visit whenever they pleased. Not far from this spot, she saw a numerous troop of monkeys of all size, great and small, supper Jews, some with human faces, others with beards, blue, green, black, and crimson. They advanced to meet her at the door of their apartment, which she had by chance arrived at. They made her low bows, accompanied by countless capers, and testified by action how highly sensible they were of the honour she had done them. To celebrate her visit, they danced upon the tight rope, and bounded about with the skill and agility beyond example. Beauty was much pleased with the monkeys, but she was disappointed at not finding anything which could enlighten her, respecting the handsome unknown. Losing all hope of doing so, and looking upon her dream as altogether an illusion, she did her best to drive the recollection of it from her mind. But her efforts were vain. She praised the monkeys, and caressing them, said she should like some of them to follow her and keep her company. Instantly, two tall young apes in court dresses, who appeared to have been only waiting for her orders, advanced and placed themselves with great gravity beside her. Two sprightly little monkeys took up her train as her pages. A facetious baboon, dressed as a Spanish gentleman of the chamber, presented his paw to her, very neatly gloved, and accompanied by this single cortege. Beauty proceeded to the supper table. During her meal, the smaller birds whistled in perfect tune, an accompaniment to the voices of the parrots, who sang the finest and most fashionable airs. During the concert, the monkeys, who had taken upon themselves the right of attending upon beauty, having in an instant settled their several ranks and duties, commenced their service and waited on her in full state, with all the attention and respect that officers of a royal household are accustomed to pay to queens. 
On rising from table, another troop proceeded to entertain her with a novel spectacle. They were a sort of company of actors who played a tragedy in the most extraordinary fashion. These Signor Monkeys and Signora Apes, in stage dresses covered with embroidery, pearls, and diamonds, executed all the actions suitable to the wares of their part, which were spoken with great distinctness and proper emphasis by the parrots, so cleverly, indeed, that it was necessary to be assured that these birds were concealed in the wig of one actor or under the mantle of another, not to believe that these new fashion tragedies were speaking themselves. The drama appeared to have been written expressly for the actors, and Beauty was enchanted. At the end of the tragedy, one of the performers advanced and paid Beauty a very well-turned compliment, and thanked her for the indulgence with which she had listened to them. All then departed, except the monkeys of her household, and those selected to keep her company. After supper, the beast paid her his usual visit, and after the same questions and the same answers, the conversation ended with, Good night, beauty. The lady apes of the bedchamber undressed their mistress, put her to bed, and took care to open the window of the aviary, that the birds, by warbling much softer than their songs by day, might induce slumber, and afford her the pleasure of again beholding her lover. Several days passed without her experiencing any feeling of dullness. Every moment brought with it fresh pleasures. The monkeys in three or four lessons succeeded, each one in teaching a parrot, who, acting as an interpreter, replied to Beauty's questions with as much promptitude and accuracy as the monkeys themselves had done by gestures. In fine, Beauty found nothing to complain of but the obligation of enduring every evening the presence of the beast. But his visits were short, and it was undoubtedly to him that she was in debt for the enjoyment of all imaginable amusements. The gentleness of the monster occasionally inspired Beauty with the idea of asking some explanation respecting the person she saw in her dreams, but sufficiently aware that he was in love with her, and fearing by such a questioning to awaken his jealousy, she had the prudence to remain silent, and did not venture to satisfy her curiosity. By degrees she had visited every apartment in this enchanted palace, but one willingly returns to the inspection of things which are rare, singular, and costly. Beauty turned her steps towards a great saloon, which she had only seen once before. This room had four windows in it. On each side, two only were open, and admitted a glimmering light. Beauty wished for more light, but in lieu of obtaining any by opening another window, she found it only looked into some enclosed space, which, although large, was obscure and her eyes could distinguish nothing but a distant gleam, which appeared to reach them through the medium of a very thick crape. Whilst pondering for what purpose this place could have been designed, she was suddenly dazzled by a brilliant illumination. The curtain rose and discovered to beauty a theatre, exceedingly well lighted. On the benches and in the boxes she beheld all that was most handsome and well made of either sex. A sweet symphony, which instantly commenced, terminated only to permit other actors than monkey and parrot performers to represent a very fine tragedy, which was followed by a little piece quite equal in its own style to that which had preceded it. Beauty was fond of plays. It was the only pleasure she had regretted when she left the city. Desiring to ascertain what sort of material the hangings of the box next to her were made of, she found herself prevented doing so by a gloss which separated them, and thereby discovered that what she had seen were not the actual objects, but a reflection of them by means of this crystal mirror, 
which thus conveyed to her sight all that was passing on the stage of the finest city in the world. It is a master stroke in optics to be able to reflect from such a distance. She remained in her box some time after the play was over, in order to see the fine company go out. The darkness that gradually ensued compelled her to think of other matters. Satisfied with this discovery, of which she promised to avail herself often, she descended into the gardens. Prodigies were becoming familiar to her. She rejoiced to find they were all performed for her advantage and amusement. After supper, the beast came, as usual, to ask her what she had been doing during the day. Beauty gave him an exact account of all her amusements, and told him she had been to the play. Do you like it? inquired the dull creature. Wish for whatever you please, you shall have it. You are very handsome. Beauty smiled to herself at the coarse manner in which he paid her compliments. But what she did not smile at was the usual question, and the words, Will you marry me? put an end to her good humour. She had only to answer, No. But, nevertheless, his docility during this last interview did not reassure her. Beauty was alarmed at it. What is to be the end of all this? She said to herself, The question he puts to me every time, Will I marry him? Proves that he persists in loving me. His bounty to me confirms it. But though he does not insist on my compliance, nor show any signs of resentment at my refusal, who will be answerable to me that he do not eventually lose his patience, and that my death will not be the consequence? These reflections rendered her so thoughtful it was almost daylight before she went to bed. The unknown, who but awaited that moment to appear, reproached her tenderly for her delay. He found her melancholy, lost in thought, and inquired what could have displeased her in such a place. She answered that nothing displeased her except the monster, whom she saw every evening. She should have become accustomed to him, but he was in love with her, and this love made her apprehensive of some violence. By the foolish compliments he pays me, said Beauty to her lover, I find he desires to marry me. Would you advise me to consent? Alas, were he as charming as he is frightful, you have rendered my heart inaccessible to him and to all others. And I do not blush to own that I can love no one but you. So sweet a confession could but flatter the unknown, yet he replied to her only by saying, Love him who loves you. Do not be misled by appearances, and release me from prison. These words, continually repeated without any explanation, caused Beauty infinite distress. What would you that I should do? said she to him. I would restore you to liberty at any price. But my desire is vain, while you abstain from furnishing me with the means to put it in practice. The unknown made her some answer, but of so confused a nature that she could not comprehend it. A thousand extravagant fancies passed before her eyes. She saw the monster on a throne all blazing with jewels. He called to her and invited her to sit beside him. A moment afterwards, the unknown compelled him precipitately to descend and seated himself in his place. The beast, regaining the advantage, the unknown disappeared in his turn. He spoke to her behind a black veil which changed his voice and rendered it horrible. All her sleep passed in this manner, and yet, notwithstanding the agitation it caused her, she felt it was too soon over, as her awakening deprived her of the sight of the object of her affections. After she had finished dressing, various sorts of work, books, and animals occupied her attention until the hour when the play began. She arrived just in time, but she was not at the same theatre. It was the opera, and the performance commenced as soon as she was seated. The spectacle was magnificent, and the spectators were not less so. 
The mirrors represented to her distinctly the most minute details of the dresses even of the people in the pit. Delighted to behold human forms and faces, many of which she recognized as those of persons she knew, it would have been a still greater pleasure to her could she have spoken to them so that they could have heard her. More gratified with this day's entertainment than with that of the preceding, the rest of it passed in the same way that each had done since she had been in that palace. The beast came in the evening, and after his visit she retired as usual. The night resembled former nights, that is, it was passed in agreeable dreams. When she awoke, she found the same number of domestics to wait upon her, but after dinner her occupations were different. The day before, on opening another of the windows, she had found herself at the opera. To diversify her amusements, she opened a third window, which displayed to her all the pleasures of the fair of Saint-Germain, much more brilliant than that it is at the present day. But as the hour had not quite arrived when the best company resorted to it, she had leisure to observe and examine everything. She saw the rarest curiosities, the most extraordinary productions of nature and works of art. The minutest trifles were visible to her. The puppet show was not unworthy of her attention. Whilst waiting for more refined entertainments, the comic opera was in its splendor. Beauty was very much delighted. At the termination of the performances, she saw all the well-dressed people visiting the tradesmen's shops. She recognized amongst the crowd several professional gamesters who flocked to this place as their workshop. She observed persons who, having lost their money by the cleverness of those they played with, went out with less joyous countenance than they exhibited as they entered. The prudent gamblers who did not stake their whole fortunes on the hazard of a card, who played to profit by their skill, could not conceal from beauty their sleight of hand. She longed to warn the victims of the tricks they were plundered by, but at a distance from them of more than a thousand leagues, it was not in her power to do so. She heard and saw everything distinctly, without its being possible for her to make herself heard or seen by others. The reflections and echoes which conveyed to her all these sights and sounds had no returning power place her above the air and wind. Everything came to her like a thought. The consideration of this fact deterred her from making vain attempts. It was past midnight before she thought it was time to retire. The need of some refreshment might have hinted to her the lateness of the hour, but she had found in her box liqueurs and baskets filled with everything requisite for a collation. Her supper was light and of short duration. She was in a hurry to go to bed. The beast observed her impatience and came merely to say good night, that she might have more time to sleep and unknown liberty to reappear. The following days resembled each other. She found in her windows an inexhaustible source of fresh entertainments. The first of the other three afforded her the pleasure of witnessing Italian comedy. The second, a sight of the Tuileries the resort of all the most distinguished and handsome of both sexes. The last window was very far from being the least agreeable. It enabled her to see everything of consequence that was going on in the world. The scene was amusing and interesting in all sorts of ways. Sometimes it was the reception of a grand embassy, at others the marriage of some illustrious personages, and occasionally some exciting revolutions. She was at this window during the last revolt of the Janissaries, and witnessed the whole of it to the very end. At all times, she was certain to find something here to entertain her. The weariness she had felt at first in listening to the beast had entirely departed. Her eyes had become accustomed to his ugliness. She was prepared for his foolish questions, and if their conversations had lasted longer, Perchance she would have not been displeased, but four or five sentences, always the same, uttered in a coarse manner, and productive only of yes or no, were not much to her taste. 
At the slightest desires of Beauty appeared to be anticipated. She bestowed more care upon her toilet, although certain that no one could see her. But she owned this attention to herself, and it was a pleasure to her to dress herself in the habits of all the various nations on the face of the earth. She could do this the more easily, as her wardrobe furnished her with everything she chose, and presented her every day with some novelty. Contemplating her mirror in these various dresses, it revealed to her that she was to be admired in all lands, and her attendant animals, each according to their talent, repeated to her unceasingly the same fact. The monkeys by their actions, the parrots by their language, and the other birds by their songs. End of section 20、section、21、of four and twenty fairy tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Beauty and the Beast by Madame de Villeneuve. Translated by James b l o c h i n g Part Three. So delightful a life ought to have perfectly contented her, but we weary of everything. The greatest happiness fades when it is continual, derived always from the same source, and we find ourselves exempted from fear and from hope. Beauty had experienced this. The remembrance of her family aroused to trouble her. In the midst of her prosperity, her happiness could not be perfect as long as she was denied the pleasure of informing her relations of it. As she had become more familiar with the beast, either from the habit of seeing him or from the gentleness which she had discovered in his nature, she thought she might venture to ask him a question. She did not take this liberty, however, until she had obtained from him a promise. That he would not be angry. The question she put to him was Were they the only two persons in that castle? Yes, I protest to you, replied the beast in a rather excited tone, and I assure you that you and I, the monkeys and the other animals, are the only breathing creatures in this place. The beast said no more and departed more abruptly than usual. Beauty had asked this question only with a view of ascertaining whether her lover was not confined in the palace. She would have wished to see and speak with him. It was a happiness she would have purchased at the price of her own liberty and of all the pleasures by which she was surrounded. That charming youth, existing only in her imagination, she now looked upon this palace as a prison which would be. One day her tomb. These melancholy ideas crowded also upon her mind at night. She dreamed she was on the banks of a great canal. She was weeping when her dear unknown, alarmed at her sad state, said to her, pressing her hand tenderly between his own, What is the matter, my beloved beauty? Who can have offended you? And what can possibly have disturbed your tranquillity? By the love I bear you, I conjure you to explain the cause of your distress. Nothing shall be refused to you. You are sole sovereign here. Everything is at your command. Whence arises the sorrow that overpowers you? Is it the sight of the beast that afflicts you? You must be relieved from it. At these words, Beauty imagined she saw the unknown draw a dagger and prepare to plunge it in the throat of the monster. Who made no attempt to defend himself, but on the contrary offered his neck to the blow with a submission and a calmness which caused the beautiful dreamer to fear the unknown would accomplish his purpose before she could endeavour to prevent him. Notwithstanding, she had instantly risen to protect the beast. The instant she saw her efforts likely to be anticipated, she exclaimed with all her might, Hold, barbarian! Harm not my benefactor, or else kill me! The unknown, who continued striking at the beast, notwithstanding the shrieks of beauty, said to her angrily, You love me then no longer, since you take the part of this monster, who is an obstacle to my happiness. 
You are ungrateful, she replied, still struggling with him. I love you more than my life, and I would lose it sooner than cease to love you. You are all the world to me, and I would not do you the injustice to compare you with any other treasures it possesses. I would, without a sigh, abandon all it could offer me to follow you into the wildest desert. But this tender affection does not stifle my gratitude. I owe everything to the beast. He anticipates all my wishes. It is to him I am in debt for the joy of knowing you, and I would die sooner than endure seeing you do him the slightest injury. After several similar struggles, the objects vanished, and Beauty fancied she saw the lady who had appeared to her some nights before, and who said to her, Courage, Beauty, be a model of female generosity. Show thyself to be as wise as thou art charming. Do not hesitate to sacrifice thy inclination to thy duty. Thou takest a true path to happiness. Thou wilt be blessed, provided thou art not misled by deceitful appearances. When Beauty awoke, she pondered on this mysterious vision, but still remained an enigma to her. Her desire to see her father superseded during the day. The anxiety caused by these dreams of the monster and the unknown thus neither tranquil at night not content by day although surrounded by the greatest luxuries the only distraction she could find was in the theatre she went to the italians but after the first scene she quitted that performance for the opera which she left almost as quickly her melancholy followed her everywhere she frequently opened each of the six windows as many times without finding one minute's respite from her cares days and nights of equal and unceasing agitation began seriously to affect her appearance and her health she took great pains to conceal from the beast the sorrow which preyed upon her and the monster who had frequently surprised her with the tears in her eyes upon hearing her say that she was only suffering from a headache pressed his inquiries no further one evening however her sobs having betrayed her and feeling it impossible longer to dissimulate, she acknowledged to the beast, who begged to know what had caused her affliction, that she was yearning to see her family. At this declaration, the beast sank down without power to sustain himself, and heaving a deep sigh, or rather uttering a howl, that might have frightened anyone to death, he replied, Ah, oh, how beauty! would you then abandon an unfortunate beast could i have imagined you possessed so little gratitude what have i left undone to make you happy should not the attentions i have paid you preserve me from your hatred unjust as you are you prefer the house of your father and the jealousy of your sisters to my palace and my affections you would rather tend the flocks with them than enjoy with me all the pleasures of existence it is not love for your family, but antipathy to me, that makes you anxious to depart. No, beast, replied Beauty, timidly and soothingly. I do not hate you, and should regret to lose the hope of seeing you again. But I cannot overcome the desire I feel to embrace my relations. Permit me to go away for two months, and I will promise you that I will return with pleasure to pass the rest of my days with you and never ask you another favour while she spoke the beast stretched on the ground his head thrown back only events that he still breathed by his sorrowful sighs he answered her in these words i can refuse you nothing but it will perhaps cost me my life no matter in the cabinet nearest to your apartment you will find four chests fill them with anything you like for yourself or for your family if you break your word you repent it and regret the death of your poor beast when it will be too late return at the end of two months and you will still see me alive for your journey back to me you will need no equipage merely take leave of your family the previous night before you retire to rest and when you are in bed turn your ring the stone inside your hand and say with a firm voice i desire to return to my palace and behold my beast again good night fear nothing sleep in peace you will see your father 
early to morrow morning. Adieu, Beauty. As soon as she was alone, she hastened to fill the chest with all the treasures and beautiful things imaginable. They only appeared to be full when she was tired of putting things into them. After these preparations, she went to bed. The thoughts of seeing her family so soon kept her awake great part of the night, and sleep only stole upon her towards the hour when she should have been stirring. She saw in her dreams her amiable unknown, but not as formerly stretched upon a bed of turf. He appeared a prey to the keenest sorrow. Beauty, touched at seeing him in such a state, flattered herself she could elevate his profound affliction by requesting to know the cause of it. But her lover, casting on her a look full of despair, said, Can you ask me such a question, inhuman girl? Are you not aware that your departure dooms me to death? Abandon not yourself to sorrow, dear unknown, replied she. My absence will be brief. I wish but to undeceive my family, respecting the cruel fate they imagined has befallen me. I return immediately afterwards to this palace. I shall leave you no more. Ah, oh, could I abandon a residence in which I so delight? Besides, I have pledged my word to the beast that I will return. I cannot fail to keep it. And why must this journey separate us? Be my escort. I will defer my departure another day in order to obtain the beast's permission. I am sure he will not refuse me. Agree to my proposal, and we shall not part. We will return together. My family will be delighted to see you, and I will answer for their showing you all the attention you deserve. I cannot accede to your wishes, replied the unknown, unless you determine never to return hither. It is the only means of enabling me to quit this spot how will you decide the inhabitants of this palace have no power to compel you to return nothing can happen to you beyond the knowledge that you have grieved the beast you do not consider rejoined beauty quickly that he assured me he should die if i broke my word to him what matters it to you retorted the lover is it to be counted a misfortune that your happiness should cost only the life of a monster? Of what use is he to the world? Will anyone be a loser by the destruction of a being who appears upon earth only to be the horror of all nature? Ha! Huh! exclaimed Beauty, almost angrily. Now that I would lay down my life to save his, and that this monster who is only one in form has a heart so humane, that he should not be prosecuted for a deformity which he refrains from rendering more hideous by his actions. I will not repay his kindness with such black ingratitude. The unknown, interrupting her, inquired what she would do if the monster endeavoured to kill him, if it were decreed that one of them must slay the other, to which would she afford assistance? I love you only, she replied, but extreme as is my affection for you, it cannot weaken my gratitude to the beast, and if I found myself placed in so fatal a position, I would escape the misery which the result of such a compact would inflict on me by dying by my own hand. But why indulge in such dreadful suppositions? However chimerical the idea freezes my blood, let us change the conversation. She set him the example by saying all that an affectionate girl could say most flattering to her lover. She was not restrained by the rigid customs of society, and slumber left her free to act naturally. She acknowledged to him her love with a frankness which she would have shrunk from, when in full possession of her reason. Her sleep was of a long duration, and when she awoke, she feared the beast had failed in his promise to her. She was in this uncertainty when she heard the sound of a human voice, which she recognized, undrawing her curtains precipitately. What was her surprise when she found herself in a strange apartment, the furniture of which was not near so superb as that in the palace of the beast? This prodigy induced her to rise hastily and open the door of her chamber, 
The next room was equally strange to her, but what astonished her still more was to find in it the four chests she had filled the previous evening. The transport of herself and her treasures was a proof of the power and the bounty of the beast, but where was she? She could not imagine when at length she heard the voice of her father, and rushing out, she flung her arms round his neck. Her appearance astounded her brothers and sisters. They stared at her as at one come from the other world. All her family embraced her with the greatest demonstrations of delight. But her sisters, in their hearts, were vexed at beholding her. Their jealousy was not extinguished. After many caresses on both sides, the good man desired to speak with her privately, to learn from her own lips all the circumstances of so extraordinary a journey, and to inform her of the state of his own fortune, of which he had set apart a large share for herself. He told her that on the evening of the same day that he had left the palace of the beast, he had reached his own house without the least fatigue, that on the road he had cogitated how he could best manage to conceal his trunks from the sight of his children, and wished that they could be carried without their knowledge into a little cabinet adjoining his bedchamber, of which he alone had the key, that he had looked upon this as an impossibility, but that on dismounting at his door he found the horse of which his trunks had been placed had run away, and therefore saw himself suddenly spared the trouble of hiding his treasures. I assure thee, said the old man to his daughter, that the loss of these riches did not distress me. I had not possessed them long enough to regret them greatly, but the adventure appeared to me a gloomy prognostic of my fate. I did not hesitate to believe that the perfidious beast would act in the same manner by thee. I feared that the favours he conferred upon thee would not be more durable. This idea caused me great anxiety. To conceal it, I feigned to be in need of rest. It was only to abandon myself without restraint to my grief. I looked upon thy destruction as certain, but my sorrow was soon dispiated. The sight of the trunks I thought had lost renewed my hopes of thy happiness. I found them placed in my little cabinet, precisely where I had wished them to be. The keys of them, which I had forgotten and left behind me on the table in the saloon, wherein we had passed the night, were in the locks. These circumstances, which afforded me a new proof of the kindness of the beast, and his constant attention overwhelmed me with joy. It was then that, no longer doubting the advantageous result of thy adventure, I reproach myself for entertaining such unjust suspicious of the honour of the generous monster, and craved his pardon a hundred times for the abuse which in my distress I had mentally lavished upon him. Without informing my children of the extent of my wealth, I contented myself with disputing amongst them the presents thou hast sent them, and showing them some jewels of moderate value. I afterwards pretended to have sold them, and have employed the money in various ways for the improvement of our income. I have bought this house, I have slaves, who relieve us from the labours of which necessity had subjected us. My children lead an easy life, that is all I care for. Ostentation and luxury drew upon me, in other days, the hatred of the envious. I should incur it again did I live in the style of a very wealthy man. Many offers have been made to thy sister's beauty. I am about to marry them off immediately, and thy fortunate arrival decides me. Having given to them such portions of the wealth thou hast brought to me, as thou shalt think fit, and relieved of all care for their establishment, we will live, my daughter, with thy brothers, whom thy presence were not able to console for thy loss, or if thou preferred, we too will live together independently of them. Beauty, affected by the kindness of her father and the assurance he gave her of the love of her brothers, thanked him tenderly for all his offers, and thought it would be wrong to conceal from him the fact that she had not come to stay with him. The good man, distressed to learn that he should not have the support of his child in his declining years, 
did not, however, attempt to dissuade her from the fulfilment of a duty which she acknowledged indispensable. Beauty, in her turn, related to him all that had happened to her since they parted. She described to him the pleasant life she led. The good man, enraptured at the charming account of his daughter's adventures, heaped blessing on the head of the beast. His delight was much greater still when Beauty, opening the chest, displayed to him the immense treasures they contained and satisfied him that he was at liberty to dispose of those which he had brought himself in favour of his daughters, and he would possess in these last proofs of the beast's generosity ample means to live merrily with his sons discovering in this monster too noble a mind to be lodged in so hideous a body he deemed it his duty to advise his daughter to marry him notwithstanding his ugliness he employed even the strongest arguments to induce her to take that step thou shouldst not take counsel from thine eyes alone said he to her thou hast been unceasingly exhorted to let thyself be guided by gratitude by following her in inspirations thou art assured thou wilt be happy it is true these warnings are only given thee in dreams but these dreams are too significant and too frequent to be attributed to chance they promise thee great advantages enough to conquer thy repugnance therefore the next time that the beast ask thee if thou wilt marry him i advise thee not to refuse him thou hast admitted to me that he loves thee tenderly take the proper means to make thy union with him indissoluble it is much better to have an amiable husband than one whose only recommendation is a handsome person how many girls are compelled to marry rich brutes much more brutish than the beast who is only one in form and not in his feelings or his actions beauty admitted the reason of all these arguments but to resolve to marry a monster so horrible in person and who seemed as stupid as he was gigantic appeared to her an impossibility how can i determine replied she to her father to take a husband with whom i can have no sympathy and whose hideousness is not compensated by the charms of his conversation no other object to distract my attention and relieve that wearisome companionship not to have the pleasure of being sometimes absent from him to hear nothing beyond five or six questions respecting my health or my appetite followed by a good night beauty chorus which my parrots know by heart i repeat a hundred times a day it is not in my power to endure such a union and i would rather perish at once than by dying every day of fright sorrow disgust and weariness there is nothing to plead in his favour except the consideration he evinces in paying me very short visits and presenting himself before me but once in four-and-twenty hours is that enough to inspire one with affection the father admitted that his daughter had reason on her side but observing so much civility in the beast he could not believe him to be as stupid as she represented him the order the abundance the good taste was so discernible through his palace were not according to his thinking the work of a fool in fact he found him worthy of the consideration of his daughter and beauty might have felt more inclined to listen to the monster had not her nocturnal lover's appearance thrown an obstacle in the way the comparison she drew between these two admirers could not be favourable to the beast the old man himself was fully aware of the great distinction which must be made between them notwithstanding he tried by all manners of means to overcome her repugnance he recalled to her the advice of the lady who had warned her not to be prejudiced by appearances and whose language seemed to imply that this youth would only make her miserable it is easier to reason with love than to conquer it beauty had not the power to yield to the reiterated request of her father he left her without having been able to persuade her night already far advanced invited her to repose and the daughter although delighted to see her father once more was not sorry that he left her at liberty to retire to rest 
She was glad to be alone. Her heavy eyelids inspired her with the hope that in slumber she would soon again behold her beloved unknown. She was eager to enjoy this innocent pleasure. A quickened pulsation evinced the joy with which her gentle heart would greet that pleasant vision. But her excited imagination, while representing to her the scenes in which she had usually held sweet converse with that dear unknown, had not sufficient power to conjure up his form to her as she so utterly desired. She awoke several times, but on falling asleep again no cupids fluttered round her couch. In a word, instead of a night full of sweet thoughts and innocent pleasures, which she had counted on passing in the arms of sleep, it was to her one of the interminable length and endless anxiety. She had never known any like it in the palace of the beast, and the day which she at last saw break with a mingled feeling of satisfaction and impatience came opportunity to relieve her from this weariness. Her father, enriched by the liberality of the beast, had quitted his country house, and in order to facilitate the establishment of his daughters, resided in a very large city, where his new fortune obtained for him new friends, or rather new acquaintances. Amidst the circle who visited him, the tidings soon spread that his youngest daughter had returned. Everybody evinced an equal impatience to see her and were each as much charmed with her intellect as with her beauty. The peaceful days she had passed in her deserved palace, the innocent pleasures which a gentle slumber had invariably procured her the thousand amusements which succeeded so that dullness could never take possession of her spirit. In brief, all the attentions of the monster had combined to render her still more beautiful and more charming than she was when her father first parted from her. She was the admiration of all who saw her. The suitors of her sisters, without condescending to excuse their infidelity, by the slightest pretext fell in love with her, and, attracted by the power of her charms, deserted without a blush their former mistresses. Insensible to the marked attentions of a crowd of adorers, she neglected nothing that could discourage them and induce them to return to the previous objects of their affection. But notwithstanding all her care, she could not escape the jealousy of her sisters. The inconstant lovers, far from concealing their new passion, invented every day some fresh entertainment with the view of paying their court to her. They entreated her even to bestow the prize in the games which took place in her honour. But Beauty, who could not be blind to the mortification she was causing her sisters, and yet was unwilling to refuse utterly the favour they implored so ardently and in so flattering a manner, found means to satisfy them all by declaring that she would alternately with her sisters present the prize to the victor. What she selected was a flower or some equally simple guerdon. She left to her elder sisters the honour of giving, in their turn, jewels, crowns of diamonds, costly weapons, or superb bracelets, presents which her liberal hands supplied them with, but for which she would not take the slightest credit. The treasures lavished on her by the monster left her in want of nothing. She divided between her sisters everything she had brought that was most rare and elegant bestowing nothing but trifles herself and leaving them the pleasure of giving largely she counted on securing for them the love as well as the gratitude of the useful competence but these lovers thought only to gain her heart and the simplest gift from her hand was more precious to them than all the treasures that were prodigally heaped upon them by the others the amusements she partook of amongst her family thought vastly inferior to those she enjoyed in the palace of the beast, entertained her sufficiently to prevent the time hanging heavenly on her hands. At the same time, neither the gratification of seeing her father, whom she tenderly loved, nor the pleasure of being with her brothers, who in a hundred ways studied to prove to her the extent of their affection, nor the delight of conversing with her sisters, of whom she was very fond, though they were not so of her, 
could prevent her regretting her agreeable dreams. Her unknown, greatly to her sorrow, came not, when she slumbered under her father's roof, to address her in the tenderest language, and the court paid to her by those who had been the admirers of her sisters, did not compensate for the loss of that pleasing illusion. Had she ever been of a nature to feel flattered by such conquest, she would still have distinguished an immense difference between their attentions or those of the beast and the devotion of her charming unknown. Their assiduities were received by her with the greatest indifference, but beauty perceiving that, notwithstanding her coolness, they were obstinately bent on rivalling each other in the task of proving to her the intensity of their passion, thought it her duty to make them clearly understand they were losing their time. The first she endeavoured to undeceive was one who had courted her eldest sister. She told him that she had only returned for the purpose of being present at the marriage of her sisters, particularly that of the eldest sister, and that she was about to press her father to settle it immediately. Beauty found that she had to deal with a man who saw no longer any charms in her sister. He sighed alone for her, and coldness sustain the threat to depart before the expiration of the two months nothing in short could discourage him much vexed at having failed in her object she held a similar conversation with the others whom she had the mortification to find equally infatuated to complete her distress her unjust sisters who looked upon her as a rival conceived a hatred to her which they could not dissemble and whilst beauty was deploring the too great power of her charms she had the misery of learning that her new adorers believing each to be the cause of the other's rejection were bent in the maddest way in fighting it out amongst themselves all these annoyances induced her to determine upon returning sooner than she had contemplated her father and brothers did all they could to detain her but the slave of her word and firm in resolution neither the tears of one nor the prayers of the others could prevail upon her all that she could exhort from her was that she would defer her departure as long as she could the two months had nearly expired and every morning she determined to bid adieu to her family without having the heart when night arrived to say farewell in the compact between her affection and her gratitude she could not lean to the one without doing injustice to the other in the midst of her embarrassment it needed nothing less than a dream to decide her she fancied she was at the palace of the beast and walking in a retired avenue terminated by the thicket full of brambles concealing the entrance to a cavern out of which issued horrible groans she recognized the voice of the beast and ran to his assistance the monster who in her dream appeared stretched upon the ground and dying reproached her with being the cause of his death and having repaid his affection with the blackest ingratitude she then saw the lady who had before appeared to her in her sleep and who said in her in a severe tone that it would be her destruction if she hesitated any longer to fulfil her engagements that she had given her word to the beast that she would return in two months that the time had expired that the delay of another day would be fatal to the beast that the trouble she was creating in her father's house and the hatred of her sisters ought to increase her desire to return to the palace of the beast where everything combined to delight her beauty terrified by this dream and fearing to be the cause of the death of the beast awoke with a start and went immediately to inform her family that she could no longer delay her departure this intelligence produced various effects her father's tears spoke for him her brothers protested that they would not allow her to leave them and her lovers in despair swore they would not suffer the house to be robbed of its brightest ornaments her sisters alone far from appearing distressed at her departure were loud in praise of her sense of honour and affecting to possess the same virtue themselves had the audacity to assure her that if they had pledged their words to the beast as she had done they should not have suffered his ugliness to have interfered with their feelings of duty 
and that they should have long ere that time been to their road back to the marvellous palace. It was thus they endeavoured to disguise the cruel jealousy that rankled in their hearts. Beauty, however, charmed by their apparent generosity, thought only of convincing her brothers and her lovers of the obligation she was under to leave them, but her brothers loved her too much to consent to her going, and her lovers were too infatuated to listen to reason, all of them being ignorant of the mode in which Beauty had arrived at her father's house, and never doubting but that the horse which first conveyed her to the palace of the beast would be sent to take her back again, resolved amongst themselves to prevent it. Her sisters, who only concealed their delight by the affection of a sentiment of horror, as they perceived the hour approach of Beauty's departure, were frightened to death, lest anything should occur to delay her, but Beauty, firm in her resolution, knowing whether Duty called her and having no more time to lose, if she would prolong the existence of the beast, her benefactor, at nightfall, took leave of her family and of all those who were interested in her destiny she assured them that whatever steps they took to prevent her departure she should nevertheless be in the palace of the beast the next morning before they were stirring that all their schemes would be fruitless and that she had determined to return to the enchanted palace she did not forget on going to bed to turn her ring she slept very soundly and did not awake until the clock in her chamber, striking noon, chimed her name to music. By that sound she knew that her wishes were accomplished as soon as she evinced a disposition to rise. Her couch was surrounded by all the animals who had been so eager to serve her, and who unanimously testified their gratification at her return and expressed the sorrow they had felt at her long absence. End of section 21by Madame de Villeneuve, translated by James Blanche, part four. The day seemed to her longer than any she had previously passed in that palace, not so much from regret for those she had quitted as from her impatience again to behold the beast, and to say everything she could to him in the way of excuse for her conduct. She was also animated by another desire that of again holding in slumber one of those sweet conversations with her dear unknown a pleasure she had been deprived of during the two months she had passed with her family and which she could not enjoy anywhere but in that palace the beast and the unknown were in short alternately the subjects of her reflections one moment she reproached herself for not returning the affection of a lover who under the form of a monster displayed so noble a mind the next she deplored having set her heart upon a visionary object who had no existence except in her dreams she began to doubt whether she ought to prefer the imaginary devotion of a phantom to the real affection of the beast the very dream in which the unknown appeared to her was invariably accompanied by warnings not to trust to sight she feared it was but an idle illusion born of the vapours of the brain and destroyed by light of day thus undecided loving the unknown yet not wishing to displease the beast and seeking repose from her thoughts in some entertainment she went to the french comedy which she found exceedingly poor. Shutting the window abruptly, she hoped to be better pleased at the opera. She thought the music miserable. The Italians were equally unable to amuse her. Their comedy appeared to her to want smartness, wit, and action. Weariness and distaste accompanied her everywhere and prevented her taking pleasure in anything.
The gardens had no attractions for her. Her court endeavoured to entertain her, but the monkeys lost their labour in frisking, and the parrots and the other birds in chattering and singing. She was impatient for the visit of the beast, the noise of whose approach she expected to hear every instant, but the hour so much desired came without the appearance of the monster. Alarmed and almost angry at his delay, she tried in vain to account for his absence. Divided through hope and fear, her mind agitated, her heart a prey to melancholy, she descended into the gardens, determined not to re-enter the palace till she had found the beast. No trace of him could she discover anywhere. She called him. Echo alone answered her. Having passed more than three hours in this disagreeable exercise, overcome by fatigue, she sank upon a garden seat. She imagined the beast was either dead or had abandoned the place. She saw herself alone in that palace, without the hope of ever leaving it. She regretted her conversations with the beast, unentertaining as they had been to her, and what appeared to her extraordinary even to discover she had so much feeling for him. She blamed herself for not having married him, and considering she had been the cause of his death, for she feared her too long absence had occasioned it, heaped upon herself the keenest and most bitter reproaches. In the midst of her miserable reflections, she perceived that she was seated in that very avenue in which, during the last night, she had passed under her father's roof. She had dreamed she saw the beast expiring in some strange cavern, convinced that chance had not conducted her to this spot. She rose and hurried towards the thicket, which she found was not impenetrable. She discovered another hollow, which appeared to be that she had seen in her dream. As the moon gave but a feeble light, the monkey pages immediately appeared with a sufficient number of torches to illuminate the chasm, and to reveal to her the beast stretched upon the earth, as she thought asleep, far from being alarmed at his sight. Beauty was delighted, and approaching him boldly, placed her hand upon his head, and called to him several times. But finding him cold and motionless, she no longer doubted he was dead, and consequently gave utterance to the most mournful shrieks and the most affecting exclamations. The assurance of his death, however, did not prevent her from making every effort to recall him to life. On placing her hand on his heart, she felt to her great joy that it still beat. Without further delay, Beauty ran out of the cave to the basin of a fountain, where taking up some water in her joined hands, she hastened back with it and sprinkled it upon him. But as she could bring very little at a time and split some of it before she could return to the beast, her assistance had been but meagre if the monkey courtiers had not flown to the palace and returned with such speed that in a moment she was furnished with a vase for water as well as with proper restoratives she caused him to smell them and swallow them and they produced so excellent an effect that he soon began to move and show some kind of consciousness she cheered him with her voice and caressed him as he recovered what anxiety have you caused me said she to him kindly I knew not how much I loved you. The fear of losing you has proved to me that I was attached to you by stronger ties than those of gratitude. I vowed to you that I had determined to die if I had failed in restoring you to life. At these tender words, the beast, feeling perfectly revived, replied in a voice which was still feeble, It is very kind of you, Beauty, to love so ugly a monster, but you do well. I love you better than my life. I thought you would never return. It would have killed me. Since you love me, I will live. Retire to rest, and assure yourself that you will be as happy as your good heart renders you worthy to be. Beauty had never before heard so long a speech from the beast. It was not very eloquent, but it pleased for its gentleness and sincerity observable in it. She had expected to be scolded, or at least to have been reproached. 
she had from this moment a better opinion of his disposition. No longer thinking him so stupid, she even considered his short answers a proof of his prudence, and more and more prepossessed in his favour, she retired to her apartment, her mind occupied with the most flattering ideas. Extremely fatigued, she found there all the refreshments she needed. Her heavy eyelids promised her a sweet slumber, asleep almost as soon as her head was on her pillow. Her dear unknown failed not to present himself immediately. What tender words did he not utter to express the pleasure he experienced at seeing her again? He assured her that she would be happy, that it only remained to her to follow the impulse of her good heart. Beauty asked him if her happiness was to arise from her marriage with the beast. The unknown replied that it was the only means of securing it. She felt somewhat annoyed at this. She thought it even extraordinary that her lover should advise her to make her rival happy. After this first dream, she thought she saw the beast dead at her feet. An instant afterwards, the unknown reappeared and disappeared again as instantly to give place to the beast. But what she observed most distinctly was the lady who seemed to say to her, I am pleased with thee. Continue to follow the dictates of reason and trouble thyself about naught. I undertake the task of rendering thee happy. Beauty, although asleep, appeared to acknowledge her partiality to the unknown and her repugnance to the monster, whom she could not consider lovable. The lady smiled at her objections and advised her not to make herself uneasy about her affection for the unknown, for that the emotions she felt were not incompatible with the resolution she had formed to do her duty, that she might follow her inclination without resistance and that her happiness would be perfected by espousing the beast. This dream, which only ended with her sleep, furnished her with an inexhaustible source of reflection. In this vision, as in those which had preceded it, she found more coherence than is usually displayed in dreams, and she therefore determined to consent to this strange union. But the image of the unknown rose unceasingly to trouble her, it was the sole obstacle, but not a slight one. Still uncertain as to the course she ought to take, she went to the opera, but without terminating her embarrassment, at the end of the performance, she sat down to supper. The arrival of the beast was alone capable of deciding her. Far from reproaching her for her long absence, the monster, as if the pleasure of seeing her, had made him forget his past distresses appeared on entering beauty's apartment to have no other anxiety but that of ascertaining if she had been much amused if she had been well received and if her health had been good she answered these questions and added politely that she had paid dearly for all the pleasures his care had enabled her to enjoy by the cruel pain she had endured on finding him in so sad a state on her return the beast briefly thanked her, and then, being about to take his leave, asked her, as usual, if she would marry him. Beauty was silent for a short time, but at last, making up her mind, she said to him, trembling, Yes, beast, I am willing, if you will pledge me your faith, to give you mine. I do, replied the beast and I promise you never to have any wife but you. Then, rejoined Beauty, I accept you for my husband, and swear to be a fond and faithful wife to you. She had scarcely uttered these words, when a discharge of artillery was heard, and that she might not doubt it being a signal of rejoicing. She saw from her windows the sky all in a blaze with the light of twenty thousand fireworks, which continued rising for three hours. They formed true lovers' knots, while on elegant escutcheons appeared beauty's initials, and beneath them, in well-defined letters, Long live beauty and her husband.
After this display had terminated, the Beast took his departure, and Beauty retired to rest. No sooner was she asleep than her dear unknown paid her his usual visit. He was more richly attired than she had ever seen him. How deeply I am obliged to you, charming Beauty, said he. You have released me from the frightful prison in which I have groaned for so long a time. Your marriage with the Beast will restore a king to his subjects, a son to his mother, and life to a whole kingdom. We shall all be happy. Beauty, at these words, felt bitterly annoyed, perceiving that the unknown, far from evincing the despair such an engagement as she had entered into, should have caused him, gazed on her with eyes sparkling with extreme delight. She was about to express her discontent to him, when the lady in her turn appeared in her dream. Behold thee victorious, said she. We owe everything to thee, beauty. Thou hast suffered gratitude to triumph over every other feeling. None but thou would have had the courage to keep their word at the expense of their inclination, nor to have periled their life to have saved that of their father. In return for this, there are none who can ever hope to enjoy such happiness as thy virtue has won for thee. Thou knowest at present little, but the rising sun shall tell thee more. When the lady had disappeared, Beauty again saw the unknown youth, but stretched on the earth as dead. All the night passed in such dreams, but they had become familiar to her and did not prevent her from sleeping long and soundly. It was broad daylight when she awoke. The sun streamed into her apartment with more brilliancy than usual. Her monkeys had not closed the shutters, believing the sight that met her eyes but a continuation of her dreams, and that she was sleeping still. Her joy and surprise were extreme at discovering that it was a reality, and that on a couch beside her lay in a profound slumber her beloved unknown, looking a thousand times more handsome than he had done in her vision. To assure herself of the fact, she arose hastily and took from off her toilet table the miniature she usually wore on her arms, but she could not have been mistaken. She spoke to him in the hope of awaking him from the trance into which he seemed to have been thrown by some wonderful power. Not staring at her voice, she shook him by the arm. This effort was equally ineffectual and only served to convince her that he was under the influence of enchantment and that she must await the end of the charm, which it was reasonable to suppose had an appointed period. How delighted was she to find herself betrothed to him who alone had caused her to hesitate and to find that she had done from duty that which she would have done from inclination. She no longer doubted the promise of happiness which had been made to her in her dreams. She now knew that the lady had truly assured her that her love for the unknown was not incompatible with the affection she entertained for the beast seeing that they were one and the same person. In the meanwhile, however, her husband never woke. After a slight meal, she endeavored to pass away the time in her usual occupations, but they appeared to her insipid, as she could not resolve to leave her apartments, nor bear to sit idle. She took up some music and began to sing. Her birds, hearing her, joined their voices to hers and made a concert, the more charming to her as she expected every moment it would be interrupted by the awaking of her husband, for she flattered herself she could dissolve the spell by the harmony of her voice. The spell was soon broken, but not by the means she imagined. She heard the sound of a chariot rolling beneath the windows of her apartment, and the voices of several persons approaching. At the same moment, the monkey captain of the guard, by the peak of his parrot interpreter, announced the visit of some ladies. Beauty, from her windows, beheld the chariot that brought them. 
It was of an entirely novel description, and of matchless beauty. Four white stags, with horns and hoofs of gold, superbly caparisoned, drew this equipage, the singularity of which increased Beauty's desire to know who were the owners of it. By the noise, which became louder, she was aware that the ladies had nearly reached the antechamber. She considered it right to advance and receive them. She recognized in one of them the lady she had been accustomed to behold in her dreams. The other was not less beautiful. Her high and distinguished bearing sufficiently indicated that she was an illustrious personage. She was no longer in the bloom of youth, but her air was so majestic that beauty was uncertain to which of the two strangers she ought first to address herself. She was still under this embarrassment when the one with whose features she was already familiar and who appeared to exercise some sort of superiority over the other, turning to her companion, said, Well, Queen, what think of you of this beautiful girl? You owe to her the restoration of your son to life, for you must admit the miserable circumstances under which he existed could not be called living. Without her, you would never again have beheld this prince. He must have remained in the horrible shape to which he had been transformed, had he not found in the world one only person who possessed virtue and courage equal to her beauty. I think you will behold with pleasure the son she has restored to you become her husband. They love each other, and nothing is wanting to their perfect happiness but your consent. Will you refuse to bestow it on them? The queen, at these words, embracing Beauty affectionately, exclaimed, Far from using my consent, their union will afford me the greatest felicity. Charming and virtuous child, to whom I am under so many obligations, tell me who you are, and the names of the sovereigns who are so happy as to have given birth to so perfect a princess. Madam, replied Beauty modestly, it is long since I had a mother. My father is a merchant more distinguished in the world for his poverty and his misfortunes than for his birth. At this frank declaration, the astonished queen recoiled a pace or two and said, What? You are only a merchant's daughter? Ah, oh, great fairy! She added, casting a mortified look on her companion and then remained silent but her manner sufficiently expressed her thoughts and her disappointment was legable in her eyes. It appears to me, said the fairy haughtily, that you are discontented with my choice. You regard with contempt the condition of this young person, and yet she was the only being in the world who was capable of executing my project, and who could make your son happy. I am very grateful to her for what she has done, replied the queen. But, powerful spirit, she continued, I cannot refrain from pointing out to you the incongruous mixture of that noblest blood in all the world, which runs in my son's veins, with that of the obscure race from which the person had sprung. To whom you would unite him? I confess I am little gratified by the supposed happiness of the prince. If it must be purged by an alliance so degrading to us and so unworthy of him, is it impossible to find in the world a maiden whose birth is equal to her virtue? I know many excellent princesses by name. Why am I not permitted to hope that I may see him, the processor of one of those? At this moment the handsome unknown appeared, the arrival of his mother and the fairy, had roused him, and the noise they had made was more effective than all the efforts of beauty. Such being the nature of the spell, the queen held him a long time in her arms without speaking a word. She found again a son whose fine qualities rendered him worthy of all her affection. What joy for the prince to see himself released from a horrible form, and a stupidity more painful to him because it was affected and had not obscured his reason. 
he had recovered the liberty to appear in his natural form by means of the object of his love, and that reflection made it still more precious to him. After the first transports which nature inspired him was at the sight of his mother, the prince hastened to pay those thanks to the fairy which duty and gratitude prompted. He did so in the most respectful terms, but as briefly as possible, in order to be at liberty to turn his attentions towards beauty. He had already, by tender glances, expressed to her his feelings, and was about to confirm with his lips, in the most touching language, what his eyes had spoken, when the fairy stopped him and bade him be the judge between her and his mother. Your mother, said she, condemns the engagement you have entered into with beauty. She considers that her birth is too much beneath yours. For my part, I think that her virtues make up for that inequality. It is for you, prince, to say with which of us your own feelings coincide, and that you may be under no restraint in declaring to us your real sentiments. I announce to you that you have full liberty of choice. Although you have pledged your word to this amiable person, you are free to withdraw it. I will answer for her that beauty will release you from your promise without the least hesitation. Although through her kindness you have regained your natural form, and I assure you also that her generosity will cause her to carry this interestedness to the extent of leaving you at liberty to dispose of your hand in favour of any person on whom the queen may advise you to bestow it what say you beauty pursued the fairy turning towards her have i been mistaken in thus interpreting your sentiments would you desire a husband who would become so with regret assuredly not madam replied beauty the prince is free i renounced the honour of being his wife when i accepted him i believed i was taking pity on something below humanity i engaged myself to him only with the object of conferring on him the most single favour ambition had no place in my thoughts therefore great fairy i implore you to exact no sacrifice from the queen whom i cannot blame for the scruples she entertains under such circumstances well queen what say you to that inquired the fairy in a disdainful and displeased tone do you consider that princesses who are so by the caprice of fortune better deserve the high rank in which it has placed them than this young maiden for my part i think she should not be prejudiced by an origin from which she has elevated herself by her conduct the queen replied with some embarrassment beauty is incomparable her merit is infinite nothing can surpass it but madam can we not find some other mode of rewarding her is it not to be affected without sacrificing to her the hand of my son then turning to beauty she continued yes i owe you more than i can pay i put therefore no limit to your desires ask boldly i will grant you everything with the sole exception but the difference will not be great to you choose a husband from amongst the nobles of my court however high in rank he will have cause to bless his good fortune and for your sake i will place him so near the throne that your position will be scarcely less enviable i thank you madam replied beauty but i ask no reward from you i am more than repaid by the pleasure of having broken the spell which had deprived a great prince of his mother and of his kingdom my happiness would have been perfect if i had rendered this service to my own sovereign all i desire is that the fairy will deign to restore me to my father the prince who by order of the fairy had been silent throughout this conversation was no longer master of himself and his respect for the commands he had received failed to restrain him he flung himself at the feet of the fairy and of his mother and implored them in the strongest terms not to make him more miserable than he had been by sending away beauty and depriving him of the happiness of being her husband at these words beauty 
gazing on him with an air full of tenderness, but mingled with a noble pride, said, Prince, I cannot conceal from you my affection. Your disenchantment is a proof of it, and I should in vain endeavour to disguise my feelings. I confess without a blush that I love you better than my life. Why should I dissimulate? We may disavow evil impulses, but mine are perfectly innocent and are authorized by the generous fairy to whom we are both so much indebted but if i could resolve to sacrifice my feelings when i thought it my duty to do so for the beast you must feel assured that i shall not flatter on this occasion when it is no longer the interest of the monster that is at stake but your own it is enough for me to know who you are and that i am to renounce the glory of being your wife I will even venture to say that if, yielding to your entreaties, the Queen should grant the consent you ask, it would not alter the case, for in my own reason, and even in my love, you would meet with an insurmountable obstacle. I repeat that I ask no favour but that of being allowed to return to the bosom of my family, where I shall for ever cherish the remembrance of your bounty and your affection. Generous fairy! exclaimed the prince clasping her hands in supplication for mercy's sake do not allow beauty to depart make me rather again the monster that i was for then i shall be her husband she pledged her word to the beast and i prefer that happiness to all those she has restored me to if i must purchase them so dearly the fairy made no answer but she looked steadily at the queen who was moved by so much true affection but whose pride remained unshaken the despair of her son affected her yet she could not forget that beauty was the daughter of a merchant and nothing more she notwithstanding feared the anger of the fairy whose manner and silence sufficiently evinced her indignation her confusion was extreme not having power to utter a word she feared to see a fatal termination to a conference which had offended the protecting spirit no one spoke for some minutes but the fairy at length broke the silence and casting an affectionate look upon the lovers she said to them i find you worthy of each other it would be a crime to part two such excellent persons you shall not be separated i promise you and i have sufficient power to fulfil my promise the queen shuddered at these words and would have made some remonstrance but the fairy anticipated her by saying for you queen the little value ye set upon virtue unuttered by the vain titles which alone you respect would justify me in heaping on you the bitterest reproaches but i excuse your fault arising from pride of birth and i will take no other vengeance beyond doing this little violence to your prejudice and for which you will not be long without thanking me beauty at these words embraced the knees of the fairy and exclaimed ah oh, do not expose me to the misery of being told all my life that i am unworthy of the rank to which your bounty would elevate me reflect that this prince who now believes that his happiness consists in the possession of my hand may very shortly perhaps be of the same opinion as the queen no no beauty fear nothing rejoined the fairy the evils you anticipate cannot come to pass i know a sure way of protecting you from them and should the prince be capable of despising you after marriage he must seek some other reason than the inequality of your condition your birth is not inferior to his own nay the advantage is even considerably on your side for the truth is she said sternly to the queen that you behold your niece and what must render her still more worthy of your respect is that she is mine also being the daughter of my sister who was not like you a slave to rank which is lustrous without virtue that fairy knowing how to estimate true worth did your brother the king of the happy island the honour to marry him i preserved this fair fruit of their union
from the fury of a Fairy who desired to be her step mother. From the moment of her birth, I destined her to be the wife of your son. I desired, by concealing from you the result of my good service, to give you an opportunity of showing your confidence in me. I had some reason to believe that it was greater than it appears to have been. You might have relied upon me for watching over the destiny of the prince. I had given you proofs enough of the interest I took in it, and you needed not to have been under any apprehension that I should expose him to anything that would be disgraceful to him or to you. I feel persuaded, madam, continued she, with a smile which had still something of bitterness in it, that you will not object to honour us with your alliance. The queen, astonished and embarrassed, knew not what to answer. The only way to atone for her fault was to confess it frankly and evince a sincere repentance. I am guilty, generous fairy, said she. Your bounties should have satisfied me that you would not suffer my son to have formed an alliance unworthy of him. But, pardon, I beseech you, the prejudice of my rank, which urged that royal blood cannot marry one of humbler birth without degradation. I acknowledge that I deserve you should punish me by giving to beauty a mother-in-law more worthy of her. But you take too kind an interest in my son to render him the victim of my error. As to you, dear beauty, she continued, embracing her tenderly, you must not resent my resistance. It was caused by my desire to marry my son to my niece, whom the fairy had often assured me was living, notwithstanding all appearances to the contrary. She had drawn so charming a portrait of her that without knowing you, I loved you dearly enough to risk offending the fairy in order to preserve to you the throne and the heart of my son. So saying, she recommenced her caresses, which beauty received with respect. The prince, on his part, enraptured at this agreeable intelligence, expressed his delight in looks alone. Behold us all satisfied, said the fairy, and now, to terminate this happy adventure, we only need the consent of the royal father of the princess but we shall shortly see him here. Beauty requested her to permit the person who had brought her up, and whom she had hitherto looked upon as her father, to witness her felicity. I admire such consideration, said the fairy. It is worthy a noble mind, and, as you desire it, I undertake to inform him. Then, taking the queen by the hand, she led her away under the pretext of showing her over the enchanted palace. It was to give the newly betrothed pair the liberty of conversing with each other for the first time without restraint or the aid of illusion. They would have followed, but she forbade them. The happiness in store for them inspired each with equal delight. They could not entertain the least doubt of their mutual affection. Their conversation, confused and unconnected, their protestations a hundred times repeated, were to them more convincing proofs of love than the most eloquent language could have afforded. After having exhausted all the expressions that passion suggests, under such circumstances to those that are truly in love, beauty inquired of her lover by what misfortune he had been so cruelly transformed into a beast. She requested him also to relate to her all the events of his life, preceding that shocking metamorphosis. End of section 22this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Beauty and the Beast by Madame de Villeneuve Translated by James Blushy Part 5 The Prince whose recovery of his natural form 
had not lengthened his anxiety to obey her, without more ado, commenced his narrative in the following words. The Story of the Beast The king, my father, died before I was born. The queen would never have been consoled for his loss if her interest for the child she bore had not struggled with her sorrow. My birth caused her extreme delight. The sweet task of rearing the fruit of the affection of so dearly beloved a husband was destined to dissipate her affliction. The care of my education and the fear of losing me occupied her entirely. She was assisted in her object by a fairy of her acquaintance, who showed the greatest anxiety to preserve me from all kinds of accidents. The queen felt greatly obliged to her, but she was not pleased when the fairy asked her to place me entirely in her hands. The fairy had not the best of reputations. She was said to be capricious in her favours. People feared more than they loved her, and even had my mother been perfectly convinced of the goodness of her nature, she could not have resolved to lose sight of me. By the advice, however, of prudent persons, and for fear of suffering from the fatal effect of the resentment of this vindictive fairy, she did not flatly refuse her. If voluntarily confided to her care, there was no reason to suppose she would do me any injury. Experience had proved that she took pleasure in hurting those only by whom she considered herself offended. The queen admitted this, and was only reluctant to forego the pleasure of gazing on me continually with a mother's eyes, which enabled her to discover charms in me, I owed solely to her partiality. She was still irresolute as to the course she should adopt. When a powerful neighbour imagined it would be an easy matter for him to seize upon the dominions of an infinite governed by a woman. He invaded my kingdom with a formidable army. The queen hastily raised one to oppose him, and with a courage beyond that of her sex, placed herself at the head of her troops, and marched to defend our frontiers. It was then that being compelled to leave me, she could not avoid confiding to the fairy the care of my education. I was placed in her hands after she had sworn by all she held most sacred that she would without the least hesitation bring me back to the court as soon as the war was over, which my mother calculated would not last more than a year at the utmost. Notwithstanding, however, all the advantages she gained over the enemy, she found it impossible to return to the capital so soon as she expected to profit by her victory after having driven the foe out of our dominion. She pursued him in his own. She took the entire provinces, gained battle after battle, and finally reduced the vanquished to sue for a degrading peace which he obtained only on the hardest conditions. After this glorious success, the queen returned triumphantly and enjoyed in anticipation the pleasure of beholding me once more. But having learned upon her march that her base foe, in violation of the treaty, had surprised and masqueraded our graces, and repossessed himself of nearly all the places he had been compelled to say to us, she was obliged to retrace her steps. Honour prevailed over the affection which drew her towards me, and she resolved never to sheathe the sword till she had put it out of her enemy's power to perpetrate more treachery. The time employed in this second expedition was very considerable. She had flattered herself that two or three campaigns would suffice. But she had to contend with an adversary as cunning as he was false. He contrived to excite rebellion 
in some of our own provinces, and to corrupt entire battalions, which forced the queen to remain in arms for fifteen years. She never thought of sending for me. She was always flattering herself that each month would be the last she should be absent, and that she was on the point of seeing me again. In the meanwhile, the fairy, in accordance with her promise, had paid every attention to my education. From the day she had taken me out of my kingdom, she had never left me nor ceased to give me proof of the interest she felt in all that concerned my health and amusement. I evinced by my respect for her how sensible I was of her kindness. I showed her the same deference, the same attention that I should have shown to my mother, and gratitude inspired me with as much affection for her. For some time she appeared satisfied with my behavior, but one day, without importing to me the motive, she set out on a journey, from which she did not return for some years, and when she did return, struck with the effect of her care of me, she conceived for me an affection, differing from that of a mother. She had previously permitted me to call her by that name, but now she forbade me. I obeyed her without inquiring what were her reasons, or suspecting what she was about to exact from me. I saw clearly that she was dissatisfied, but could I imagine why she continually complained of my ingratitude? I was the more surprised at her reproaches, as I did not feel I deserved them. They were always followed or preceded by the tenderest caresses. I was not old enough to comprehend her. She was compelled to explain herself. She did so one day when I evinced some sorrow, mingled with impatience, respecting the continued absence of the queen. She reproached me for this, and on my assuring her that my affection for my mother in no wise interfered with that I owed to herself, she replied that she was not jealous, although she had done so much for me, and had resolved to do still more but that to enable her to carry out her designs in my favour with greater freedom, it was requisite, she added, that I should marry her, that she did not desire to be loved by me as a mother, but as an admirer, that she had no doubt of my gratitude to her for making this proposal, or of the great joy with which I should accept it, and that, Consequently, I had only to abandon myself to the delight with which the certainty of becoming the husband of a powerful fairy, who could protect me from all dangers, assure me an existence full of happiness and cover me with glory, must naturally awaken. I was sadly embarrassed by this proposition. I knew enough of the world in my own country to be aware that amongst the wedded fortune of the community, the happiest were those whose ages and characters assimilated, and that many were much to be pitied, who, marrying under opposite circumstances, had found antipathies existing between them, which were the source of constant misery. The fairy, being old and of a haughty disposition, I could not flatter myself that my lot would be so agreeable as she predicted. I was far from entertaining for her such feelings as one should for the woman with whom we intend to pass our days. And besides, I was not inclined to enter into any such engagement at so early an age. My only desire was to see the queen again and to singleize myself at the head of her forces. I sighed for liberty. That was the sole bone that would have gratified me, and the only one the fairy would not grant. I had often implored her to allow me to share the perils to which I knew the queen exposed herself for the protection of my interests, but my prayers had hitherto been fruitless. 
pressed to reply to the astounding declaration she had made to me, I, in some confusion, recalled to her that she had often told me that I had no right to dispose of my hand without the commands of my mother, and in her absence. That is exactly my opinion, she replied. I do not wish you to do otherwise. I am satisfied that you should refer the matter to the queen. I have already informed you, beautiful princess, that I had been unable to obtain from the fairy permission to seek the queen, my mother. The desire she now had to receive her sanction, which she never doubted she should obtain, obliged her to grant, even without my asking, that which she had always denied me, but it was on the condition, by no means agreeable to me, that she should accompany me. I did what I could to dissuade her, but found it impossible, and we set out together with a numerous escort. We arrived upon the eve of a decisive action. The queen had maneuvered with such skill that the next day was certain to decide the fate of the enemy, who would have no resource if he lost the battle. My presence created great pleasure in the camp and gave additional courage to our troops, who drew a favorable augury for my arrival. The queen was ready to die with joy, but this first transport of delight was succeeded by the greatest alarm. Whilst I exulted in the hope of acquiring glory, the queen trembled at the danger to which I was about to expose myself. Too generous to endeavor to prevent me, she implored me by all her affection to take as much care of myself as honor would permit and entreated the fairy not to abandon me on that occasion. Her solicitations were unnecessary. The too susceptible fairy was as much alarmed as the queen, for she possessed no spell which could protect me from the chances of war. However, by instantly inspiring me with the art of commanding an army, the prudence requisite for so important an office, she achieved much. The most experienced captains were surprised at me. I remained master of the field. The victory was complete. I had the happiness of saving the queen's life and of preventing her from being made prisoner of war. The enemy was pursued with such vigor that he abandoned his camp, lost his baggage, and more than three-fourths of his army, while the loss on our side was inconsiderable. A slight wound which I had received was the only advantage the foe could boast of. But the queen, fearing that if the war continued, some more serious mischief might befall me, in opposition to the desire of the whole army, to which my presence had imparted fresh spirit, made peace on more advantageous terms than the vanquished had ventured to hope for. A short time afterwards, we returned to our capital, which we entered in Trion. My occupation during the war and the continual presence of my ancient adorer had prevented me from informing the queen of what had occurred. She was, therefore, completely taken by surprise when the fairy told her in so many words that she had determined to marry me immediately. This declaration was made in this very palace, but which was at that time not so superb as it is at present. It had been a country residence of the late king, which a thousand occupations had prevented his embellishing. My mother, who cherished everything that he had loved, had selected it in preference to any other as a place of retirement after the fatigues of the war. At the avowal of the fairy, unable to control her first feelings, and unused to dissemble, she exclaimed, Have you reflected, madam, on the absurdity of the arrangement you proposed to me? In truth, it was impossible to conceive 
one more decorous. In addition to the almost decrepit old age of the fairy, she was horribly ugly. Nor was this the effect of time. If she had been handsome in her youth, she might have preserved some portion of her beauty by the aid of her art. But naturally hideous, her power could only invest her with the appearance of beauty for one day in each year, and that day ended, she returned to her former state. The fairy was surprised at the exclamation of the queen. Her self-love concealed from her all that was actually horrible in her person, and she calculated that her power sufficiently compensated for the loss of a few charms of her youth. What do you mean? said she to the queen, by an absurd arrangement. Consider that this is imprudent in you to make me remember what I condescended to forget. You ought only to congratulate yourself on possessing a son so amiable that his merit induces me to prefer him to the most powerful genie in all elements. And as I have deigned to descend to him, Accept with respect the honour I am good enough to confer on you, and do not give me time to change my mind. The queen, as proud as the fairy, had never conceived that there was a rank on earth higher than the throne. She valued little the pretended honour which the fairy offered her. Having always commanded every one who approached her, she by no means desired to have a daughter in law to whom she must herself pay homage. Therefore, far from replying to her, she remained motionless, and contented herself with fixing her eyes upon me. I was as much astounded as she was, and fixing my eyes on her in the same manner. It was easy for the fairy to perceive that our silence expressed sentiments very opposite to the joy with which she would have inspired us. What is the meaning of this? said she sharply. How comes it that mother and son are both silent? Has this agreeable surprise deprived you of the power of speech? Or are you blind and rash enough to reject my offer? Say, prince, said she to me, are you so ungrateful and so imprudent as to despise my kindness? Do you not consent to give me your hand this moment? No, madam, I assure you, replied I quickly. Although I am sincerely grateful to you for the past favours, I cannot agree to discharge my debt to you by such means, and with the Queen's permission, I decline to part so soon with my liberty. Name any other mode of acknowledging your favours, and I will not consider it impossible. But as to that you have proposed, excuse me if you please for— How insignificant creature! interrupted the fairy furiously. Thou darest to resist me, and you, foolish queen, you see, without anger, this conduct. What do I say? Without anger. It is you who authorize it, for it is your own insolent looks that have inspired him with the audacity to refuse me. The queen, already stung by the contemptuous language of the fairy, was no longer mistress of herself, and accidentally casting her eyes on a looking-glass before which we happened to be standing at the moment. The wicked fairy thus provoked her, what answer can I make you, said she, that you ought not to make to yourself, deign to contemplate, without prejudice, the object this class presents to you, and let it reply for me. The fairy easily comprehended the queen's insinuation. It is the beauty, then, of this precious son of yours that renders you so vain, said she to her and has exposed me to be degrading a refusal. I appear to you unworthy of him. Well, she continued, raising her voice furiously, 
Having taken so much pains to make him charming, it is fit that I should complete my work, and that I should give you both a cause as novel as remarkable, to make you remember what you owe to me. Go, wretch, said she to me, boast that thou hast refused me thy heart and thy hand. Give them to her thou findest more worthy of them than I am. So saying, my terrible lover struck me a blow on the head. It was so heavy that I was dashed to the ground on my face, and felt as though I were crushed by the fall of a mountain. Irritated by this insult, I struggled to rise, but found it impossible. The weight of my body had become so great that I could not lift myself. All that I could do was to sustain myself on my own hands, which had in an instant become two horrible poles, and the sight of them apprised me of the change I had undergone. My form was that in which you found me. I cast my eyes for an instant on that fatal glass, and could no longer doubt my cruel and sudden transformation. My despair rendered me motionless. The queen at this dreadful sight was almost out of her mind. To put the last seal upon her barbarity, the furious fairy said to me, in an ironical tone, Go make illustrious conquest, more worthy of thee than an august fairy, and as sense is not acquired when one is so handsome, I command thee to appear as stupid as thou art horrible, and to remain in this state until a young and beautiful girl shall, of her own accord, come to seek thee, although fully persuaded thou wilt devour her. She must also, continued the fairy, after discovering that her life is not in danger, conceive for thee a sufficiently tender affection to induce her to marry thee. Until thou canst meet with this rare maiden, it is my pleasure that thou remain an object of horror to thyself and to all who behold thee. As for you, too happy mother of so lovely a child, said she to the queen, I warn you that if you acknowledge to any one that this monster is your son, he shall never recover his natural shape. Neither interest, nor ambition, nor the charms of his conversation must assist to restore him to it. Adieu, do not be impatient. You will not have long to wait. Such a darling will soon find a remedy for his misfortune. Ah, oh, cruel one, exclaimed the queen, if my refusal has offended you, let your vengeance light on me. Take my life, but do not, I conjure you, destroy your own work. You forget yourself, great princess, replied the fairy in an ironical tone. You demean yourself too much. I am not handsome enough for you to condescend to entreat me, but I am firm in my resolutions. Adieu, powerful queen. Adieu, beautiful prince. It is not fair that I should longer annoy you with my hateful presence. I withdraw, but I have still charity enough to warn thee, addressing herself to me, that thou must forget who thou art, if thou sufferest thyself to be flattered by vain respect or by pompous titles. Thou art lost irretrievably, and thou art equally lost if thou shouldest dare to avail thyself of the intellect. I leave thee possessed of to shine in conversation. With these words she disappeared and left the queen and me in a state which can neither be described nor imagined. Lamentations are the consolation of the unhappy, but our misery was too great to seek relief in them. My mother determined to stab herself, and I to fling myself in the adjacent canal. Without communicating our intentions to each other, we were on the point of executing these fatal designs, when a female of majestic mien, and whose manner inspired us with profound respect, appeared 
and bade us remember that it was cowardice to scumble to the greatest misfortune, and that with time and courage there was no evil that could not be remedied. The queen, however, was inconsolable. Tears streams from her eyes, and not knowing how to inform her subjects that their sovereign was transformed into a horrible monster, she abandoned herself to the most fearful despair. The fairy, for she was one and the same, whom you have seen here, knowing both her misery and her embarrassment, recalled to her the indispensable obligation she was under to conceal from her people this dreadful adventure, and that in lieu of yielding to despair, it would be better to seek some remedy for the mischief. Is there one to be found? exclaimed the queen which is powerful enough to prevent the fulfilment of a fairy's sentence. Yes, madam, replied the fairy. There is a remedy for everything. I am a fairy as well as she, whose fury you have just felt the effects of, and my power is equal to hers. It is true that I cannot immediately repair the injury she has done you, for we are not permitted to act directly in opposition to each other. She who has caused your misfortune is older than I am, and age has amongst us a particular title to respect. But as she could not avoid attaching a condition upon which the spell might be broken, I will assist you to break it. I grant that it would be a difficult task to terminate this enchantment. But it does not appear to me to be impossible. Let me see what I can do for you by the excursion of all the means in my power. Upon this, she drew a book from under her robe, and after taking a few mysterious steps, she seated herself at a table and read for a considerable time with such intense application that large drops of perspiration stood on her forehead. At length, she closed the book and meditated profoundly. The expression of her countenance was so serious that for some time we were led to believe that she considered my misfortune irreparable. But recovering from a sort of trance and her features resuming their natural beauty, she informed us that she had discovered a remedy for our disasters. It will be slow, said she, but it will be sure Keep your secret. Let it not transpire, so that any one can suspect you are concealed beneath this horrible disguise. For in that case, you will deprive me of the power of delivering you from it. Your enemy flatters herself you will divulge it. It is for that reason she did not take from you the power of speech. The queen declared that the condition was an impossible one, as two of her women had been present at the fatal transformation and had rushed out of the apartment in great terror, which must have excited the curiosity of the guards and the courtiers. She imagined that the whole court was by this time aware of it, and that all the kingdom and even all the world would speedily receive the intelligence. But the fairy knew a way to prevent the disclosure of the secret. She made several circles, now solemnly, now rapidly, uttering words of which we could not comprehend the meaning, and finished by raising her hand in the air in the style of one who is pronouncing an imperative order. This gesture, added to the words she had uttered, was so powerful that every breathing creature in the palace became motionless and was changed into a statue. They are all still in the same state. They are the figures you behold in various directions, and in the very attitude they had assumed at the instant the fairy's potent spell surprised them. The queen, who at that moment cast her eyes upon the great courtyard, observed this change taking place in a prodigious number of persons. The silence which suddenly succeeded to the stir of multitude awoke a feeling of compassion in her heart 
for the many innocent beings who were deprived of life for my sake. But the Fairy comforted her by saying that she would only retain her subjects in that condition as long as their discretion was necessary. It was a precaution she was compelled to take, but she promised she would make up to them for it, and that the period they passed in that state would not be added to the years allotted to their existence. They will be so much the younger, said the fairy to the queen, so cease to deplore them and leave them here with your son. He will be quite safe, for I have raised such thick fogs around this castle that it will be impossible for anyone to enter it. But when we think fit, I will convey you, she continued, where your presence is necessary. Your enemies are plotting against you. Be careful to proclaim to your people that the fairy who educated your son retains him near her for an important purpose and keeps with her also all the persons who were in attendance on you. It was not without shedding a flood of tears that my mother could force herself to leave me. The fairy renewed her assurances to her that she would always watch over me and protested that I had only to wish and to see the accomplishment of my desires. She added that my misfortunes would shortly end, provided neither the queen nor I raise up an obstacle by some act of imprudence. All these promises could not console my mother. She wished to remain with me and to leave the fairy or anyone she might consider the most proper person to govern the kingdom. But fairies are imperious and will be obeyed. My mother, fearing by a refusal to increase my miseries and deprive me of the aid of this beneficent spirit, consented to all she insisted on. She saw a beautiful car approach. It was drawn by the same white stags that brought her here today. The fairy made the queen mount by her side. She had scarcely time to embrace me. Her affairs demanded her presence elsewhere, and she was warned that a longer sergeant in this place would be prejudicial to me. She was transported with extraordinary velocity to the spot where her army was encamped. They were not surprised to see her arrive with this equipage. Everybody believed her to be accompanied by the old fairy, for the one who was with her kept herself unseen, and departed again immediately to return to this place, which in an instant she embellished with everything that her imagination could suggest and her art supply. This good-natured fairy permitted me also to add whatever I fancied would please me, and after having done for me all she could, she left me with exhortations to take courage, and promising to come occasionally and impart to me such hopes as she might entertain of a favourable issue to my adventure. I seemed to be alone in the palace. I was only so to sight. I was served as if I were in the midst of my courtiers, and my occupations were nearly the same as those which were afterwards yours. I read, I went to the play, I cultivated a garden which I had made to amuse me, and found something agreeable in everything I undertook. What I planted arrived at perfection in the same day. It took no more time to produce the bower of roses to which I am indebted for the happiness of beholding you here. My benefactress came very often to see me. Her presence and her promises elevated my distresses. Through her, the queen received news of me, and I news of the queen. One day, I saw the fairy, arrived with joy, sparkling in her eyes. Dear prince, said she to me, the moment of your happiness approaches. She then informed me that he whom you believe to be your father had passed a very uncomfortable night in the forest. She related to me in a few words the adventure which had caused him to undertake the journey without revealing to me your real parentage. She apprised me that the worthy man was compelled to seek an asylum 
from the misery he had endured during four and twenty hours. I go, said she, to give orders for his reception. It must be an agreeable one. He has a charming daughter. I propose that she shall release you. I have examined the conditions which my cruel companion has attached to your disenchantment. It is fortunate that she did not ordain that your deliverer should come hither out of love for you. On the contrary, she insisted that the young maiden should expect no less than death, and yet expose herself to it voluntarily. I have thought of a scheme to oblige her to take that step. It is to make her believe the life of her father is in danger, and that she has no other means of saving him. I know that in order to spare her father any expense on her account, she has asked him only to bring her a rose, whilst her sisters have overwhelmed him with extravagant commissions. He will naturally avail himself of the first favourable opportunity. Hide yourself in this arbour, and seizing him the instant he attempts to gather your roses, threaten him that death would be the punishment of his audacity unless he give you one of his daughters, or rather unless she sacrifice herself. According to the decree of our enemy, this man has five daughters besides the one I have destined for you, but not one of them is sufficiently magnanimous to purchase the life of their father at the price of their own. Beauty is alone capable of so grand an action. I executed exactly the fairy's commands. You know, lovely princess, with what success. The merchant, to save his life, promised what I demanded. I saw him depart without being able to persuade myself that he would return with you. I could not flatter myself that my desire would be fulfilled. What torment did I not suffer during the month he had requested me to allow him? I longed for this termination only to be certain of my disappointment. I could not imagine that a young, lovely and amiable girl would have the courage to seek a monster of whom she believed she was doomed to be the prey, even supposing her to have sufficient fortitude to devote herself, she would have to remain with me without repenting the step she had taken, and that appeared to me an invincible obstacle. Besides, how could she behold me without dying with a fright? I passed my miserable existence in these melancholy reflections, and never was I more to be pitied. The month, however, elapsed, and my protectress announced to me your arrival. You remember, no doubt, the pomp with which you were received. Not daring to express my delight in words, I endeavoured to prove it to you by the most magnificent signs of rejoicing. The fairy, ceaseless in her attentions to me, prohibited me from making myself known to you. Whatever terror I might inspire you with, or whatever kindness you might show me. I was not permitted to seek to please you, nor to express any love for you, nor to discover to you in any way who I was. I could have recourse, however, to excessive good nature, as fortunately the malignant fairy had forgotten to forbid my giving you proof of that. These regulations seemed hard to me, but I was compelled to subscribe to them, and I resolved to present myself before you only for a few moments every day, and to avoid long conversations in which my heart might betray its tenderness. You came, charming princess, and the first sight of you produced upon me a diametrically opposite effect to that which my monstrous appearance must have done upon you. To see you was instantly to love you, entering your apartment tremblingly, my joy was excessive to find that you could behold me with greater intrepidity than I could behold myself. You delighted me infinitely when you declared that you would remain with me. An impulse of self-love which I retained even under that most horrible of forms led me to believe that you had not found me so hideous 
as you anticipated. Your father departed satisfied, but my sorrow increased as I reflected that I was not allowed to win your favour in any way except by indulging the caprices of your taste. Your demeanour, your conversation, as sensible as it was, unpretending, everything in you convinced me that you acted solely on the principles dictated to you by reason and virtue, and that consequently I had nothing to hope for from a fortunate caprice. I was in despair at being forbidden to address you in any other language than that which the fairy had dictated and which she had expressly chosen as coarse and stupid. In vain did I represent to her that it was unnatural to expect you would accept my proposition to marry you. Her answer was always, Patience, perseverance, or all is lost. To recompense you for my silly conversation, she assured me she would surround you with all sorts of pleasures, and give me the advantage of seeing you continually, without alarming you, or being compelled to say rude, and impertinent things to you she rendered me invisible and i had the gratification of seeing you waited on by spirits who were also invisible or who presented themselves to you in the shapes of various animals more than this the fairy caused you to behold my natural form in your nightly slumbers and in portraits by day and made it speak to you in your dreams as i should have spoken to you myself you obtained a confused idea of my secret and my hopes, which she urged you to realize, and by the means of a starry mirror I witnessed all your interviews, and read in it either all you imagined you uttered, or all that you actually thought. This position, however, did not suffice to render me happy. I was only so in a dream, and my sufferings were real. The intense affection with which you had inspired me, obliged me to complain of the restraint under which I lived. But my state was much more wretched when I perceived that these beautiful scenes had no longer any charms for you. I saw you shed tears which pierced my heart and would have destroyed me. You asked me if I was alone here, and I was on the verge of discarding my fiend stupidity and assuring you by the most passionate vows of the fact, they would have been uttered in terms that would have surprised you and caused you to suspect that I was not so coarse a brute as I pretended to be. I was on the point even of declaring myself when the fairy, invisible to you, appeared before me by a threatening gesture which terrified me. She found a way to close my lips. Oh, heavens! By what means did she impose silence upon me? She approached you with a poniard in her hand and made signs to me that the first word I uttered would cost you your life. I was so frightened that I naturally lapsed into the stupidity she had ordered me to affect. My sufferings were not yet at end. You expressed a desire to visit your father I gave you permission without hesitation. Could I have refused you anything? But I regarded your departure as my death blow, and without the assistance of the fairy, I must have sunk under it. During your absence, that generous being never quitted me. She saved me from destroying myself, which I should have done in my despair, not daring to hope that you would return. The time you had passed in this palace rendered my condition more insupportable than it had been previously, because I felt I was the most miserable of all men, without the hope of making it known to you. My most agreeable occupation was to wander through the scenes which you had frequented, but my grief was increased by no longer seeing you there. The evenings and hours when I used to have the pleasure of conversing with you for a moment redoubled my afflictions and were still more painful to me. Those two months, the longest I had ever known, ended at last, and you did not return. It was then my misery reached its climax, 
and that the fairy's power was too weak to prevent my sinking under my despair. The precautions she took to prevent my attempting my life were useless. I had a sure way which eluded her power. It was to refrain from food. By the potency of her spells, she contrived to sustain me for some time. But having exhausted all her secrets, I grew weaker and weaker, and finally I had but a few moments to breathe. When you arrived to snatch me from the tomb, your precious tears, more efficacious than all the cordials of the disguised genie who attended on me, delayed my soul upon the point of flight. And learning from your lamentations that I was dear to you, I enjoyed perfect felicity, and that felicity was at its height when you accepted me for your husband. Still, I was not permitted to divulge to you my secret, and the beast was compelled to leave you without daring to disclose to you the prince. You know the lethargy into which I fell, and which ended only with the arrival of the fairy and the queen. On awaking, I found myself as you behold me, without being aware of how the change took place. You have witnessed what followed, but you could only imperfectly judge of the pain which the obstinacy of my mother caused me in opposing a marriage so suitable and so glorious for me. I had determined, princess, rather to be a monster again than to abandon the hope of being the husband of so virtuous and charming a maiden. Had the secret of your birth remained forever a mystery to me, love and gratitude would not less have assured me that in possessing you I was the most fortunate of men. The prince thus ended his narration, and Beauty was about to speak, when she was prevented by a burst of loud voices and warlike instruments, which, however, did not appear to announce anything alarming. The prince and princess looked out of the window, as did also the fairy and the queen who returned from their promenade. The noise was occasioned by the arrival of a personage who, according to all appearances, could be no less than a king. His escort was obviously a royal one, and there was an air of majesty in his demeanour which accorded with the state that accompanied him. The fine form of his sovereign, although of a certain age, testified that there had been few who could have equalled him in appearance when in the flower of his youth. He was followed by twelve of his bodyguard and some courtiers in hunting dresses, who appeared as much astonished as their master to find themselves in a castle till now quite unknown to them. He was received with the same honours that would have been paid to him in his own dominions, and all by invisible beings. Shouts of joy and flourishes of trumpets were heard, but no one was to be seen. The fairy, immediately on beholding him, said to the queen, Here is the king, your brother, and the father of beauty. He little expects the pleasure of seeing you both here. He will be so much the more gratified. As you know, he believes that his daughter has been long dead. He mourns her still, as he also does his wife, of whom he retains an affectionate remembrance. These words increased the impatience of the queen and the young princess to embrace this monarch. They reached the courtyard, just as he dismounted. He saw, but could not recognize them, not doubting, however, that they were advancing to receive him. He was considering how and in what terms he should pay his compliments to them, when Beauty, flinging herself at his feet, embracing his knees, and called him, Father! The king raised her and pressed her tenderly in his arms, without comprehending why she addressed him by that title. He imagined she must be some orphan princess, who thought his protection for some oppressor, and who made use 
of the most touching expression in order to obtain her request. He was about to assure her that he would do all that lay in his power to assist her, when he recognized the queen, his sister, who, embracing him in her turn, presented her son to him. She then informed him of some of the obligations they were under to beauty, and especially of the frightful enchantment that had just been terminated. The king praised the young princess and desired to know her name. When the fairy, interrupting him, asked if it was necessary to name her parents, and if he had never known any one whom she resembled sufficiently to enable him to guess them. If I judge only from her features, said he, gazing upon her earnestly, and not being able to restrain a few tears, the title she has given to me is legitimately my due but notwithstanding that evidence and the emotion which her presence occasions me i dare not flatter myself that she is the daughter whose loss i have deplored for i had the most positive proof that she had been devoured by wild beasts yet he continued still examining her countenance she resembles perfectly the tender and incomparable wife whom death has deprived me of. Oh, that I could but venture to indulge in the delightful hope of beholding again in her the fruit of a happy union, the bounds of which were too soon broken. You may, my liege, replied the fairy. Beauty is your daughter. Her birth is no longer a secret here. The queen and prince know who she is. I cause you to direct your steps this way on purpose to inform you. But this is not a fitting place for me to enter into the details of this adventure. Let us enter the palace. After you have rested yourself there a short time, I will relate to you all you desire to know. When you have indulged in the delight which you must feel at finding a daughter so beautiful and so virtuous, I will communicate to you another piece of intelligence which will afford you equal gratification. End of section 23of four and twenty fairy tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Beauty and the Beast by Madame de Villeneuve. Translated by James Lushy. Part the king, accompanied by his daughter and the prince, was ushered by the monkey officers into the apartment destined for him by the fairy who took this opportunity of restoring to the statues the liberty of relating what they had witnessed. As their fate had excited the compassion of the queen, it is from her hands that the fairy desired they should receive the benefit of reanimation. She placed her wand in the queen's hand, who, by her instructions, described with it seven circles in the air, and then pronounced these words, Be reanimated, your king is restored to you. All the statues immediately began to move, walk, and act as formerly, retaining only a confused idea of what had happened to them. After this ceremony, the fairy and the queen returned to the king, whom they found in conversation with Beauty and the prince, caressing each in turn, and most fondly his daughter, of whom he inquired a hundred times how she had been preserved from the wild beast who had carried her off, without remembering that she had answered him from the first time 
that she knew nothing about it, and had been ignorant even of the secret of her birth. The prince also talked without being attended to, repeating a hundred times the obligations he was under to Princess Beauty. He desired to acquaint the king with the promises which the fairy had made him, that he should marry the princess, and to beg he would not refuse his cheerful consent to the alliance. This conversation and these caresses were interrupted by the entrance of the queen and the fairy. The king, who had recovered his daughter, fully appreciated his happiness, but was as yet ignorant to whom he was indebted for this precious gift. It is to me, said the fairy, and I alone can explain to you the adventure I shall not limit my benefit to the recital of that alone. I have other tidings in store for you, not less agreeable. Therefore, great king, you may note this day as one of the happiest of your life. The company, perceiving that the fairy was about to commence her narration, events by their silence the great attention they were anxious to pay to it. To satisfy their curiosity, the fairy thus addressed the king. Beauty, my liege, and perhaps the prince, are the only persons present who are not acquainted with the laws of the fortunate island. It is necessary I should explain those laws to them. The inhabitants of that island, and even the king himself, are allowed perfect liberty to marry according to their inclinations in order that there may be no obstacle whatever to their happiness. It was in virtue of this privilege that you, sire, selected for your wife a young shepherdess, whom you met one day when you were hunting. Her beauty and her good conduct were considered by you deserving of that honour. You raised her to the throne and placed her in a rank from which the lowliness of her birth seemed to have excluded her, but of which she was worthy. By the nobleness of her character and the purity of her mind, you know that you had continual reasons to rejoice in the selection you had made. Her gentleness, her obliging disposition, and her affection for you equaled the charms of her person, but you did not long enjoy the happiness of beholding her. After she had made you the father of beauty, you were under the necessity of travelling to the frontiers of your kingdom to suppress some revolutionary demonstrations of which you had received intimation. During this period, you lost your dear wife, an affliction which you felt the most sensibly, because in addition to the love with which her beauty had inspired you, you had the greatest respect for the many rare qualities that adorned her mind. Despite her youth and the little education she had received, you found her naturally endowed with profound judgment, and your wisest ministers were astonished at the excellent advice she gave you and the policy by which she enabled you to succeed in all your undertakings. The king, who still brooded over his affliction, and to whose imagination the death of that dear wife was ever present, could not listen to this account without being sensibly affected. And the fairy, who observed his emotion, said, Your feelings prove that you deserved that happiness. I will no longer dwell on a subject that it is so painful to you, but I must reveal to you that the supposed shepherdess was a fairy and my sister, who, having heard that the Fortune Island was a charming country, and also much praise of its laws and of the gentle nature of your government, was particularly anxious to visit it. The dress of a shepherdess was the only disguise she assumed, intending to enjoy for a short time a pastoral life. You encountered her in her new abode, her youth and beauty touched your heart. She yielded to a desire to discover whether the qualities of your mind equaled those she found in your person. 
she trusted to her condition and power as a fairy, which could place her at a wish beyond the reach of your assiduities, if they became too importunate, or if you should presume to take advantage of the humble position in which you found her. She was not alarmed at the sentiments with which you might inspire her, and persuaded that her virtue was sufficient to guarantee her against the snares of love, she attributed her sensations to a simple curiosity to ascertain if there were still upon the earth men capable of loving virtue unembellished by exterior ornament, which rendered it more brilliant and respectable to vulgar souls than its own intrinsic merit, and frequently by their fatal attraction, obtain the reputation of virtue for the most abominable vices. Under this illusion, far from retreating to our common asylum, as she had at first proposed, she chose to inhabit a little cottage she had raised for herself in the solitude in which you met her, accompanied by a phantom representing her mother, these two persons appeared to live there upon the produce of a pretended flock that had no fear of the wolves, being in fact genie in that form. It was in that cottage she received your attentions, which produced all the effect you could desire. She could not resist the offer you made her of your crown. You know now the extent of the obligations you were under to her at a time when you imagined she owed everything to you, and were satisfied to remain in that error. What I now tell you is a positive proof that ambition had no share in the consent she accorded to your wishes. You are aware that we look upon the greatest kingdoms but as gifts which we can bestow on any one at our pleasure. But she appreciated your generous behaviour and esteeming herself happy in uniting herself to so excellent a man. She rashly entered into that engagement without reflecting on the danger which she thereby incurred. For our laws expressly prohibit our union with those who have not as much power as ourselves, more especially when we have not arrived at that age when we are privileged to exercise our authority over others and enjoy the right of presiding in our turn. Previous to that time, we are subordinate to our elders, and that we may not abuse our power, we have only the liberty of disposing of our hands in favour of some spirit or sage, whose knowledge is at least equal to our own. It is true that after that period we are free to form what alliance we please, but it is seldom that we avail ourselves of that right, and never without scandal to our order. Those who do are generally old fairies, who almost always pay dearly for their folly, for they marry young men who despise them, and although they are not punished as criminals, they are sufficiently punished by the bad conduct of their husbands, on whom they are not permitted to avenge themselves. It is the only penalty imposed upon them, the disagreements which almost inevitably followed the indiscretion they have committed, takes from them the desire of revealing to those profane persons from whom they expected respect and attention, the great secrets of art. My sister, however, was not placed in either of these positions, endowed with every charm that could inspire affection. She was not of the required age, but she consulted only her love. She flattered herself she could keep her marriage a secret. She succeeded in so doing for a short time. We rarely make inquiries about those who are absent. Each is occupied with her own affairs, and we fly through the world, doing good or ill, according to our inclinations, without being obliged at our return to account for our actions 
unless we have been guilty of some act which causes us to be talked about, or that some beneficent fairy, moved by the unjust percussion of some unfortunate mortal, lays a complaint against the offender. In short, there must arise some unforeseen event to occasion us to consult the general book in which all we do is written at the same instant without the aid of hand. Saving these occasions, we have only to appear in the general assembly three times in the year, and as we travel very swiftly, the affair does not occupy more than a couple of hours. My sister was obliged to give light to the throne, such is our phrase, for the performance of that duty. On such occasions, she arranged for you a hunting party at some distance, or a journey of pleasure, and after your departure she feigned some indisposition to remain alone in her cabinet, or that she had letters to write, or that she wished to repose. Neither in the palace nor amongst us was there any suspicion of that which it was so much her interest to conceal. This mystery, however, was not one for me. The consequences were dangerous, and I warned her of them. But she loved you too much to repent the steps she had taken. Desiring even to justify it in my eyes, she insisted that I should pay you a visit. Without flattering you, I confess that if the sight of you did not compel me entirely to excuse her weaknesses, it at least diminished considerably my surprise at it, and increased the zeal with which I laboured to keep it a secret. Her dissimulation was successful for two years, but at length she betrayed herself. You are obliged to confer a certain number of favours on the world generally, and to return an account of them. When my sister gave in hers, it appeared that she had limited her excursions and her benefits to the confines of the fortunate island. Several of our ill-natured fairies blamed this conduct, and our queen, in consequence, demanded of her why she had restricted her benevolence to this small corner of the earth, when she could not be ignorant that a young fairy was bound to travel far and wide and manifest to the universe at large our pleasure and our power. As this was no new regulation, my sister could not murmur at the enforcement of it, nor find a pretext for objecting to obey it. She promised, therefore, to do so, but her impatience to see you again, the fear of her absence being discovered at the palace, the impossibility of acting secretly on a throne, did not permit her to absent herself long enough and often enough to fulfil her promise, and at the next assembly she could hardly prove that she had been out of the fortunate island for a quarter of an hour. Our queen, greatly displeased with her, threatened to destroy that island, and so prevent her continuing to violate our laws. This threat agitated her so greatly that the least sharp-sighted fairy could see to what a point she carried her interest for that fatal island. And the wicked fairy, who turned the prince here present into a frightful monster, was convinced by her confusion that on opening the great book she should find in it an important entry which would afford some exercise to her propensities for mischief. It is there, she exclaimed, that the truth will appear, and that we shall learn what has really been her occupation. And with these words, she opened the volume before the whole assembly, and read the details of all that had taken place during the last two years in a loud and distinct voice. All the fairies made an extraordinary uproar on hearing of this degrading alliance, and overwhelmed my wretched sister with the most cruel reproaches. She was degraded from our order and condemned to remain a prisoner amongst us. 
if her punishment had consisted of the first penalty only, she would have consoled herself. But the second sentence, far more terrible, made her feel all the rigour of both. The loss of her dignity little affected her, but loving you fondly, she begged with tears in her eyes that they would be satisfied with degrading her and not deprive her of the pleasure of living a simple mortal with her husband and her daughter. Her tears and supplications touched the hearts of the younger judges, and I felt from the murmur that aroused that if the votes had been collected at that instant, she would certainly have escaped with the reprimand. But one of the eldest, who from her extreme decrepitude had obtained amongst us the name of the mother of the seasons, did not give the queen time to speak and admit that pity had touched her heart as well as the others. There is no excuse for this crime, cried the detestable old creature in her cracked voice. If it is permitted to go unpunished, we shall be daily exposed to similar insults. The honour of our order is absolutely involved in it. This miserable being, attached to earth, does not regret the loss of a rank, which elevated her a hundred degrees higher above monarchs than they are above their subjects. She tells us that her affections, her fears, and her wishes all turn upon her unworthy family. It is through them we must punish her. Let her husband deplore her. Let her daughter, the shameful fruit of her illegal marriage, become the bride of a monster to expiate the folly of a mother who could allow herself to be captivated by the frail and contemptible beauty of a mortal. This cruel speech revived the severity of many who had been previously inclined to mercy, those who continued to pity her being too few to offer any opposition. The sentence was approved of in its integrity, and our queen herself, whose features had indicated a feeling of compassion, resuming their severity, confirmed the majority of votes in favour of the motion of the ill-natured old fairy. My sister, however, in her endeavours to obtain a revocation of this cruel decree, to propitiate her judges and to excuse her marriage, had drawn so charming a portrait of you that it inflamed the heart of the fairy governess of the prince she who had opened the great volume but this dawning passion only served to increase the hatred which that wicked fairy already bore to your unfortunate wife unable to resist her desire to see you she concealed her passion under the colour of a pretext that she was anxious to ascertain if you deserved that a fairy should make such a sacrifice for you as my sister had done, and she had obtained the sanction of the assembly to her guardianship of the prince, she could not have ventured to quit him for any length of time if the ingenuity of love had not inspired her with the idea of placing a protecting genius and two inferior and invisible fairies to watch over him in her absence. After taking this precaution, there was nothing to prevent her following her inclination, which speedily carried her to the fortunate island. In the meanwhile, the women and officers of the imprisoned queen, surprised that she did not come out of her private cabinet, became alarmed. The express orders she had given them not to disturb her induced them to pass the night without knocking at the door. But impatient, at last taking place of all other considerations, they knocked loudly, and no one answering. They forced the doors, under the impression that some accident had happened to her. Although they had prepared themselves for the worst, they were not the least astonished at perceiving no trace of her. 
They called her, they hunted for her in vain. They could discover nothing to appease the despair into which her disappearance had plunged them. They imagined a thousand reasons for it, each more absurd than the other. They could not suspect her evasion to be voluntarily. She was all-powerful in your kingdom. The sovereign jurisdiction you had confided to her was not disputed by any one. Everybody obeyed her cheerfully. The affection you had for each other, that which she entertained for her daughter and for her subjects, who adored her, prevented them from supposing she had fled. Where could she go to be more happy? On the other hand, what man would have dared to carry off a queen from the midst of her own guards and the center of her own palace? Such a ravisher must have left some indication of the road he had taken. The disaster was certain, although the causes of it were unknown. There was another evil to dread, namely the feelings with which you would receive this fatal news. The innocence of those who were responsible for the safety of the queen's person by no means satisfied them that they should not feel the effects of your wrath. They felt they must either fly the kingdom and thereby appear guilty of a crime they had not committed, or they must find some means of hiding this misfortune from you. After long deliberation, they could imagine no other than that of persuading you the queen was dead, and this plan they put instantly into execution. They sent off a courier to inform you that she had been suddenly taken ill. A second followed a few hours afterward, bearing the news of her death. In order to prevent your love inducing you to return post haste to court, your appearance would have deranged all the measures they had taken for general security. They paid to the supposed defunct all the funeral honours due to her rank, pure affection, and the sorrow of a people who adored her, and who wept her loss as sincerely as yourself. This cruel adventure was always kept a profound secret from you, although it was known to every other inhabitant of the Fortune Island. The first astonishment had given publicity to the whole affair. The affliction you felt at this loss was proportionate to your love. You found no consolation except in the innocent caresses of your infinite daughter, whom you sent for to be with you. You determined never again to be separated from her. She was charming and presented you continually with a living portrait of the queen, her mother, the hostile fairy who had been the original cause of all this trouble by opening the great book in which she discovered my sister's marriage, had not come to see you without paying the price of her curiosity. Your appearance had produced the same effect upon her heart as it had previously done on that of your wife and instead of this experience inducing her to excuse my sister, she ardently desired to commit the same fault, hovering about you invisibly. She could not resolve to quit you. Beholding you inconsolable, she had no hope of success, and fearing to add the shame of your refusal to the pain of disappointment, she did not dare make herself known to you. On the other hand, supposing she did appear, she imagined that by skilful manoeuvring she might accustom you to see her, and perhaps in time induce you to love her. But to effect this, she must be introduced to you, and after much pondering to find some decorous way of presenting herself, she hit on one. There was a neighboring queen who had been driven out of her dominions by a Zerber, who had murdered her husband. This unhappy princess was raging the world to find an asylum and an avenger. The fairy carried her off and having disposed her in a safe place, 
put her to sleep and assumed her form, you beheld, sire, that disguised fairy fling herself at your feet and implore your protection and assistance to punish the assassin of a husband whom she professed she regretted as deeply as you did your queen. She protested that her love for him alone impelled her to this course, and that she renounced with all her heart a crown which she offered to him who should avenge her dear husband. The unhappy pity each other. You interested yourself in her misfortunes the more readily for that she wept the loss of her beloved spouse, and that mingling her tears with yours, she talked to you incessantly of the queen. You gave her your protection, and lost no time in re-establishing her authority in the kingdom she pretended to. By punishing the rebels and the usurper, she seemed to desire, but she would neither return to it nor quit you. She implored you for her own security to govern the kingdom in her name, as you were too generous to accept it as a gift from her, and to permit her to reside at your court. You could not refuse her this new favour. She appeared to be necessary to you for the education of your daughter, for the cunning fairy knew well enough that child was the sole object of your affection. She feigned an exceeding fondness for her, and had her continually in her arms. Anticipating the request you were about to make to her, she earnestly begged to be permitted to take charge of her education, saying that she would have no heir but that dear child, whom she looked on as her own, and who was the only being she loved in the world, because she said she reminded her of a daughter she had had by her husband, and who perished along with him. The proposal appeared to you so advantageous that you did not hesitate to entrust the princess to her care, and to give her full authority over her. She acquitted herself of her duties to perfection, and by her talent and her affection obtained your implicit confidence and your love as for a tender sister. This was not sufficient for her. All her anxiety was but to become your wife. She neglected nothing to gain this end, but even had you never been the husband of the most beautiful of fairies, she was not formed to inspire you with love. The shape she had assumed could not bear comparison with hers into whose place she would have stolen. It was extremely ugly, and being naturally so herself, she had only the power of appearing beautiful one day in the year. The knowledge of this discouraging fact convinced her that to succeed she must have recourse to other charms than those of beauty. She intrigued secretly to oblige the people and the nobility to petition you to take another wife, and to point her out to you as the desirable person. But certain ambiguous conversations she had held with you in order to sound your inclinations enables you easily to discover the origin of the pressing solicitations with which you were importuned. You declared positively that you would not hear of giving a stepmother to your daughter, nor lower her position by making her subordinate to a queen, from that which she held as the highest person next to yourself in the kingdom, and the acknowledged heir to your throne. You also gave the false queen to understand that you should feel obliged by her returning to her own dominions immediately and without ado, and promised her that when she was settled, there you would render her all the services she could expect from a faithful friend and a generous neighbor. But you did not conceal from her that if she did not take this course willingly, she ran the risk of being compelled to do so. The invincible obstacle you then opposed to her love 
threw her into a terrific rage, but she affected so much indifference about the matter that she succeeded in persuading you that her attempt was caused by ambition and the fear that eventually you might take possession of her dominions, preferring notwithstanding the earnestness with which she had appeared to offer them to you, to let you believe she was insincere in that case, rather than you should suspect her real sentiments. Her fury was not less violent because it was suppressed. Not doubting that it was beauty, who, more powerful in your heart than policy, caused you to reject the opportunity of increasing your empire in so glorious a manner, she conceived for her a hatred as violent as that which she felt for your wife, and resolved to get rid of her, fully believing that if she were dead, your subjects, renewing their remonstrances, would compel you to change your state in order to leave a successor to the throne. The good soul was anything but of an age to present you with one, but that she cared little about. The queen, whose resemblance she had assumed, was still young enough to have many children, and her ugliness was no obstacle to a royal and political alliance. Notwithstanding the official declaration you had made, it was thought that if your daughter died, you would yield to the continual representations of your council. It was believed also that your choice would fall upon this pretended queen, and that idea surrounded her with numberless parasites. It was her design, therefore, by the aid of one of her flatterers, whose wife was as base as her husband and as wicked as she was herself to make away with your daughter she had appointed this woman governess to the little princess these wretches settled between them that they would smother her and report that she had died suddenly but for more security, they decided to commit this murder in the neighboring forest so that nobody could surprise them in the execution of this barbarous deed. They counted on no one having the slightest knowledge of it, and that it would be impossible to blame them for not having thought for assistance before she expired having the legitimate excuse that they were too far from any. The husband of the governess proposed to go in search of aid as soon as the child was dead, and that no suspicion might be awakened. He was to appear surprised at finding it too late when he returned to the spot where he had left this tender victim of their fury, and he also rehearsed the sorrow and consternation he was to affect. When my wretched sister saw herself deprived of her power and condemned to a cruel imprisonment, she requested me to console you and to watch over the safety of her child. It was unnecessary for her to take that precaution. The tie which unites us and the pity I felt for her would have sufficed to ensure you my protection and her entreaties could not increase the zeal with which I hastened to fulfil her decrees. I saw you as often as I could, and as much as prudence permitted me, without incurring the risk of arousing the suspicious of our enemy, who would have denounced me as a fairy in whom sisterly affection prevailed over the honour of her order, and who protected a guilty race. I neglected nothing to convince all the fairies that I had abandoned my sister to her unhappy fate, and by so doing trusted to be more at liberty to serve her. As I watched every movement of your perfidious admirer, not only with my own eyes, but those of a genie, who were my servant, her horrible intentions were not unknown to me. I could not oppose her by open force, 
and though it would have been easy for me to annihilate those into whose hands she had delivered the little innocent, prudence restricted me, for had I carried off your daughter, the malignant fairy would have retaken her from me, without its being possible for me to defend her. It is a law amongst us that we must be a thousand years old before we can dispute the power of the ancient fairies, or at any rate, we must have become serpents. The perils which accompany the latter condition cause us to call it the terrible act. The bravest amongst us shudder at the thought of undertaking it. We hesitate a long time before we can resolve to expose ourselves to its consequences, and without the urgent motive of hatred, love, or vengeance, there are few who do not prefer waiting for time to make them elders than to acquire their privilege by that dangerous transformation in which the greater number are destroyed. I was in this position. I wanted ten years of the thousand, and I had no resource but in artifice. I employed it successfully. I took the form of a monstrous she-bear, and hiding myself in the forest, selected for the execution of this detestable deed. When the wretches arrived to fulfil the barbarous order they had received, I flung myself upon the woman who had the child in her arms, and who had already placed her hand on its mouth. Her fright made her drop the precious burden, but she was not allowed to escape so easily. The horror I felt at her unnatural conduct inspired me with the ferocity of the brute I had assumed the form of. I strangled her, as well as the traitor who accompanied her, and I carried off Beauty, after having rapidly stripped off her clothes and dyed them with the blood of her enemies. I scattered them also about the forest, taking the precaution to tear them in several places, so that they should not suspect the princess had escaped and I withdrew, delighted at having succeeded so completely. The fairy believed her object had been attained. The death of her two accomplices was an advantage to her. She was the mistress of her secret, and the fate they had met with was but what she had herself destined them to. In recompense of their guilty services, another circumstance, was also favourable to her. Some shepherds who had seen this affair from a distance ran for assistance, which arrived just in time to see the infamous wretches expire and prevent the possibility of suspicion that she had any part in it. End of section 24Section 25 of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Beauty and the Beast by Madame de Villeneuve. Translated by James Lachey. Part 7. The same circumstances were equally favourable to my enterprise. The wicked fairy was fully convinced as the people by them. The event was so natural that she never doubted it. She did not even condescend to exert her skill to satisfy herself of the fact. I was delighted at her fancied security. I should not have been the strongest had she attempted to recover little beauty because, in addition to the reasons which made her my superior and which I have explained to you, she possessed the advantage of having received that child from you. You had deputed to her your authority, which you alone could reassume, 
and short of your wresting yourself out of her hands, nothing could interfere with the control she had a right to exercise over the princess till she was married. Preserved from this anxiety, I found myself overwhelmed by another on recollecting that the mother of the seasons had condemned my niece to marry a monster, but she was then not three years old, and I flattered myself I should be able, by study, to discover some expedient to prevent this curse being fulfilled to the letter, and to evade it by some equivocation. I had plenty of time to ponder on it, and my first care was, therefore, only to find some spot where I could place my precious charge in safety. Profound secrecy was absolutely necessary to me. I dared not place her in a castle, nor exercise for her benefit any of the magnificent wonders of our art. Our enemy would have noticed it. It would have awakened an anxiety the consequences of which would have been fatal to us. I thought it better to assume an humble garb and confine the infant to the care of the first person I met with, who appeared to me to be an honest man, and under whose roof I could promise myself she would enjoy the comforts of life. Chance soon favoured my intentions. I found what suited me exactly. It was a small house in a village, the door of which was open. I entered this cottage, which appeared to me that of a peasant in easy circumstances. I saw by the light of a lamp three country women asleep beside a cradle, which I concluded contained a baby. The cradle did not at all correspond with the general simplicity of the apartment. Everything about it was sumptuous. I imagined that its little occupant was ill, and that the deep sleep into which its nurses had fallen was the consequence of long watching over it. I approached silently, with the intention of curing the infant, and anticipated with pleasure the surprise of these women on awaking to find their invalid restored to health without knowing what to attribute it to. I was about to take the child out of the cradle in order to breathe health into it, but my good intentions were vain. It expired at the instant I touched it. I immediately conceived the idea of taking advantage of this melancholy event, and substituting my niece for the dead child, which, by good fortune, was also a girl. I lost no time in making the exchange, and bearing away the lifeless infant, buried it carefully. I then returned to the house, at the door of which I knocked long and loudly to awaken the sleepers. I told them, feigning a provincial dialect, that I was a stranger to those parts who was in want of a night's lodging. They good-naturally offered me one, and then went to look at their nursling, whom they found quietly asleep, with all the appearance of being in perfect health. They were astonished and delighted, not dreaming of the deception I had practised upon them. They informed me that the child was the daughter of a rich merchant, that one of their party had been her nurse, and after having weaned her, had restored her to her parents. But the child, having fallen ill in her father's house, had been sent back to the country in hope that the change of air would be of service to her. They added, with satisfied countenances, that the experiment had succeeded and produced a better effect than all the remedies which had been restored to previous to its adoption. They determined to carry her back to her father as soon as it was daylight, in order to afford him, as early as possible, 
the gratification he would derive from her restoration, for conducing to which also they expected to receive a liberal reward, as the child was his particular favourite, although the youngest of eleven. At sunrise they set out, and I feigned to continue my journey, congratulating myself on having so well provided for my niece's safety. To ensure this object more completely, and induce the supposed father still more to attach himself to the little girl, I assumed the form of one of those women who go about telling fortunes, and arriving at the merchant's door, just as the nurses reached it with the child, I followed them into the house. He received them with delight, and taking the little girl in his arms, became the dupe of his parental affection, and fancied that the emotions simply caused by his kindly disposition were the mysterious workings of nature at the sight of his offspring. I seized this opportunity of increasing the interest he believed he had in the child. Look well upon this little one, my good gentleman, said I in the usual language of the class to which my dress I appeared to belong. She will be a great honour to thy family. She will bring thee immense wealth and save thy life and that of thy children. She will be so beautiful so beautiful that she will be called beauty by all who behold her as a reward for my prediction he gave me a piece of gold and i withdrew perfectly satisfied i had no longer any reason for residing with the race of adam to profit by my leisure i returned to fairyland resolving to remain in it some time I passed my days there quietly in consoling my sister, in giving her news of her dear daughter, and in assuring her that, far from forgetting her, you cherished her memory as fondly as you had formerly herself. Such, great king, was our situation, whilst you were suffering under the fresh calamity which had deprived you of your child, and renewed all the affliction you had felt at the loss of her mother. Although you could not positively accuse the person to whom you had confided the infant of being the willful cause of the accident, it was still impossible for you not to look upon her with an evil eye. For though it did not appear that she was guilty of intentional mischief, it was certainly through her neglecting to see that the young princess was properly attended and protected that the event had proved fatal after the first paroxysms of your grief had subsided she flattered herself that no obstacle would arise to prevent your espousing her she caused her emissaries to renew the proposal to you but she was undeceived and her mortification was excessive when you declared that not only were your intentions unchanged respecting a second marriage, but that even could anything alter your determination, it would never be in her favour. To this declaration you added a positive order for her to quit the kingdom immediately. Her presence continually reminded you of your child and renewed your affliction such was the reason you adduced for this step but your principal object was to put an end to the intrigues she was constantly carrying on in order to gain her end she was furious but she was obliged to obey without being able to avenge herself i had persuaded one of our ancient fairies to protect you her power was considerable for she joined to her age the advantage of having been four times a serpent in proportion to the excessive peril incurred by that process are the honours and powers attached to it this fairy out of considerations for me 
took you under her protection, and put it out of the power of your indignant lover to do you any mischief. This disappointment was fortunate for the queen, whose form she had assumed. She awoke her from her magic slumber, and concealing from her the criminal use she had made of her features, placed her conduct in the best light before her. She expatiated on the value of her intercession with the king, and on the trouble she had saved her, and gave her the best advice she could, how to maintain herself for the future in her proper person. It was then to console herself for your indifference. The fairy returned to the young prince and resumed her care of him. She became too fond of him, and not being able to make herself beloved, she caused him to suffer that terrible effect of her fury. In the meanwhile, I had insensibly arrived at the privileged age, and my power was increased, but my desire to serve my sister and yourself induced me to feel that still I had not sufficient. My sincere friendship blinding me to the perils of the terrible act, I resolved to undertake it. I became a serpent and passed fortunately through the ordeal. I was then in a position to act openly in favour of those who were persecuted by my malicious companions. If I cannot at all times entirely dissolve their fatal spells, I can at least counteract them by my skill and by my counsels. My niece was amongst the number of those whom I could not completely favour, not daring to discover all the interest I took in her. It appeared to me that the best thing I could do was to allow her still to pass as the merchant's daughter. I visited her under various forms, and always returned satisfied. Her virtue and beauty equaled her good sense. At the age of fourteen, she had already given proof of her great fortitude during the changes of fortune which had befallen her supposed father. I was delighted to find that the most cruel reverses had not been able to affect her tranquillity. On the contrary, by her cheerfulness, by the charm of her conversation, she had succeeded in restoring it to the hearts of her father and her brothers. And I rejoiced to observe also that her sentiments were worthy of her birth. These pleasant reflections were, however, mingled with much bitterness when I remembered that with so many perfections she was destined to be the wife of a monster. I toiled, I studied night and day to find some means of saving her from so great a misfortune, and was in despair at finding none. This anxiety did not prevent me, however, from paying occasional visits to you. Your wife, who was deprived of that liberty, implored me incessantly to go and see you, and, notwithstanding the protection of our friend, her affectionate heart was continually alarmed about you, and persuaded her that the instant I lost sight of you would be the last of your life and in which you would be sacrificed to the fury of our enemy. This fear possessed her so strongly that she scarcely gave me a moment's rest. No sooner did I bring her news of you than she supplicated me so earnestly to return to you that it was impossible to refuse her. Compassionating her anxiety and more desirous to end it, than to save myself the trouble it gave me. I employed against my cruel companion the same weapons she had made use of against you. I proceeded to open the great book. By good fortune, it was at the very moment 
she was holding that conversation with the queen and prince, which terminated in his transformation. I lost not a word of it, and my rapture was extreme at finding that, in seeking to assure her vengeance, she neutralized it, without knowing it. The mischief which the mother of the seasons had done us in dooming beauty to be the bride of a monster. To crown our happiness, she added conditions so advantageous that it almost seemed as if she made them on purpose to oblige me, for she thereby furnished my sister's daughter with an opportunity of proving that she was worthy of being the issue of the purest of fairy blood. The slightest sign or gesture expresses amongst us as much as it would take an ordinary mortal three days to explain. I uttered but one contemptuous word. It was enough to inform the assembly that our enemy had pronounced her own sentence in that which she had caused ten years before to be passed upon your wife. At the age of the latter, the weaknesses of love was more natural than at the advanced period of existence of a fairy of the highest order. I spoke of the base and wicked actions which had accompanied that superannuated passion. I urged that if so many infamous acts were allowed to pass unpunished, mortals would be justified in saying that fairies existed in the world but to dishonor nature and afflict the human race. Presenting the book to them, I condensed this abrupt oration in the single word, Behold! It was not the less powerful in its effect. There were present also friends of mine, both young and old, who treated the amorous fury as she deserved. She had not succeeded in becoming your wife, and to that disgrace was now added degradation from her order and imprisonment, as in the case of the Queen of the Happy Island. This council was held whilst she was with you, madam, and your son. As soon as she appeared amongst us, the result was communicated to her, I had the pleasure to be present, after which, closing the book, I descended rapidly from the middle region of air in which our empire is situated, to compact the effect of the despair to which you were ready to abandon yourselves. I performed my journey in as short a space of time as I had occupied with my laconical address. I arrived soon enough to promise you my assistance. All sorts of reasons combined to invite me. Your virtues, your misfortunes, said the fairy, turning to the prince. The advantages they offered to beauty made me see in you the monster that suited me. You appear to me worthy of each other, and I felt convinced that when you become acquainted, your hearts would do each other mutual justice. You know, she continued, addressing the queen, what I have since done to attain my object, and by what means I obliged beauty to come to this palace, where the sight of the prince and her interviews with him, in the dreams I conjured up for her, had the effect I desired. They kindled love in her heart without diminishing her virtue or weakening the sense of duty and gratitude which attached her to the monster. In short, I have happily brought my scheme to perfection. Yes, prince, pursued it the fairy. You have no longer anything to fear from your enemy. She is stripped of her power and will never again be able to injure you by other spells. You have exactly fulfilled the conditions she imposed on you. Had you not done so, you would have been still bound by them, notwithstanding her eternal degradation. 
you have made yourself beloved without the aid of your rank or your intelligence, and you, Beauty, are equally relieved from the curse pronounced upon you by the mother of the season. You cheerfully accepted a monster for your husband. She has nothing more to exact. All now tends to your happiness. The fairy ceased speaking, and the king threw himself at her feet. Great fairy, he exclaimed, how can I thank you for all the favours you have heaved on my family, my gratitude for the benefits you have bestowed on us, far exceeds my power of expression. But, my august sister, added he, that title encourages me to ask more favours, for, despite the obligations I am already under to you, I cannot avoid confessing to you that I shall never be truly happy so long as I am deprived of the presence of my beloved fairy queen. This account of what she has done and what she has suffered for me would increase my love and affliction were either of them capable of being augmented. Ah, oh, madam, he added, can you not? crown all your benefactions by enabling me to behold her? The question was useless. If the fairy had had the power to have afforded him that gratification, she was too willing to have waited for the request. But she could not alter what the council of the fairies had decreed. The young queen, being a prisoner in the middle regions of air, there was not the shadow of a chance of his being enabled to see her, and the fairy was about to explain this to him kindly, and to exhort him to await patiently some unforeseen event by which she might take advantage, when an enchanting melody stole upon their ears and interrupted her. The king, his daughter, the queen, and the prince were in excesses, but the fairy experienced another sort of surprise. Such music indicated the triumph of some fairy. She could not imagine what fairy had achieved a victory. Her fears suggested that it was the old one, or the mother of the seasons, who in her absence had obtained the former her liberty or the latter permission to persecute the lovers afresh. She was in this perplexity when it was agreeably ended by the presence of her fairy sister, the queen of the happy island, who suddenly appeared in the center of that charming group. She was no less lovely than when the king, her husband, lost her. The monarch, who instantly recognized her, making the respect he owed her, yield to the love he had cherished for her, embrace her with such transports of joy that the queen herself was surprised at them. The fairy, her sister, could not imagine to what fortunate miracle she was indebted for her liberty, but the royal fairy informed her that she owned her happiness solely to her own courage which had impelled her to hazard her own existence to preserve another's. You are aware, said she to the fairy, that the daughter of our queen was received into the order at her birth, that her father was not sublunary being, but the sage Amdabic, whose alliance is an honour to the fairy race, and whose sublime knowledge invests him with much higher powers. Notwithstanding this, however, it was imperative for his daughter to become a servant at the end of her first hundred years. The fatal period arrived, and our queen, as tender a mother, and as anxious respecting the fate of this dear infant as any ordinary parent could be, could not resolve to expose her to the many chances of destruction in that shape. 
the misfortunes of those who had perished being but too notorious for her not to feel the greatest alarm my wretched situation depriving me of all hope of again beholding my affectionate husband and my lovely daughter i had conceived a perfect disgust for a life which i was doomed to pass apart from them without the least hesitation therefore i offered to become a crawling reptile in the place of the young fairy i saw with delight a certain prompt and honourable mode of delivering myself from all the miseries with which i was overwhelmed by death or by a glorious emancipation which would render me mistress of my own actions and thereby enable me to rejoin my husband our queen hesitated as little to accept this offer so gratifying to her maternal affection as i did to make it she embraced me a hundred times and promised to restore me to liberty unconditionally and re-establish me in all my privileges if i was fortunate enough to pass unharmed through that perilous enterprise i did do so and the fruit of my labours was enjoyed by the young fairy for whom i had been the substitute the success of my first trial encouraged me to make a second for my own benefit i underwent the transformation anew and was equally fortunate this last act made me an elder and consequently independent i was not long in profiting by my liberty and flying hither to rejoin a family so dear to me as soon as the fairy had finished her narrative the embraces were renewed by her affectionate auditors it was a charming confusion in which each caressed the other almost without knowing what they were about beauty particularly enchanted at appertaining to such an illustrious family and no longer fearing to degrade the prince her cousin by causing him to form an alliance beneath him but although transported by the excess of her happiness she did not forget the worthy man whom she had formerly believed to be her father she recalled to her fairy aunt the promise she had made to her that he and his children should have the honour of being present at her marriage she was still speaking to her on this subject when they saw from the window sixteen persons on horseback most of whom had hunting horns and appeared in considerable confusion their disorder evidently aroused from their horses having ran away with them beauty instantly recognised them as the six sons of the worthy merchant the five daughters and their five lovers everybody but the fairy was surprised at this abrupt entrance those who made it were not less so at finding themselves carried by the speed of their unmanageable horses into a palace totally unknown to them this is the way it happened they were all out hunting when their horses suddenly uniting themselves as in one squadron galloped off with them at such speed to the palace that all their efforts to stop them were perfectly useless beauty thoughtless of her present dignity hastened to receive and reassure them she embraced them all kindly the good man himself next appeared but not in the same disorder a horse had neighed and scratched at his door he had no doubt that it came to seek him by order of his dear daughter he mounted him without fear and perfectly satisfied as to whither the seed would bear him he was not at all surprised to find himself in the courtyard of a palace which he now saw for the third time and to which he felt convinced he had been conducted to witness the marriage of beauty and the beast the moment he perceived her he ran to her with open arms blessing the happy moment that presented her again to his sight and heaping benedictions on the generous beast 
who had permitted him to return. He looked about for him in every direction to offer him his most humble thanks for all the favours he had heaved on his family, and particularly on his youngest daughter. He was vexed at not seeing him, and began to apprehend that his conjectures were enormous. Still, the presence of all his children seemed to support the idea he had formed, as they would scarcely have been all assembled in that spot if some solemn ceremony such as that marriage were not to be celebrated. These reflections which the good man made to himself did not prevent him from pressing beauty fondly in his arms and bathing her cheek with tears of joy after allowing due time for this first expression of his feelings. Enough, good man, said the fairy. You have sufficiently caressed this princess. It is time that ceasing to regard her as a father, you should learn that that title does not appertain to you, and that you must now do her homage as your sovereign. She is the princess of the happy island, daughter of the king and queen whom you see before you. She is about to become the wife of this prince. Here stands the prince's mother, sister of the king. I am a fairy, her friend and the aunt of beauty. As to the prince, added the fairy, observing the expression of the good man's face, he is better known to you than you imagine, but he is much altered since you last saw him. In a word, he was the beast himself. The father and his sons were enchanted at these wonderful tidings, while the sisters felt a painful jealousy, but they endeavoured to conceal it under the mask of gratification, which deceived no one. The others, however, feigned to believe them sincere. As to the lovers who had been rendered inconstant by the hope of possessing beauty, and who had only returned to their first attachment, on their despairing to obtain her, they knew not what to think. The merchant could not help weeping without being able to tell whether his tears were caused by the pleasure of seeing the happiness of beauty, or by the sorrow of losing so perfect a daughter. His sons were agitated by similar feelings. Beauty, extremely affected by this evidence of their love, entreated those on whom she now depended, as well as the prince, her future husband, to permit her to reward such tender attachment. Her entreaty testified the goodness of her heart too sincerely not to be listened to. They were laden with bounties, and by permission of the king, the prince, and the queen, Beauty continued to call them by the tender names of father, brothers, and even sisters, though she was not ignorant that the latter were as little so in heart as they were in blood. She desired they would all in return call her by the name they were wont to do when they believed her to be a member of their family. The old man and his children were appointed to offices in the court of beauty, and enjoyed the pleasure of living continually near her, in a station sufficiently exalted to be generally respected. The lovers of her sisters, whose passion for beauty might easily have been revived, if they had not known it would be useless, thought themselves too happy in being united to the good man's daughters, and becoming allied to persons for whom beauty retained so much good will. All those she desired to be present at her wedding having arrived, the celebration of it was no longer delayed. The festivities lasted many days and ended at length only because the fairy aunt of the young bride pointed out to them the propriety of leaving that beautiful retreat and returning to their dominions to show themselves to their subjects. It was quite time she should recall their kingdom to their recollection and the indispensable duties 
which demanded their presence, enraptured with the scenes around them, entranced by the pleasure of loving and expressing their love to each other, they had entirely forgotten their royal state and the cares that attend it. The newly married pair indeed proposed to the fairy that they should abdicate and resign their power into the hands of anyone she should select, but that wise being represented to them clearly that they were under as great an obligation to fulfil the destiny which had confided to them the government of a nation as that nation was to preserve for them an unshaken loyalty. They yielded to these just remonstrances, but the prince and beauty stipulated that they should be allowed occasionally to visit that spot and cast aside for a while the cares inseparable from their station, and that they should be awaited on by the invisible genie or the animals who had attended them during the preceding years they availed themselves as often as possible of this liberty. Their presence seemed to embellish the spot. All were eager to please them. The genie awaited their visits with impatience and received them with joy, testifying in a hundred ways the delight their return afforded them. The fairy, whose foresight neglected nothing, gave them a chariot drawn by twelve white stags with golden horns and hoofs like those she drove herself the speed of these animals was almost greater than that of thought and drawn by them you could easily make the tour of the world in two hours by these means they lost no time in travelling they profited by every moment of leisure and went frequently in this elegant equipage to visit their father, the king of the happy island, who had grown so young again through the return of his fairy queen, that he equalled in face and form the prince, his son-in-law. He felt also equally happy, being neither less enamoured nor less eager to prove to his wife his unceasing affection, while she, on her part, responded to his love with all that tenderness which had previously been the cause of so much misfortune to her. She had been received by her subjects with transports of joy as great as those of grief which her loss had occasioned them. She had always loved them dearly, and her will being now unfettered, she proved as much by showering upon them for many centuries all the benefits they could desire. Her power, assisted by the friendship of the queen of the fairies, preserved the life, health, and youth of the king, her husband, for ages. He only ceased to exist because no mortal can live forever. The queen and the fairy, her sister, were equally attentive to beauty, her husband, the queen, his mother, the old man, and all his family, so that there never was known people who lived so long. The queen, mother of the prince, caused this marvellous history to be recorded in the archives of her kingdom and in those of the happy island, that it might be handed down to posterity. They also disseminated copies of it throughout the universe, so that the world at large might never cease to talk of the wonderful adventures of beauty and the beast. End of section 25、section、26 of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Princess Minute and King Floridor by Count de Calus. Translated by James Planchet. Princess Minute and King Floridor. 
there was once upon a time a king and queen who died young and left a very fine empire to the princess their only daughter who was then but thirteen years of age she imagined that she knew how to reign and all her good subjects persuaded themselves into the same idea without well knowing why however it is a profession which is not without its difficulties the king and queen had at least the consolation when dying of leaving the princess their daughter under the protection of a friendly fairy she was called murdaden and was a very good woman but she added to the defect of allowing herself to be prejudiced that of obstinacy in continuing so as for the little princess she was so very diminutive that they called her minute thus was this fine kingdom governed by prejudice and frivolity for the princess had never been corrected in the taste which she showed for trifles and it was for her that all these little knick-knacks were invented with which we have since been overwhelmed this princess exhibited the grandeur of her ideas by an act which i will select from a thousand such she would not retain as general of her forces nay even exiled from her court a veteran distinguished for the services which he had rendered the state and why because he had appeared in her presence with a hat bound with silver when his coat was laced with gold she thought that a man who could be guilty of such negligence at court would be also for the same reason very capable of allowing himself to be surprised by the enemy the discernment which she flattered herself as having shown in this instance and the sound judgment which the fairy distinguished in her most frivolous ideas proved the existence of a delusion which would have been enough to turn a stronger head there was near this great country a little kingdom so very small that i hardly know what to compare it to a queen mother had for a long time reigned over it in the name of prince florador but this good queen died florador who was the most affectionate son possible felt this loss acutely and always retained a feeling of gratitude for the obligations he was unto her one of the greatest was a perfect education the most perfect the most rigid as far as concerned the body which had rendered him as robust as active and the mildest with regard to his mind to which she had given both accomplishments and solidity this young prince was handsome and well formed he governed wisely without abusing his despotic power his desires were well regulated in a word he would have been an amiable person in private life his subjects adored him and the strangers who visited at the court agreed that he would have conferred happiness on the greatest empire but one thing they were not aware of was that he owed to a charming aunt a great number of his advantages she had been attached to him from his infancy at the death of the queen the good aunt was his sole consolation he took no single step without going previously to consult this aunt in a wood in the palace gardens which she had chosen as her residence he often abandoned the court and its pleasures to go and converse with her no weather prevented his presenting himself to her and however severe might be the winter she always came out of her ant-hill which was the best regulated for a hundred miles round and gave him advice full of prudence and wisdom you may easily have guessed that the pretty aunt of whom we speak was a fairy her history which dates back seven thousand years will be found brought down to the twenty-two thousandth year of the world at the four hundred and sixtieth page of the volume for that year it would therefore have been easy for this aunt to give the king whom she loved so well several kingdoms for fairies dispose of them at their own pleasure but the aunt was prudent and prudence is always guided by justice it was not that she did not heartily desire the advancement of florador but she wished him to employ no means to obtain it but those that might increase the true glory with the love of which she had inspired his heart the aunt was naturally patient she waited for an opportunity to bring to light the virtues of her pupil the conduct of minute and the prejudice of mirdaden soon furnished her with one 
they were informed that the flame of revolt was kindled in the mighty kingdom of minute when this news had been confirmed by all the newspapers the good fairy aunt desired king florador to set out attended by a simple groom to assist the queen his neighbor she gave him at parting nothing but a common sparrow a little knife which is usually called a jambette and a walnut shell my gifts said she appear mean but make yourself easy respecting them they will be of service in your need and i hope you will be satisfied with them he readily assured her of that confidence which her former favours had rendered it but just that he should place in her and having bidden her tenderly farewell he set out on his journey every inhabitant of his little kingdom regretting his departure as much as if he had been a brother a son or a bosom friend he arrived in the capital of queen minute's dominions he found it in a state of commotion as they had heard that a neighbouring king was advancing rapidly followed by a terrible army he was coming with the design of seizing the kingdom floridor learnt that the queen had retired to a delightful residence she possessed near the capital and in which she had collected all sorts of brilliant gewgaws she had however a motive for this retirement she wished to consider seriously and decide without being interrupted whether the troops which the fairy had ordered to be levied to oppose the usurper should wear blue or white cockades the queen was notwithstanding at this time twenty years of age king floridor having ascertained the road which led to this country house proceeded there with all speed his handsome face prejudiced mirdaden in his favour the compliments which he paid to the queen and her only increased the good opinion which his first appearance had inspired her with and the offer of his services was all the better received as the state was in a very embarrassed situation minute appeared to floridor to be charming from that moment the king fell desperately in love the zeal and alacrity always inseparable from that passion were displayed in his words and actions and shone in his eyes and it was with extreme care he investigated the existing position of affairs he wished to have recourse to the powers of fairyland but the blind prejudice of mir daden had induced her long before to give her wand to minute with the idea of amusing her and that princess had made such a prodigal use of it that it was worn out and had neither strength nor virtue particularly for important things floridor returned to the capital but found there neither fortifications nor munitions of war meanwhile the invader advanced nearer and nearer floridor saw only a rival in the person of the hostile king and finding no other resource he was obliged to propose to the queen to take flight offering her with pride an asylum in his dominions prudence suggested to him a line of conduct which his courage condemned but it was necessary to save an unhappy sovereign and he only made this proposition on condition of his being allowed to return and expose himself to every danger and use every effort to restore to the queen a throne which so legitimately belonged to her the moment he had placed her person in safety in his little kingdom mir daden convinced by all the king represented to her accepted the proposition but the queen only consented to depart when they promised her that the horse she was to ride should have a rose-coloured harness and floridor had agreed to present her with the sparrow which the fairy aunt had given him on his leaving her the bird was soon given but though the departure was urgent they had to wait till a harness such as the queen wished for could be procured from the city it came at length and floridor and minute with no other suite but mir daden took the road to the king's dominions floridor was enchanted at being allowed to conduct minute to his own kingdom and at believing himself to be useful to her he adored to be in love and a traveller are two things which make people exceedingly talkative floridor in announcing the limited extent of his states at which he sometimes blushed could not refrain from speaking of the obligations he owed to the good aunt when he came however to the details of their parting the walnut the little knife and the sparrow 
appeared to the queen very singular presents she was very anxious to see the walnut the king gave it to her without any scruples as soon as it was in her hand she cried heavens what do i hear she put her ear to it with the utmost attention and then said with surprise mingled with curiosity i hear very distinctly little voices of men neighing of horses trumpets in short a singular murmur this is the prettiest thing in the world she exclaimed while the king was himself occupied by that which amused her whom he loved he perceived the scouts of the revolted army close upon them and consequently ready to take them prisoners at this perilous moment by an involuntary movement he broke the walnut and out of it he saw issue thirty thousand effective men horse foot and dragoons with artillery and all the necessary munitions of war he placed himself at their head and showing a bold front to the enemy he made without ever striking a blow the most beautiful retreat in the world he took possession in this way of the mountains he found on his road and saved the queen from the hands of her rebellious subjects after this fine military manoeuvre which was not accomplished without much fatigue and alarm at the danger the queen had incurred they halted several days on the mountain but as all the country was up in arms they perceived on recommencing their march another army much more numerous than that which they had escaped and which it would have been the height of rashness to give battle to in this cruel situation the queen asked for the little knife which the aunt had given to him to use for some trifling purpose but finding that it did not cut to her fancy she threw it away saying there's a pleasant knife the moment it touched the ground it made a considerable hole in it the king was struck with the talent of his jambette and immediately cut with it deep entrenchments all around the mountain which rendered their position impregnable when this operation was finished which only occupied him the time necessary to make the circuit the sparrow he had presented to minute took wing and flew to the summit of the mountain then flapping its wings it cried in a terrible voice leave me alone to deal with them you are about to see a fine game let all descend the mountain march upon the enemy and fear nothing he was instantly obeyed and the sparrow raised the mountain as easily as if it had been a straw and traversing the air with it he let it fall upon the army of the enemy crushing no doubt the greater part of them the rest took flight and left the passage free the king who was solely occupied with the desire of seeing the queen in safety was anxious to put the horses to their speed but as the march of an army is necessarily slow he would have been glad if it had re-entered the walnut shell hardly had he formed the wish when it actually did so he put it in his pocket and they arrived in the little kingdom where the good aunt received them with every mark of sincere friendship when floridor had made every arrangement for the accommodation of minute and was satisfied that she could want for nothing in the palace he began to think of his departure and he did so more cheerfully as the good aunt assured him of her attention to all that concerned the queen during the journey he had lately performed and the short time he had passed in his own dominions he had taken the opportunity of declaring his passion to minute which she had been kind enough to approve at length he was obliged to leave her their adieus were tender and floridor set out with no other assistance but that of a letter from minute addressed to her good and faithful subjects in which she required them to obey the commands of king floridor implicitly the good aunt neither gave him the walnut nor the little knife which he had returned to her when he came back the queen only begged him to accept from her hand the sparrow which he had given her praying that he would always carry it about with him as well as a scarf of non pareil which she had herself made for him the king followed exactly the same road that he had taken in conducting the queen not only because lovers are gratified by seeing again the places which are associated in their memories with those whom they love but because it was also the shortest cut when he was near the transplanted mountain the sparrow rising in the air took it up with the same facility as before and carried it back to the spot 
which it had formerly occupied the sparrow then in that terrible voice which he knew how to assume when he wished said to those whom he found shut up under the mountain be faithful to my newt and do what king floridor shall command you in her name this singular sparrow then disappeared the mountain it seems was hollow so those who had found themselves enclosed in it were as if under a bell they had wanted for nothing during the time of their imprisonment all the soldiers and officers who saw the light of day again with the utmost pleasure ran in crowds to floridor whose handsome countenance interested them and looking upon him as a demigod they were ready to worship him the king moved by their obedience and the new vows of fidelity to the lawful queen which they took at his hands received their respects but not their adoration after having shown them the letter with which he was charged he made the army pass in review and chose from it fifty thousand of the finest men and of those to whose devotion a general success is mostly due he established in his new army a very strict discipline of which he was both the author and example and it was with these troops that he became invincible that he defied the countless forces of the usurper whom he slew with his own hand in one of the last battles and whose death restored to minute a kingdom which he had entirely lost floridor marched through all the provinces of this great state and re-established the authority of minute whom he then hastened to rejoin but what a change did he find in the character and mind of this lovely queen the counsels of the good aunt and above all love and the wish to please and be worthy of floridor had completely corrected her only fault she was ashamed of having always done little things with great assistance whilst her lover had done such great things with so little they married and lived happily ever after end of section twenty six section twenty seven of four and twenty fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Impossible Enchantment by the Count de Caelus. Translated by James Planchet. Part 1. Once upon a time there was a king who was very much beloved by his subjects, and who was equally fond of them. This monarch had a great repugnance to marriage, and what was still more astonishing, love had never made the slightest impression on his heart. His subjects, however, pressed so strongly upon him the necessity of providing for the succession to the throne, that the good king finally consented to their request. But as no woman he had as yet seen had awakened in him the faintest inclination to marry her, he resolved to seek in foreign lands that which his own had failed to present him with, and despite the severe and satirical remarks of all his countrywomen, both handsome and ugly, he set out on his travels after having duly provided for the maintenance of order and tranquillity in his dominions he would take no one with him but a single equerry a very sensible man but not particularly brilliant such companions are not always the worst upon a journey the king roamed in vain through several kingdoms using all his best endeavours to fall in love but his time not being come he retraced his road to his own dominions after two years absence and fatigue in the same state of indifference as he left them it happened however that in transversing a forest he heard a most fearful squalling of cats the worthy equerry did not know what to think of such a commencement of an adventure all the stories of sorcerers that he had ever seen came into his head as to the king he was unmoved by it courage and curiosity combined to induce him to wait and see what would follow this strange and disagreeable interruption the noise coming nearer and nearer they at length saw a hundred spanish cats rush by them through the forest you might have covered them all with a cloak so well did they run together and so perfectly were they on the scent they were closely followed by two of the largest monkeys that ever were seen they were dressed in amaranth coloured coats their boots were the prettiest and best made in the world they were mounted on two superb english bulldogs and rode at full speed blowing little toy trumpets 
The king, surprised at such a sight, gazed at them with great attention. When a score of tiny dwarfs appeared, some mounted on lynxes and leading relays of them, others on foot with cats in couples. They were dressed in amaranth like the huntsmen, which colour seemed to be the livery of the equipage. A moment afterwards he perceived a young female, as remarkable for her beauty as for the proud air with which she rode a large tiger, whose paces were admirable. She passed the king full gallop, without stopping or even saluting him. But though she hardly looked at him, he was enchanted with her, and his heart was gone like a flash of lightning. All in agitation he perceived a dwarf who had lagged behind the rest of the company. He addressed him with all that eagerness which the curiosity of love to obtain some information respecting the object of its admiration would naturally occasion. The dwarf informed him that the lady he had just seen was a princess Mudin, daughter of King Prudent, in whose dominions they were at that moment. He told him also that the princess was exceedingly fond of the chase, and that the pack he had seen pass was what she hunted rabbits with. The king asked nothing further except the nearest road to the court of King Prudent. The dwarf pointed it out to him, and spurred on his lynx to rejoin the hunt, and the king, with the impatience of a newborn passion, gave the spurs to his horse, and in less than two hours found himself in the capital of King Prudent's dominions. He was presented to the king and queen, who received him with open arms, the more graciously on learning his name and that of his empire. The beautiful Mutine returned from the chase shortly after this presentation. Hearing that the princess had killed two rabbits, he ventured to compliment her on so fine a day's sport, but the princess made no reply. He was rather surprised at her silence, but he was still more so when he observed that during supper she was equally taciturn. He noticed only that there were moments when she appeared about to say something, but that either King Prudent or the Queen, who never drank at the same time, immediately commenced speaking. The silence, however, did not prevent the increase of his passion for Mutine. The king retired to the handsome apartment which had been assigned to him, and his worthy equerry did not appear overjoyed when he found his royal master so deeply in love. He did not even conceal from him that he was sorry for it. "'And why are you sorry?' inquired the king. "'The princess is so beautiful. Surely she is all I could desire.' "'She is beautiful, I admit,' replied the equerry. But to be happy, something is required besides beauty. Pardon me, sire, but there is something harsh in the expression of her features. It is pride, said the king, and very becoming in so beautiful a woman. Pride or ill nature, whichever you please, but the taste she exhibits in her amusements and her choice of so many mischievous animals are to my mind convincing proofs of a cruel disposition. Moreover, the care that is taken to prevent her speaking is to me a very suspicious circumstance. The king, her father, is not called prudent for nothing. I don't fancy even her own name of Mutine. It appears to me only a softening down or a diminutive of the appellation which would truly be applied to her from the impression she has made on me, for you know better than I do that it is too common a practice to gloss over the faults of persons of her rank. The observations of the worthy equerry were sensible enough, but as objections only increase love in the hearts of all men, and particularly in those of kings, who dislike being contradicted, this monarch the very next morning demanded the hand of the princess in marriage. As the previous indifference of the king had become notorious, the triumph of the charms of Mutine was complete. Her hand was accorded to him, but on two conditions. The first, that the marriage should take place the very next morning. The second, that he should not speak to the princess until she was his wife. On this occasion, the pretext for her silence was a solemn vow she had taken in consequence of the first thing that came into their heads, and the enamoured king only saw in this circumstance the proof of a truly religious feeling. Those great precautions formed a new theme for the arguments of the equerry, but they made no more impression than the former did. The king, after listening to them, closed the conversation by saying, It has cost me a great deal of trouble to fall in love. I have done so at last. What the juice wouldst thou have? I mean to remain in love. The rest of that day, and all the following, was passed in dancing and feasting. The princess was present, and took her part in all the entertainments, without uttering a single word, and the first he heard her pronounce was the fatal, yes, which bound her to him for life. 
As soon as she was married, she threw off all restraint, and the first day did not pass without her having very liberally distributed a volley of abuse and a host of impertinences amongst her maids of honour. In short, the mildest expressions she made use of, in return for the most particular services, were characterised by rudeness and ill-temper. Even the king, her husband, was not exempted from this sort of language, but as he was very much in love, and moreover a good-natured man, he bore it all patiently. A few days after their marriage, the newly wedded pair took the road to their own kingdom, and Mutine's departure was not regretted by any one in her father's. The cordial reception King Prudent had always given to foreigners had no other motive than the hope of such a love as his daughter's charms had succeeded in inspiring, a passion which was too strong to pause for a better acquaintance with her mind and character. The worthy equerry had had too much reason for his remonstrances, and the king perceived it too late. All the time the new queen was on the road, she filled the hearts of her attendants with grief, anger, and despair. But once arrived in her kingdom, her ill-temper and ill-nature were redoubled. By the time she had been a month on her throne, her reputation was perfect. She was acknowledged unanimously as the worst queen in the world. One day that she was taking an airing on horseback in a wood near the palace, she perceived an old woman walking in the high road. She was very simply dressed. This good woman, having made her the best curtsy she could, continued her route. But the queen, who was only waiting for an occasion to give vent to her ill-humour, bade one of her pages run after the old woman and bring her back. As soon as she was in her presence, she said, Thou art very impertinent to make me no lower a curtsy. Dost thou not know I am the queen? I am more than half inclined to order my people to give thee a hundred lashes with their stirrup leathers. Madam, said the old woman, I never knew exactly what difference there was in curtsies. It is clear I had no intention of being disrespectful. How? exclaimed the queen. Does she dare to answer me? Tie her instantly to the tail of my horse. I will take her with speed to the best dancing master in the city, and he shall teach her how to make me a curtsy. The old woman begged for mercy whilst they tied her, but in vain. She even boasted of the protection of the fairies. The queen heeded the warning as little as the prayer. I care for them as little as I do for thee, she exclaimed, and wert thou even thyself a fairy, I would serve thee the same way. The old woman suffered herself patiently to be fastened to the tail of the horse, but the instant the queen would have given him the spur, he became motionless. In vain she endeavoured to stick the rowels into his side. He had become a horse of bronze. The cords which fastened the old woman changed at the same moment to garlands of flowers, and the old woman herself suddenly appeared eight feet high. Then, fixing on Mutine her fiery and disdainful eyes, she said to her, Wicked woman, unworthy of the royal title thou bearest, I desired to judge myself if thou didst deserve the bad character they give thee in the world. I am satisfied thou dost, and thou shalt soon see whether the fairies are as little to be feared as thou fanciest. So saying, the fairy Paceable, for it was she herself, whistled through her fingers, and a chariot was seen advancing, drawn by six of the most beautiful ostriches in the world, and in this chariot they recognised the fairy Grave, looking more grave even than her name. She was at that time the elder of the fairies, and presided in all cases affecting the fairy community. Her escort was composed of a dozen other fairies, mounted on crop-tailed dragons. Notwithstanding her astonishment at the appearance of the fairies, Queen Mutine retained the proud and malevolent expression which was so natural to her. When this brilliant company had descended and dismounted, the fairy Paceable related her adventure to them. The fairy Grave, who was very severe in the execution of her office, approved of Paceable's conduct, and then gave it as her opinion that the queen should be transformed into the same metal as her horse. But the fairy Paceable objected to this, and with unequalled generosity, exerted herself to moderate all the rigorous measures that were suggested for the punishment of the queen. At length, thanks to the kind fairy, she was condemned only to be her slave until she was confined, for I had forgotten to tell you that she was expecting to become a mother. This sentence, which was pronounced in full court, decreed that, on her recovery, the queen should be permitted to return to her husband, 
and that the infant she had given birth to should remain the slave of the fairy in her place. They were polite enough to announce to the king the sentence that had been passed on his wife. He was compelled to give his assent to it. What could the worthy prince have done, supposing he had objected? After this act of justice, the fairies returned each one to her own affairs. Paisible waited an instant the arrival of her equipage, which she had sent for. It was a little car made of various coloured bugles, drawn by six hinds, white as snow, with caparisons of green satin embroidered with gold. One touch of her wand changed the queen's dress into the habit of a slave. In this attire she was made to mount an obstinate mule, and to follow at a hard trot the car of the fairy. After an hour's jolting, the queen arrived at Paceable's mansion. As you may easily believe, she was in great affliction, but her pride prevented her from shedding a single tear. The fairy sent her to work in the kitchen, after giving her the name Furieuse, that of Mutine being too gentle for the wickedness she was inclined to. Furieuse, said the fairy Paceable, I have saved your life, and perhaps conscience may hereafter reproach me for it. I will not give you any heavy work to do, out of compassion for the unborn infant, who you are aware is to become my slave. I will therefore remove you from the kitchen, and set you only the task of sweeping my apartment, and combing my little dog, Christine. Furios knew there was no opposition to be made to these commands. She took, therefore, the sensible course of doing exactly as she was bid, as long as she was able. After some time she gave birth to a princess, as lovely as day, and when her health was re-established, the fairy lectured her severely, respecting her past life, extracted from her a promise to behave better in future, and sent her back to the king her husband. One may imagine from the kindness shown by the fairy Paceable to so wicked a woman, what affectionate care she would take of the young princess who was left in her hands. She soon perfectly doted on her, and determined to have her endowed by two fairies besides herself. She was a long time deciding on the two godmothers she should select, for she feared that the resentment they all felt against the mother might be extended to the child. At length she thought that the fairies Divertisant and Evelie were amongst the best-natured of them, and invited them accordingly. They arrived in a berline made of Italian flowers drawn by six grey ponies with beautiful flame-coloured manes. Evelie's robe was composed of parrot's feathers, and her hair was dressed en chien fou. Footnote. Literally, mad dog fashion, one of the many extravagant whims of the day. End footnote. The fairy divertisant had a robe of chameleon skin, which made her appear alternately in every imaginable colour. Paceable gave them both a capital reception, and to ensure their good offices, I have been confidently informed that during the excellent supper they sat down to, she managed to make them just merry enough with wine. Having taken this wise precaution, she had the lovely infant brought to them. It was in a cradle of rock crystal, and swathed in clothes of scarlet, embroidered with gold. But its beauty was a hundred times more brilliant than its apparel. The young princess smiled at the fairies, and made little attempts to kiss them, which so pleased them that they determined to place her, as far as it laid in their power, beyond the reach of the anger of their elders. They began by giving her the name of Galantine. The fairy Paceable then said to them, You know that the punishments we fairies usually inflict consist in changing beauty to ugliness, intellect to imbecility, and in many cases resorting to transformation. Now, as it is impossible for us to endow her with more than one gift each, my advice is that one of you should bestow upon her beauty, the other intelligence, and that I, for my part, should render it impossible for any one to change her form. This advice was adopted, and followed upon the spot. As soon as Galantine was endowed, the two fairies took their leave, and Paceable gave all her attention to the education of the little princess. Never was such attention so well rewarded, for at four years of age her grace and beauty had already begun to make a noise in the world. In fact, they made too much noise, for the circumstance of the case having been reported to the Council of Fairies, Paceable one morning saw the fairy grave enter the courtyard of the palace, mounted on a lion. She wore a long robe, very full, and consequently very much plaited, of sky-blue colour, 
and on her head a square cap of gold brocade. Paisible recognised her with as much anxiety as vexation, for her dress and the animal she rode proved that she came to promulgate some decree. But when she perceived that she was followed by the fairy Revus, mounted on a unicorn and dressed in black morocco, faced with changeable taffeta, and wearing also a square cap, she no longer doubted that this visit had some very serious object. In short, Fairy Grave, opening the business, said to her, I am much surprised at the conduct you have pursued towards Mutin. It is in the name of the whole body of fairies, whom she has insulted, that I come to reprimand you. You are at liberty to forgive her offences to yourself, but you had no right to pardon her for those which you had committed against the entire community. Nevertheless, you treated her with mildness and kindness during the time she resided with you. I therefore come to do strict justice, and punish an innocent child for the acts of a guilty mother. You have endowed her with beauty and intelligence, and you have also raised an obstacle against her transformation. But though I cannot deprive her of the gifts you have bestowed upon her, I know how to prevent her deriving any advantage from them as long as she lives. She shall never be able to get out of an enchanted prison which I am about to build for her, until she shall find herself in the arms of a lover who is beloved by her. It is my business to take care that such an event shall never occur. The enchantment consisted of a tower of great height and size, built of shells of all colours, in the middle of the sea. On the lowest floor there was a great bathroom, into which the water could be admitted at pleasure. The bath was surrounded by steps and slabs, on which you could walk with dry feet. The first floor was devoted to the apartment of the princess, and it was really a magnificent affair. The second was divided into several rooms. In one you saw a fine library, in another a wardrobe full of beautiful linen and superb dresses for all ages, each more splendid than the other. A third was appropriated to music. A fourth was entirely filled with the most agreeable wines and liqueurs. And in the last, which was the largest of all, nothing was to be seen but wet and dry sweetmeats, and preserves of every description, and all sorts of pies and patties, which by the power of the enchantment were kept always as warm as they were when first taken out of the oven. The tower was terminated by a platform, on which there was a garden laid out full of the finest flowers, which were renewed and succeeded each other unceasingly. In this garden was also seen a fruit tree of each sort, on which, as fast as you gathered one fruit, another appeared in its place. This lovely spot was ornamented by green arbours, rendered delicious by the shade and fragrance of the flowering shrubs that formed them, and the songs of the thousand birds that frequented them. When the fairies had placed Galantine in the tower, with a governess named Bonnet, they remounted the whale that had taken them there, and retiring a certain distance from this grand edifice, the fairy grave, by a tap of her wand on the water, assembled two thousand of the most ferocious sharks in the ocean, and ordered them to keep strict watch around the tower and tear in pieces every mortal who should be rash enough to approach it. But as ships are not much afraid of sharks, she also sent for a quantity of remoras. Footnote, that is, the sea lamprey, a small fish, that by adhering to the keels of ships was supposed to have the power of stopping them, or at least of retarding their progress. End of footnote. And commanded them to form an advanced guard, and stop without exception, every vessel that by design or accident shaped its course in that direction. Fairy Grave felt so fatigued with having done so much in so short a time, that she requested Fairy Revus to fly to the top of the tower, and enchant the air about it so powerfully and completely that not even a bird should be able to go near it. The fairy obeyed, but as she was an exceedingly absent being, she forgot some of the necessary ceremonies, and made some few mistakes. If the enchantment of the water had not been more perfect than that of the air, the safekeeping of Galantine, which they took so much trouble about, would have been greatly endangered by sea. The good governess occupied every instant of her time in the proper education of Galantine, and although she looked upon all the accomplishments that the princess acquired as completely thrown away on one who would never have an opportunity of displaying them to the world, she neglected nothing that could tend to the improvement of her mind and the cultivation of her talents in all imaginable arts and sciences. When the princess had attained the age of twelve, 
she appeared to the governess a perfect prodigy. All the fine qualities she discovered in her caused her deeply to deplore the sad fate imposed on so amiable a person. Galantine, who knew nothing about herself, perceiving her one day more melancholy than usual, entreated to know the reason of it so urgently that Bonnette related to her all her own history and that of the queen her mother. Galantine was thunderstruck at this recital. "'I had never before,' she exclaimed, "'reflected on my position. "'I fancied that when I was old enough "'I should leave this retreat. "'But if I am condemned never to do so, "'of what value is life to me? "'Better surely would it be for me to die.' "'The princess, after this burst of grief, "'remained silent for some time, then added, "'You say, my dear Bonnet, "'that the spell which is cast upon me "'cannot be broken until I shall love "'someone who loves me? "'Is this so difficult a matter? "'I don't know what it may be, "'but I would endure anything that could assist "'to release me from this prison.' "'Bonnet could not help smiling "'at the simplicity of Galantine, "'and then answered, "'To love and to be beloved, "'it is necessary that some young prince "'should enter this tower "'to see and be seen by you, "'and that he should be one who intends to marry you, "'otherwise his appearance here "'would not be correct. "'Now you know that it is not possible "'for any man to approach these walls.' Have I not told you all the precautions that have been taken by sea and by sky? You must therefore, my dear Galantine, make up your mind to pass your days in this solitude. This conversation produced a great change in the princess. No amusements had charms for her any longer. Her melancholy became excessive. She passed her days in weeping and in devising plans to escape from the tower. One day that the princess was sitting in her balcony, she saw an extraordinary figure emerge from the water. She called Bonnette immediately to come and observe it. It had the appearance of a man with a bluish countenance and ill-curled hair of a sea-green colour. He approached the tower, and the sharks made no opposition to his progress. "'In my opinion,' said the governess, "'it is a merman.' "'A man, do you say?' exclaimed Galantine. "'Let us go down to the gate of the tower. We shall see him better there.' As soon as they reached the gate, the merman stopped to gaze on the princess, and at her sight made several signs of admiration. He said something to her in his very hoarse voice, but as he found his language was not understood, he had recourse again to signs. He had in his hand a little rush basket filled with the rarest shells. He presented it to the princess, who took it, and in her turn made signs to thank him, but as night was coming on she retired, and the merman plunged under water. As soon as Galantine had reached her own apartment, she said to her governess sorrowfully, I think that man frightful. Why did the villainous sharks who guard me allow such an ugly man to pass them, in preference to one who was better looking? For I suppose they are not all like him. Not any like him, I should say, replied Bonnette. And as to the sharks allowing him to pass, I presume that... Being inhabitants of the same element, they do not harm each other. They may even be his relations, or at least friends. End of part one. End of section twenty seven.